The time has finally come for the return of our flagship series here at the SimGrid. For the next chapter in our journey, it's time for round one of five in the SimGrid VCO World Cup with Thrustmaster, Coach Dave Academy and AK Informatica. The 12 hours of Bathurst coming up shortly through the opening stint. Myself, Lewis McLean, alongside me, Andy McEwen. Welcome, hello, and let's get ready. Everyone watching at home, your hearts had best be racing right now because this is about as good as it gets. Everyone's lining themselves up to get ready for 12 hours of racing. Not only 12 hours here, though, of course, 84 hours across the season, five rounds, taking us to Spa, taking us to Kyalami, to Donington, to Nürburgring as well. All starts here at Bathurst. Strap yourselves in. Our five-month virtual trip around the planet starts now. Jordan Sherratt, our series champion on pole position, ahead of Dominic Blyer. Of course, Sherratt last season actually had the pole position here. This time he gets to start start from it we are underway for the first round of the season and let's keep our fingers crossed this isn't going to be carnage running into turn one hell corner sherrett's going to be leading from blyer from pavlovsky as well as the entire pack tries to fan their way through there's a couple of drivers off in the background it seems for the most part everyone's got through cleanly though we've got this battling for third position as pavlovsky in the ferrari is defending from shoniger who i was chatting with earlier he's quite new to sim racing realistically the young man <laughs> now fighting it out for a high position in one of the strongest championships we could ever see. Oh, they're battling it out far in the background. You see Stetsenko, who's dropped the position already down to sixth place. But it seems as though most of the grid is coming through fairly clean, heading up the mountain for the first time. They are up that uh, they are already passed. Oh, was what's happened here with Silver Racing Team. That's uh, McLaren Shadow uh, heading through. We're hearing that he's lost the rear end going into that braking zone of the chase. Now he's under a full attack from Hoban in the other Audi. There was contact there at the final corner. Oh, that's just gone from bad to worse. And now everyone's going through. The problem when it's all so tight is that it is just a train fly going through. Buivin as well going to be looking to the inside of Hell Corner and actually may, may, may make something stick. And there's a fry off in the background. Yeah for Z Sports car and I'm very curious to see what was. Let's take a look at what happened uh, on the first lap of the race as the oh everyone's being escorted off wide there. Uh, yeah that was oh. Oh, yeah. and then some very unnecessary contact coming out of the corner as well. Uh, cold tires and cold brakes and cold brains I think at play there. Drivers not really awakened up at the start of the race and uh, yeah, you've got to have your wits about you a bit more than that, haven't you, going into the first corner? Because there is always going to be a bit of a stack up there in a battle pack to try and get out of trouble. We might see something. Uh, let's take a look then. This is actually going to answer all of our questions. Let's see what happened to James Baldwin. He's running up towards Griffin's Bend. He pulls it to the outside of the number 91. That's GTWR. And then off into the barrier. Just misjudged it. And then over to the left-hand side. Two wheels on the grass straight into the wall. That is going to give him a lot of damage. As we'll see them run down through Forest Elbow, and you can see they're all sort of in this battle pack, trying to find their way through. Visibility is at a premium, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got the Porsche 911 drifts over to the right-hand side. There's the contact, and there is it sent off. That's with the number nine Ren Welton Pro Team completely unnecessary contact there. Uh, this is where the incident happened as the triple one is ahead. So the triple one's run wide. Oh, no, sorry. It was the, it was the uh, Jean Lacy Esports Cup car that run wide. It's the same colours. And then coming through the corner, the DB1 Triton car makes contact. Fuel mileage and how that might not be uh, helping them. That would have been okay if they had a big lead and they could have managed that fuel, but they're consistently having to come from behind and presumably burn a bit more fuel in doing so. Change for 12th place here. Santoro drops behind Ferrier. So the pink Audi continues its march up the order. They're less than two seconds behind uh, Niels Nayox in the BMW as re we rejoin the lead battle. And Michael O'Brien really doesn't want to get out of the way. He's struggling to find anywhere to get out of the way across the mountain. And look at this. Simonini is right on the tail now. Vansot Lander as they head on to the Conrad straight. That is just so scary. And the Odox Motorsport guys did so, so well. Um, but Our, uh, resident expert analyst James Parker. James, it's, uh, I mean, setting itself up so nicely towards the end of the race here. And that's exactly what this is all about. These next four hours are all about putting yourself in the prime position for the end of the race. Yeah, so essentially everyone now will be starting to count backwards uh, based on their strategy. So if they've been compromised or they've had to adjust early in the race, 
from now onwards it's basically okay where do we need to stop to get it to the end where is that magic 675 minute mark or in obviously some people's cases 65 to 70 minute mark based on the car they're driving to get it back home uh, without having to worry about fuel mileage or stint times really doing well right now this is down through the uh the conrod straight down in towards the chase and looks up the inside oh contact william hendrickson spun round from tobin lee and that is a poor poor accident there from tobin lee and you can absolutely guarantee that he is going to get his wrist well and truly slapped from the contact on into that uh, that corner there half an hour of the race going up towards griffin's bend look at this racing oh my goodness me triple a esports looking to the inside of grip apps engineering gets the move done through mcphilamy had it for the inside and committed through and then got up the position before they got to skyline we'll focus yeah. later on in the season we'll see how that unfolds for the mclaren uh, of Yaz Heat. Running down through the hill, out of Forest Elbow, this battle continues for second position. Tobias Pfeffer for GTWR Racing Teams. Uh, first car at Defending Series Champions, currently on the back end and trying to move their way up into second position. It's going to have to be a bit of a send on Odox Motorsport. He is right there, though. He's going to try and go around the outside of the chase. It is Audi versus Audi, and he is committed on the brakes, makes it stick, makes the apex, and away he goes up into second position. Fantastic display between the two. Penalty. Let's have a look at what happened to our race leaders, DB1 Triton. So there's a car spinning. That is the Je uh, Jean Lacy Esports Academy Cup car. There's a huge bit of contact and they get spun around to be fair whilst yes they have lost an awful lot of time look at everyone darting and ducking around that was one of the gdwr cars i don't think that car was hit particularly hard they lost a good 15 20 was it 22 seconds it was someone is holding and the brakes lost. and especially he's halfway down the straight the only exception is that you don't see them but you've got the double yellow flags and i mean you he I mean, yes, he sees it at the last minute, but he has double yellow flags. He has teammates that should be looking ahead. You know, if there's a yellow Well, flag. here we go then, coming towards the final corner, leading the race. The 741 McLeod Racing Team going to win in split two at the moment. Valerie Solheim behind the wheel. Teammates being Mark Elgard Jensen, uh, Ignacy Butzek, and Martin Schumacher behind the wheel of that, taking victory on the mountain in split two. And it looks like the four car had to return to garage. Here's the replay now. The 911 here on the right of the screen. I assume they're going to get touching oh. on the entry, and that is a big hit for the cars. 911 squished into the wall. The four car didn't fare much better. And that is two cars pretty much out of the race. Heads up yeah. to the leaders. DB1 Triton Racing. They did a lot of the work on Thursday night. They qualified in second position, and coming out of the final corner, the first victory of the championship, the VCO World Cup, heads the way of DB1 Triton Racing. It wasn't a spin that could stop them. It wasn't an Audi train that could stop them. And it certainly wasn't the mountain, as they have claimed it here at Bathurst. The 12 hours is theirs. Odox Motorsport come across the line in second position and coming across in third in a few moments' time, our defending series champions. It wasn't really the day for them, as we see that Yaroslav Honzik does hold on from Matushka. Simonini is going to hang on to third place. We've got three cars on the lead lap of this race, and Simonini being the third and final one, it is a podium for our defending series champions. They'll be okay with that, but not happy. They'll be netting themselves quite a bit of weight coming into the legendary 24 hours of Spa. For now, though, we are all complete here. Round one of the season in the VCO World Cup, all completed. We'll see you on the 15th of May for the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. At the moment, DV1 Triton Racing are topping the standings. The mountain is theirs. We'll see if that continues next round. Until then, bye-bye.
As sim racers, we always want full focus. One single mistake might cost us the race. We're always improving our skills, our tactics, our consistency, being better than the competition. However, we sometimes forget to upgrade ourselves. That's why we created Q-Focus, an all-natural focus booster without caffeine. The formula is specifically designed to keep us calm and razor sharp during a race. My name is Alex. I'm a sim racer and the co-founder of the performance nutrition brand Gallo. We want to empower sim racers to reach their full potential. Go to callocom slash simgrid to find out more. We have tackled the mountain, but in front of our drivers today, potentially an even more challenging affair. It was a fantastic race down under to open the account for the season. First Blood went the way in a surprise victory for DV1 Triton Racing, who barely put a foot wrong in the concrete canyon of Mount Panorama. A vastly different circuit here, however, and an entirely different challenge ahead as we go twice around the clock in the second chapter of our championship. The drivers took to the circuit a couple of days ago to qualify their positions for this race and with varying challenges of Spa, success ballast from Bathurst and extreme closeness of our field, some teams really do have a lot of work to put in over the next day. It is time though to get into the thick of things. Round two in the SimGrid VCO World Cup with assistance from our partners of Thrustmaster, AK Informatica, Coach Dave Academy and joining them for this round of the rest of the season uh, Calo and Express VPN. More on that as the broadcast unfolds as it is time for the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. I'm Lewis McGlade. Joining us in the booth at various points throughout the broadcast will also be James Parker. He's off uh, viewing various other things at present. But in the booth right now, Angus Fender. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you for welcoming in. And what a race ahead of us. I cannot wait. It's a circuit which we normally see difficult conditions at and we're being told that we're going to be looking towards some of that stuff over the next day. It really is going to be a tough challenge for them. Yep, Spa. Spa's a tricky circuit at the best of times and if you throw in a little bit of rain, which is not rare at all around this part of the world, then it can really spice up the field and expect to see quite a lot of battling down the field as some of the guys from qualifying push their way forwards. A 47 car field here. We have 48 cars back at Bathurst. A couple of teams missing. We'll get onto that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but with all of all of that, it can be a little bit chaotic in that mid-pack, can't it? I think, honestly, the key to winning this race is survival. It's all about risk versus reward. If you, if you push like hell through the first 23 hours and then put it off the road in the last hour, your race is done. You may as well have not started the race at all. You've got to be there at the finish and that's the most important part. 
Absolutely. And with the season that we have, it's not a long season, just five rounds across the calendar. This is part two of that season to see who's going to become the world champions all the way out in October. It is going to be a long run for them, especially throughout the 24 hours today. DV1 Triton were victorious last time out in that Bentley. They started on the front row of the grid. Odox Motorsport were behind and GTWR. You notice in your first change between rounds here, GTWR are a 8G Academy. They join forces with R8G and for those of you that don't know, that is Roman Grosjean's eSports squad. WPS Racing Team and Sim Racing Masterclass behind a couple of surprises up there in the top five. None more so than DV1 Triton. GTWR who uh, kind of, they were very strong throughout that race but they were their own worst enemy at times. They need to put that to bed and come out strong here. Yeah, I, I think they need to exercise the ghosts of Bathurst and try and eliminate the errors that they had there. Um, obviously, Spa is just as punishing a circuit of Bathurst. You have the fortune of a little bit of runoff, but um, yeah, one mistake here will still equal game over. Absolutely. We've got a couple of interviews to kick us off at the start of this broadcast, as we did last time out to catch up with some of the teams on uh, how they have you know, un unfolded throughout practice, throughout qualifying and where things lie. Our first one is Chris Herker, who will be joining us um, from the Ren Welton Pro team. Qualifying yesterday went a little bit better than Spa. How are you feeling about the race? Uh, I meant Bathurst, not Spa. Yeah, Bathurst, I think, was uh, P43. Now we start from P33. Uh, of course, we are not uh, very happy with that. On the other hand, uh, being 6 tenths behind the leader in P33 just uh, shows how crazy fast uh, this, this whole field is. So we are yeah, extremely looking forward to this race. And I mean, we apparently start in, in, in wet conditions. At least that, that's what the, what the practice session is showing currently. Um, so it will be extremely enticing the race. From memory, you did quite well here uh, last season, uh, finishing second uh, there. Does that sort of uh, inform you a little bit better around the circuit? 100% yes. Uh, and we even did a kind of a, a second 24-hour uh, spa race a couple of weeks ago, also in the Lambo, to prepare a bit uh, for this one. Uh, so I think we've, we've seen all conditions right now. Uh, had the 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 uh, inevitable crash uh, up at Radion or Rouge uh, also in this in this past uh, test race, so to speak. Uh, so of course we hope uh, we can do uh, better this time, uh, and of course the the experience will will help yeah, with all the changing weather conditions. I think today will be all about uh, pit strategies, getting the pit stops uh, right, yeah? and uh, we hope and we think we are prepared for that. Did you learn anything on your uh, run through Bathurst that might assist you here? Obviously, starting towards the, the back end of the field there, now towards the mid-pack. Is there stuff that you can pick apart? Uh, well, to be honest, I think it's it's a bit the, the obvious thing that trying to, to survive the first laps, I mean, there will be the inevitable uh, contact here and there, hiccup here and there. They are trying to, to, to stay clean, stay, stay safe, uh, not lose too many places, not get too much damage. I think this will be the most important stuff here in the in the starting uh, laps, and then we just see uh, how the race will unfold. Uh, final question then, Lamborghini. Uh, we've seen the uh, Audis do quite well. You were in the Audi last season. What are the difference between the Audi and the Lamborghini? How do they sort of drive different? Is it uh, a bit more of an advantage over the race in a Lambo, or how does it work? A difficult question. I mean, they, they obviously have a very, very similar uh, chassis and, and the same power unit, so the cars uh, drive uh, very, very comparably, I would say. Um, we feel the, the, the Lambo is a bit more lenient towards a uh, little bit more rake, a little bit more aggressive setup that we can run, which is still okay, um, like for the race yeah, and also for the, for the rain. Um, so we think it's a little bit on the safe side uh, compared to the Audi uh, in terms of how um, yeah, how the moments up at uh, Radigan and Orosh uh, are. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a kind of a, yeah, middle safe a choice for the race. Well, best of luck through the race and hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you a bit later on. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. No worries. Best of luck. Uh, a lot of competitors out there, Angus, that will be uh, hoping for the best. But as I say, they're, they're starting far down the order. They're starting all the way down in 33rd, really in that danger zone, which on lap one, especially if we're going to get some wet conditions, going to make things very tricky indeed. 
Yeah, I'd say they're right at the back of that danger zone, 33rd place. Um, oh, they're going to have to really be careful on the first few laps. Uh, but I think their, their idea for the race is that they have to do everything perfect, starting from the position they're in. They're obviously going to lose time over the first couple of stints when they're in traffic pushing forwards. After that, they have to be absolutely on the money for the rest of the race if they want to get where they want to finish by the end. Yeah, it's a long race, so it is a, a game of survival, uh, especially with those conditions. They are not alone down there, obviously, you know, you say 33rd, obviously they're not alone, they've got loads of other cars around there. But what I mean by that is they're around cars with a lot of experience as well. DV1 Triton Racing, uh, our race winners from last time out there, down in 37th position, of course, Series Champions, GTWR R8G Academy, their, their first car, so the number 157, that's down in 28th spot. So there's a lot of experience down there. What that tells me though is there's a lot of drivers that understand risk evaluation down there and maybe won't push too hard in the early stages to maybe take an unnecessary risk absolutely they know the race is bigger than the first lap yeah you mentioned guys starting out of position uh well out of position or not when the top 33 is split by six tenths uh that's 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 one breaking zone isn't it really so um, even though qualifying didn't go exactly to plan, you know there's going to be a very, very long line of cars all scrapping for position as soon as the lights go green. Yeah, it's going to be pretty tight. We've also got another interview at the early stages of this as we are going to catch up with a team who did very, very well yesterday indeed, the Ubic uh, Events Racing. We've got Eric Neat in the booth and got to say, massive congrats to getting into Q2 yesterday. Well, what thank you. Um, yeah, it was it was a crazy day. Um, we were we were hoping for like top twenty, and suddenly we were P seven in the top ten shootout. It was it was emotional and very 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 hyped. Yeah. <laughs> You qualified um, outside of the top 40 back at Bathurst. What? How, where does where does that pace come from to get inside the top 10 here at Spa? That's such a, a big step forward. Yeah, well, um, we had a really bad qualifying in Bathurst, so um, we only did like a 59.9, and it was uh, not on pace. We usually do three or two tenths faster than that, so we should have been higher up in Bathurst, but. Um, Yes, yeah, Spa is, an, is, a, is a great track for the Aston and Bathurst isn't, so that's one thing and we just put a lot of effort into the setup and into, into practice. So on the pit off, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. Now I'm gonna like it's, this. Almost seems like I'm attacking it from a very negative point of view. But is there a little bit of disappointment even from Q2? Because you got in there, you qualified in seventh uh, to get into Q2. Is there a little bit of disappointment that you didn't set a time? That there, you know, there might have been a bit more on the table, maybe even uh, a little bit further up the grid. Well, yeah, um, James. We were talking to James after that, and he said there was. A lot of times uh, still left on the track, but more than P7 wouldn't wouldn't be possible uh, with that lap. So we are happy to be in, in the top 10, but uh, could have been better. But we're still, it's like, uh, it's still crazy to think about. <laughs> We've spoken a little bit uh, before on the, the broadcast uh, just a bit earlier that um, about this danger zone in the mid-pack and how it can get a little bit chaotic. You've qualified up in 10th. Do you think you're out of that danger zone where it can be a bit chaotic? Uh, I was actually thinking about that uh, today too. And, uh, well, it's definitely helpful to be uh, further up the, uh, the front. And we hope to avoid any crashes if there are any. And yeah, we just have to, to hope to get through without any damage and get a good race, yeah. Are you well prepared, final question, are you well prepared for the wet, uh, which we're potentially getting here at Spa? Yes, we, we did some wet practice. The practice servers were like mostly wet and so we did a lot of practice in the dry and in the wet. So I think we, we have a good package for this race and hopefully we can uh, get a good result um, by a lot of practice. <laughs> Well, we will leave you to get back to your team. Fingers crossed for you, and we'll see what you yeah. can get from 10th place. One one thing still, um, uh, James uh, told me to do this, so um, <laughs> we, yeah, um, we have a special livery for this race um, because James's team last 
season win the silver cup in Spa. And that's why our livery is not black, um, it's silver. That's um, a little bit of a tribute to that race. And yeah, and I wanted to thank our, our sponsors, Ubik Events, Equip and JK Autospace. And I hope everyone has a good race and I'm, I'm really hyped and I'm really nervous. So best of luck, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much. Best of luck to you and the team. We'll catch up with various other drivers throughout the, uh, the, the broadcast and throughout the race. But we're we're approaching the start of it though, Angus, and I, I, by the sounds of it, you know, hearing some drivers being a bit nervous, it's pretty tense out there. Oh, they will absolutely be nervous. I've been fortunate enough to race at Spa back in the GT4 car in 2019, and that was scary enough. But uh, that was only in a British GT series, and I think we started miles back in that. But they, these guys have everything on the line. The guys starting the race have all the pressure of their teammates on their shoulders for the race start, and if the conditions are tricky. Uh, then they've got to find their way around and it's going to be really crucial at the start just to keep your nose clean and just try and relax into a rhythm as fast as you can. You can see on screen there, new affiliate for this round, Callow. You can get 15% off of your order, uh, SimGrid, you can see it there, uh, S-I-M-G-R dot I-D slash B-C hyphen Callow uh, to take you to uh, your needs. Of course, this, it is actually a very important thing to note as to what they do. It's about um, hydration and you know keeping uh, energy levels and you know being a, a, a premium uh, boosting food supplement um it that over uh, a, a race like of 24 hours something that we've, we don't we never really spoke about in sim racing before realistically about um keeping yourself on your mind focused throughout a race is really really tricky because let's be honest in races we don't really have the best diets uh, <laughs> and it's it's hard to keep in that rhythm for such a long period yeah, and um, hydration is absolutely crucial. Um, obviously, in the real world, you have a drinks bottle and you have that on demand of a button, which is a nice little creature comfort. But in a sim race, you can be in the car for upwards of three hours at a time. And obviously, you're going to naturally lose fluids and hydration. That can affect your concentration. So definitely callow if you're looking to take this seriously and you're looking to find that little extra edge will definitely help you over the course of a long stint. I was actually speaking to a couple of teams um, before about how they, uh, those of you that know, uh, it kind of comes under um, the G2 Esports camp and on their other side because they uh, run things for Red Bull Racing Esports and stuff like that. And some of their drivers, they do um, fairly like uh, intense fitness uh, exercising and, and stuff, you know, trying to keep in, in rhythm. And it's one thing that we're starting to carry over from motorsport of like keeping fitness, keeping in shape, keeping your body in shape, keeping your mind is really really important for these uh, long distance races where you're under so much pressure to nail every single lap every single time absolutely dare i say the margins in sim racing are tenfold closer than they are in real racing in terms of lap time i mean you heard chris herker talking about being down in 33rd place only six tenths off um that's just incredibly incredibly close and if there's something that can give you a lasting advantage why would you not pursue that Absolutely. I mean, the top 10 in qualifying when we went into Q2, where it was a Super Bowl session, uh, the nine that actually got times on the board, they were separated by just half a second, which in a Super Bowl session, again, in sim racing five five years ago, even 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen them be that close in a Super Bowl session. You would have seen them separated by a fair amount more. To say that that ability to deliver over you know a two minute and 15 second lap that ability to deliver that time is crucial yeah i hadn't even taken into account the lap time spa of course is uh, i'm fairly sure the longest track on the calendar it's probably one of the longest tracks uh, that any gt race goes on apart from the Nordschleife. life so to be that kind of gap away when you only have the limited chances you have of super pole that's that's incredible to think about it i mean i can't think of the last time i watched a spa super pole session and all the cars be within half a second. That's just, uh, yeah, it, it boggles my mind, frankly. Yeah, it is absolutely intense out there. Of course, uh, for those of you that want to uh, take part in SimGrid stuff, there's so much racing that happens here, including here in the VCO World Cup. It's not just split one with the 47 cars that we have here. There is also split two, which is presently racing. And trust me, some of the names on this grid are ones that, to be honest, we could definitely see up towards the top end of, uh, of split one. You can 
can see there Marcel Fuzzi, who's currently running in fifth position. It is, this is what's happening now. Um, you've got the, the likes of Johannes Weiss, who uh, I'm pretty sure he drives for the Butler Powell Motorsports uh, squad. Richard Schaefer, who drives also for that squad. He's uh, He lives near the Nordschleifer and uh, does laps around there again and again, like very constantly. He's very, very good. Um, at the Nordschleifer and plenty of other teams. There's a bit of a super team in this that I have kept my eye on a little bit. A group of Hungarians. Uh, we can see Rocket Simsport. We've got one of their cars as well uh, in Split 1. Robbie Stapleford, a new signer for that team. Uh, you've got Lavore Racing, which is in the 77. You've got Adam Pinsesh, Martin Barner, Norbert Posan, and that's the Marcel Fusi squad. All of them, I, I'm pretty sure all of them are Hungarians. And such a strong squad of experienced racers. Sasha Glass up there leading the race at present and this is my point though is that sure split one we've got strong cars we've got strong teams but that carries over into split two where it's almost equally as strong as well oh absolutely and um yeah i, I think the driving standards in split two are just as competitive as you'll find in split one i mean you can see here uh, 25 minutes into the race and the running the running order is still just as close as you expect from, from a split one field and most of these guys are looking forward to progressing their own driving and their own experience and looking to push into that split one which is fantastic motivation. I am surprised by some of the teams in this in the sense that yeah that there are teams that like Marcel Fusi is, is one and definitely a part of this squad that um, we've spoken about quite a few times in Simpson. He's got a bit of a nickname, Mr. Super Saturday. Uh, he always comes along to Super Saturdays and he always does all of the races. And for those of you that don't know what Super Saturday is, it's a uh, you've got a feature race at the end, but then you've also got support races throughout. So, you know, talking three support races and he would do all of them. He would do the support races and the feature race, which is a long, long day of racing. Uh, a, a man of his quality and talent, I am surprised to see on this grid. But again, it just shows how strong Split One is. Yeah, talk about commitment every Saturday. Absolutely fantastic to see Marcel Fusi in Split Two. And seeing him up in sixth place, absolutely no surprise to anyone who knows anything about Assetto Corsa Competizione. Pushing on the back of, well, the several Aston Martins in front. So he'll definitely be looking forward to charging through. We'll be heading into the split one race momentarily. Just a minor delay before we get into things, being told that it is uh, marginally damp. We'll go with that, shall we? Once we hit the uh, the track, it probably looks a bit like that, actually. Uh, once we get to the, the track, we'll inform you on, on, on how everything's going. And of course, get that grid to you. 24 hours of racing. Pit stops are going to be crucial around here. Those that can extend the stints up to the 75 minute um, stint time are going to be really, really important because the pit lane around Spa, of course, we're not running. It's not the Grand Prix layout in the sense of the pit lane. The pit lane here is really, really long. Yeah, it's a long pit lane, of course, accommodating all of those cars. You, Rather than rejoining the track on the exit of turn one, you actually rejoin the circuit at the top of Radion. That's, that's a good two minutes you're going to lose just in the pit lane. So if you get a drive through for track limits, for example, you're going to lose the thick end of 90 seconds and a huge amount of time. So keeping it all fair and neat is going to be the absolute winning factor here. I did once do a race around here. This was um, last, at some point last year. It was a three hour race. Uh, and some people sped in pit lane. I don't know how much is a factor in this because um, your pit lane limiter, right, normally requires, it's, it's the engine which limits the speed, right? And so if you're on the flat and going uphill, it's fine. You turn the corner and you start coming downhill, the engine's not the limiting factor, gravity is. And so you need to get on the brakes. And people were speeding in pit lane ad nauseum because it's just so easy to do. I'm not sure how much that would affect them here as uh, I'm pretty sure the limiters in these are a bit better. But still, it's a bit, a bit of a note to have that it's a long slog downhill as well when lining up in your box coming down that hill could be pretty tricky as well imagine this quickly imagine you are the first pit box in the grand prix pits you change tires you've then got the thick end of a minute and a bit just yeah. rolling on the limiter imagine how much tire temperature you're going to lose before you even get up to racing speed absolutely there there are advice yeah like i don't know which one i'd want i kind of want one in the grand prix like because like I've, I've, done, I've been in that pit lane so many times, I'm like, I know, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. But then, yeah, you're absolutely right. You lose tyre temperature. You, you, I mean, to be honest, like, you lose a little bit of concentration. You're kind of, 
I'm ready to go. I'm out of the box. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not quite. I've got. I've got a little while to go. And also that pit lane exit, which we can see on screen there, is hard. It's really, really hard. Yeah, embarrassingly, I have had the misfortune of crashing there. But Everyone a has of times on a set of course competition, so <laughs> I am no stranger to that pit exit wall, and that has eaten my car quite a few times. But um, yeah, yeah, you're right about the uh, the whole losing concentration down the pit lane. You probably have enough time to have a drink, call your mum, ask how she's doing, ask how the dog is, and then you get out on track. And before you know it, you've lost all your concentration and your rhythm. And rhythm is going to be very much a part of the day. Uh, the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. There, we've got two 24-hour races across the season. One here at Spa, and then of course uh, later in the season when we head to the Nurburgring. Uh, that one there being the finale of the season on the second of October. Uh, we also run to the 12 Hours of Donington uh, next month, the 26th of June, and the 31st of August. We do the 12 Hours of Kyalami and. Another affiliate to be joining us through the season express vpn you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash the sim grid uh, and fantastic to see those affiliates jumping on board uh, of course throughout uh, throughout the season uh, we've we've had ak informatica we've had coach dave academy uh, thrustmaster as well and of course vco our partnership for the 2021 vco world cup uh, great to see stuff jumping on board and also it's an important thing to note that that teams and stuff these days in sim racing are getting more and more sponsors as well absolutely i mean i i know from first-hand experience having recently signed for a bs plus competition uh, quite a new team to set of course competizione but um the the level of sponsorships in sim racing is absolutely going through the roof and you don't get uh real world factors affecting sim racing like uh, the 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 covid19 pandemic if anything gave sim racing its biggest break to be in the spotlight and you saw all these formula one drivers migrating over to iRacing and a set of course competizione and people loved it and that's expanded the community tenfold and i think it's absolutely brilliant to see yeah, speaking of BS competition, of course, in that sense with um, VCO as well, being um, Florian Harper's sort of little bit of a baby, and he um, ha has pushed sim racing forward, especially over the last few months. And VCO, who are joining us here, they have a plan for sim racing. It is not just about the here and now, it is about the future of sim racing uh, coming in January next year, uh, which, yes, is a long way off, but this shows how big a plan they've got. It goes there and even further. Uh, they've got... Um, um, uh, their eSports Racing World Cup, which that is going to be a fantastic thing to see because it's not about um, the, you know, it's not about a set of course of competency and it's not about iRacing, it's not about R Factor 2, it's about the best drivers on all of those platforms coming together for one major competition. Uh, like that in itself, oh, that's going to be a tough a <laughs> tough affair to see who's going to be not only the best team but the best driver in sim racing as a whole oh i i don't want to think about how intense that must be for the drivers i mean i i am a firm believer of the saying that the best racing driver in the world will never be found uh due to the just the fu the funding and the finance that is needed to get to make your way in motorsport make sim racing the perfect platform to showcase your skills so yeah Anything serious to do with sim racing, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Love to see the best of the best rise to the top. Uh, and I'm sure we will see some of the greatest drivers that we've got in sim racing taking part in that throughout the running. But that's for January. This is for now. 24 hours of spa should be coming up shortly. The weather, by the way, did get the uh, note coming through that the track conditions, uh, the quote is greasy, uh, which you know we hear this time and time again is that you you either want it to be full wet because then you're you know you're you're guaranteed wet tires yes you can have low grip but but fair enough or, or you want it to be slick you don't really want that middle ground absolutely not you want one or the other and spa being such a long track do not be surprised if you get to the end of the chemical straight and it's a different track condition to where you started uh yeah greasy conditions oh it's not very friendly for a race start especially up that first hill so the drivers are really going to have to watch themselves. 
it's going to be tricky. Not necessarily just for those leading, but for those in the back of the pack. I mean, if someone drops it further ahead, then there are going to be problems. You can see there, starting on the grid, Killian Ryan Meenan will be starting from pole position in the 2.11 uh, for Sidemax Motorworks JLO team. Uh, Tauscher was the one that put it on pole position. I'm just going to throw a bit of a note out there before we go through the grid uh, properly as we've got them on screen. This is from the qualifying yesterday. They did not have a very good run back at Bathurst, to be honest, neither did many of the Aston Martin teams. You can see their GTWR R8G Academy, that's their fourth car, will be joining them on the front row of the grid. And then one very popular uh, team indeed, Unicorns of Love, Petrochenko doing the work in qualifying there in fourth position. R8G Academy, uh, the GTWR, the second car, and then the ambassadors for Ren Welton. We were catching up with the Ren Welton Pro team just before the broadcast, qualifying up in fifth place. Nils Nyox, keep an eye on them in the BMW Team G2 Esports car. They were really good over the long runs. And then AAA Esports, uh, Lacan behind in seventh position and uh, Saclari joining for Racing Line Motorsports 191. The last two cars that were inside the top 10 and in that final part of qualifying, Lada Sport Rosneft, that was Yigor Ogorognikov behind the wheel and he got it up to ninth position. Ubik Events Racing, James Bacon gets 10th place and then the drivers outside of that are the ones that didn't progress through to Q2. The Greek Savlaki squad with Racing ON3 and the third of the GTWR R8G Academy cars, Chris Hartveld, who was in the top 10 shootout back at Bathurst. Yaz Heat, Mikhail Stutsenko is in 14th position with Esports Performance Racing Team and GTWR R8G Academy in 16th position, that one being their fifth car. FFS Racing and Carbon Sim Sport, MRL Sim Racing and MCW Racing Team with Team ACR, WPS Racing Teams 21 and Revolution Sim Racing and Retronic E-Racing. Keep an eye on WPS uh, Racing Team, by the way, because they did quite well uh, on pace over at, uh, at Bathurst. Uh, Zenith Esports with a Rocket Sim Sport behind Jack McIntyre, 26th position. They didn't have the best run uh, last time out. They were looking really strong in split two, but then it didn't end too well. WPS Racing Team in 27th. And then our series champions, GTWR RHG Academy, number one. Tobias Pfeffer qualified it yesterday uh, or a couple of days ago. I remember that he had pole position back at back first. Uh, Grip Hacks Engineering and Dorkin Community round out the top 30 with Silver Racing Team Eurowash and Williams Esports. Um, uh, Stefanko, the one qualifying that. Ren Welton Pro Team catching up uh, with Chris Herker behind uh, the, the start of the broadcast. They're down in 33rd position with Clash Sim Racing Masterclass with Amir Hosseini, an incredibly quick driver. Keep your eye out for him. And then the Jean Lacy Esports Academy. Race winners from Bathurst, DV1 Triton Racing will be from 37th position. Dominic Blyer, who qualified and started from second place back at Bathurst, he'll be doing some hard work to get up the order from there. And one driver that caused them problems at Bathurst, the Jean Lacy Esports Academy Cup car of Shermatinsky that spun in front of them, if I remember correctly, coming down the mountain in the latter parts of the race. Uh, PPR uh, Racing and Peak Performance, 39th and 40th, the final cars on the grid. Ren, uh, a racing line motorsport GTRC endurance team, full pace racing, the Elvis Gratton team in that Honda, then SG Stern, Odox Motorsport, who were on the podium last time out, and rounding out our 47 car field, Logitech G Altus Esports, who last round were working with um, the GTWR squad. This time, I'm not sure how that works with the partnership between GTWR and RHG. I'm sure it doesn't mess things up there, but Simone Maria Martheno uh, behind the wheel of that car, and it was the car that started last place back at Bathurst and starting from last here today. You can see their wet conditions looking pretty tricky at the moment. Yep, yep, yep. And if you're starting in those back group, uh, don't be surprised if you just take it easy to start back uh, back off the back of the pack and let the crashes happen in front of you. But uh, the guys at the front, I have noticed quite a few Aston Martins. And uh, I, I do believe they are quite a good car around this track, but good to see uh, the Ferraris and the BMWs mixing it up. Uh, I expect the McLarens to be a little bit higher up, but the wet weather will not be bad for them at all. So, interesting mix-up. Obviously, a dry qualifying and now a damp race start. Except, expect to see drama. For the likes of Killian Ryan Mean, and we spoke about this back at Bathurst, and it's a note that uh, for anyone who's tuned into various bits of the SimGrid content over the last few months will understand that one of the... Uh, 
great factors of Killian Ryan Meenan and, and brother Cormac Ryan Meenan as well is they're really, really good at working their way up the grid. Uh, they don't normally qualify very well. Well, I mean, how do you bypass that? Hand qualifying off to someone else and start from pole position. I expect that Ryan Meenan will actually be really quite strong in the early stages of the race because I know that he goes well very, very early. And the potential expectation then is to try and break the field in the very, very early stages. Absolutely. If you're starting at the front, your game plan's got to be break the guys behind as quickly as you can get in their heads, ruin their confidence, and then just settle down and do the best job you can for the rest of your stint. A couple of drivers that will be up there towards the top end of the grid that may cause uh, not some problems, but will be aggressive in the early stages. Lada Sport Rosneft was qualified by Yiga Rogorognikov and is driven by Yiga Rogorognikov. We've got James Bacon there for Ubik Events Racing, who was uh, quite quick in the first part of qualifying, got himself seventh position, uh, and then uh, didn't set a time um, in the uh, in that Q2 session, they'll be looking to work their way forward. And to be honest, with Olga Rognikov, I uh, not to jump you know too much with the you know, conclusions because he actually has driven quite a lot cleaner recently. And we know that he's got a lot of a fan base in chat, so I'll try and not uh, shoot myself in the foot in the early stages. I'd sit behind him and work my way through with him. Yeah, quite a common technique in motorsport. If you're behind a guy who you know loves to make a move. Why would you pass them? He's just going to make a move straight back on you. You might as well sit behind, let them make the moves and do a bit of a karting strategy and just follow them through. It's quite an efficient way to make some progress up the field. So if, if the guys are going to have their, their heads screwed on properly, I don't expect them to be getting two elbows out at the start of the race. Did notice uh, there. Didn't actually quite pick up it when we we're going through the grid, but it's going to be a little bit hard to pick out. Obviously, a bit further down the order, so we won't worry about it too much. But the Jean Lacy Esports Academy DV1 Triton, the Jean Lacy Esports Academy Cup car that's starting uh, down sort of 36 to 38, all got the same colours. Uh, I do forget that because it's this light blue and then a dark contrast. So we'll keep our eye on that. Of course, you can see here uh, those special colours that were being run on the Ubic Events Racing car that were being told about by Chris Herker. Uh, at the start obviously it's slightly silver because they won here in the silver uh, class last year so uh, we'll keep our eye on on them and see what they can do to to work their way forward do like some of the liveries that we've got here in the vco world cup it's going to be really important for some of these astons to clear off in the early stages we were told that they might match a little bit better to these wet conditions uh, over a long period of course you use a bit less fuel in the wet that could be very very important because the Astons do tend to burn fuel a little bit quicker uh, than some of the other cars on the grid. Yep, those big thirsty twin turbo V8s are not ones for saving fuel, and uh, so they need to they need to get a move on off the start. Really, expect to see Arthur Cameron in the 62 G2 uh, G2 Esports car stretching his first stint out longer than the Aston Martins around him, and that'll be a really important factor throughout the race. We have been told. Uh, according to some calculations over the course of the race, the BMWs or other cars easier on fuel to make two less pit stops than the Aston Martins. So they need to get a move on if they're going to have a chance of winning this race. Being told as well that car 36 is starting from the pit lane, which is an interesting call uh, around here. Not 100% sure as to the reason why. Uh, but apparently we're hearing they've got a bit of connection problems for them. But either way, we'll see if they can actually make their way onto the grid once the race begins, because we are about to get underway. 2.11 and 1.64 on the front row of the grid. Tauscher and Miato. And the important thing with them is neither of these cars had particularly good runs in the previous round. What a way to make amends by making things stick here. Once we come through La Source, the race will be ready to begin. And Tausha, I thought it was going to be Ryan Meenan, but it's switched over to being Tausha behind the wheel of that car. So uh, the, the driver that had pole position yesterday or a couple of days ago will be looking to make the best of that situation in his own hands. Eight of the top ten were Aston Martins. Will that be the way once we get to the chequered flag? I somehow doubt it because I'm not 100% sure as to what these cars are going to be like over the race distance. It's going to be a hard affair for them. 24 hours ahead, twice around the clock 
here for the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa round two in the VCO World Cup. And we are underway as we run to Eau Rouge for the first time. Obviously some side by side in the background. Anyone going to be taking major advantage as we run up and over the crest? I think we all look pretty clean. Everyone being careful. And that is exactly what we wanted to see. Tricky conditions that we can see on screen. Gamble who's trying to put pressure on Nerby as well and Arthur Camera in that uh, BMW G2 eSports car is instantly on the attack but no way through everyone's being patient and that at least to the early stages towards the front looked pretty clean I my hat is halfway across my room right now because I cannot believe they survived turn one well done to all of the drivers keeping their noses clean understanding and using their heads that it's not about the first corner and now they can sell it they're going to get on with the race yeah, seeing on the side-by-side, -side, it's still a little bit chaotic going into uh, Rivage and down the hill to the corner with no name. We're looking at Tobias Schur, who's very much in that mid-pack as they're still side-by-side. -side. Lights blaring. It's quite hard to see if you're looking in your mirror to see where everyone is. It is immensely tricky out there at present. Uh, also saw um, Lacombe, who is driving that AAA eSports car in the number 92, work his way forward a little bit. A, a shock to me, the number 41, Yigor Ogrognikov, is the driver who's dropped backwards a little bit. Uh, went from ninth to 10th, so maybe not working forward. We'll keep our eye on him in that black and yellow uh, Lada Roseneft car that was just coming through shot there. G2 Esports running an all-black livery. I'm not sure that was intended, but it is an all-black livery. They were supposed to be running in the uh, black, red and white that we saw them last round out. But either way, under an awful lot of pressure from the 191 of Saklari, which this is not a part of the track you'd necessarily think of a move in. Yep, camera on the defensive. Saklari on the charge. The Aston Martin is looking really good off the start. Also to note, James Bacon from P10 on the grid up to P8. Very good start by him for the Ubic events racing team. Looking forward to push through the field on, in these early stages. Yeah, and you can see him there in that silver car. Whoa, look at that from Lacombe, though, as he's going side by side with Igor Ogrogonkov. This is just behind uh, James Bacon, the one driver that you were talking about, who was putting pressure himself on Saklari and Camera ahead. You can see there, oh, Igor Ogrogonkov's diving it down the inside, just on the corner of the shot at La Source, and he's going to lose out because the grip off the, uh, off the corner, just not ideal. And uh, come to Yanis was almost able to, to pick apart that. Here it is, a big yeah. crash at La Source, not ideal. Oh dear, yeah, yeah it was going to happen eventually at some point, wasn't it? In, in these conditions, the slippery damp track conditions, it's so hard to keep the car in check on heavy fuel, bear in mind. Uh, yeah, interesting to see Ogorodnikov making the move and actually losing out on the traction on the exit of the corner. It's just that tight line, you know, we, 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 we hear of um, the karting line uh, fairly frequently, um, you know, running around the outside. And in these conditions, it gives you a straighter exit from the corner, especially when you're running downhill. You're already losing a bit of grip on the rear end anyway. And yeah, it just was a little bit too much. And uh, Yigor Ogrogonikov not able to take advantage in that scenario. Uh, the contact that we heard from behind was uh, to do with the 123 FFS racing. We'll see what we can get uh, in regards to that. Uh, and the 118 as well of uh, full pace racing has had an issue at Radion for good measure. Uh, as we focus on that 118 uh, behind two Porsches of Cody Pride and Herman uh, in the 1 and the 911 as they run down the hill on those two Porsches. So not an ideal start for some. Ideal start for others though did get the note that working the way up the order, you Kind of not surprised in a sense. Jordan Sherritt up to 18th position already, so on a march at present and uh, not wasting any time and working up the order. Started from 28, so already plus 10 in two laps. A start that is uh, from the Audi. Wow, that's absolutely fantastic in these damp conditions. The Audi surely seems to be going fast enough. And uh, yeah, the, the early progress and keeping your nose clean is, well, dream scenario, isn't it? Get on with it. Let's go did here just getting it uh, coming through that it was the 157 that car that I'm speaking of the GTWR car that was the one that caused uh, potentially the incident at La Source uh, after diving it down the inside of the 21 that one being WPS racing team and then making contact with the 123 so we'll see what happens with race control of course live stewarding here to keep on top of all the drivers and uh, give them a bit of a slap on the wrist whenever they're needed and 
a drive-through penalty, potentially even something bigger in the early stages here, that's not going to be good. Yeah, maybe I spoke too soon. Uh, yeah, b big shame to have contact early in the race, but it's always going to happen when there's this many cars on this grid, and it's a shame for the guys who have been caught up in it, and a shame for the guys who have actually ended up being involved or caught up, whether they be innocent or not. But uh, yeah, you've, at this point, at this point in the race, uh, you've just got to do the best you can and push on. Yeah, it's a bit. Uh, we had a very clean first lap, and now it's getting a little bit dicey out there as drivers are getting comfortable. Already a three-second lead for our top two was Henrik Gambles attacking uh, Suclari and is, uh, trying to get that position done. He's on the inside as they exit Malmody and then run down the hill. It should give him the inside at Ravage, and uh, Arthur Camera is going to be the one as well to try and take advantage in this scenario. There is a switch for position uh, as uh, as Gamble grabs fifth place, and so uh, just jumping up. I think might have actually been defending that one instead but uh, either way a lot of pressure here on the shoulders of the 995 as Suclari on the rear wing what this is doing though is it's just causing problems further down this train is everyone's so tight and bunched up yeah that's absolutely what we expect uh, what we expected from a field this close and interesting that the Aston Martins are backing each other up they know they have to pull a gap where uh, with their limited fuel well or at least less efficient on their fuel anyway they needed to make a gap and battling isn't going to help them in the long run i kind of get the feeling though that this is the 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 position of Sakari that he knows that he needs to get by because he's very well, much aware of that scenario that needs to take advantage in the early stages um the potential shorter stint times for the aston martins and is desperate to get through but there isn't a, a way through at present and every time that he attacks the doors open for uh, other camera to try and get through for G2 Esports as well and that's sort of just making things not ideal and yeah the, the train goes very very far back even back to 15th place it keeps getting bigger the harder they battle this looks like a decent opportunity for the racing line motorsports car but still no way through running into the final chicane up the hill and towards La Source and round that to end another lap yellow flags out once again and that is at the bus stop and I think that might be the 157 I could just see on my map not 100% sure what happened but uh, yeah, clear issues further down the order, lap after lap. Yeah, yeah, drivers getting caught out with the conditions. And uh, it's interesting to see Saclari all over the back of Henrik Gamble and the Aston Martin because it's so difficult to pass a guy very similar pace to you in exactly the same car. It's not like you can blast past them on a straight. It's not like you have better brakes. These cars should, on paper, have exactly the same performance. So to make the move stick, it's got to be just driver advantage. Been told there is a big crash at Radion. This is to do with the triple six and potentially the 157. There is Jordan Sherritt, the defending race winner, defending series champion, uh, has been involved in an enormous crash. There is Donado for racing ON3 in that triple six Ferrari as well. Chaos at the top of Radion once again. It's so treacherous. Saw them running up and over the top in that battle for fifth place, and it looked pretty intense. Uh, in that scenario, and it's it's no surprise to see them further back also having issues. Yeah, but uh, throughout throughout all of the aggravation, well done to Raffaele Donardo on not rejoining straight back into the traffic. He kept his head, and despite having made a mistake on Radion on his own, he uh, he waited until the traffic had passed and didn't cause an even bigger crash. I think we're being told that it was as he was spinning out over the curb, which I'm actually pretty surprised that neither of these two did, because I'm pretty sure um, Gamble was very much over that curb on the left-hand side, just as you crest um, Radion. And yeah, we're being told that that happened to the triple six, bottomed out, went for a slide, and then caused contact with the 157 of Jordan Sherritt, who was coming over, and GTWR being innocent, at least in this scenario uh maybe not so in the uh, the earlier stages of the race uh first 10 minutes has been calamitous for some but perfect for others tausha leading away by half a second over miato and then dietrich who's dropped off a little bit four seconds back in that aston martin a bit of a a, a gap appearing between the top two and then third and then that gap back to fourth position of course we've been watching this battle unfold that's just allowing nerby to pull away in that ferrari as well Yep, Tanisha and Miyato, perfect starts from those guys, needing to build out the gap, keeping their noses clean. I don't think those cars will have a scratch on them yet, so credit to those guys. They have done an absolutely perfect job so far.
Yeah, and exactly what they needed to do in the early stages is just clear off into the distance and try and take uh, full advantage. The Aston Martin we'd expect to be faster. The problem with it is that uh, it, it burns through its fuel faster. It needs to come in with, you know, sort of, I think it's between 65, 70 minutes, whereas the stint time, uh, more pushing it towards a 75 minute stint, which, to be honest, if there's one team in that top lot that I know will probably go the distance, it's the BMW of Arthur Camera, because they were so good on fuel mileage back at Bathurst. They, I th I'm pretty sure over the first few times into the pit lane, they were one of, if not the only team in sort of like the top 10, top 15, top 20 that actually took it all the way to the 75 minute bit. Hearing that there's another crash out of that, uh, the 601, uh, having a crash at uh, Radion, the eSports performance racing team. So clearly some drivers towards the back end struggling in these immensely tricky conditions. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's Alvin Bouquet just getting it wrong at the top of the hill. So just... I, I've noticed the Audis have had a rough time of things to the start of this race and Radion's catching a fair few of them out so tricky start for quite a lot of these guys. Oh, change for the race lead. Miato's got through according to the sectors. The uh, 211, I think briefly, uh, no it has been passed. Miato to the race lead. Oh. Yep, interesting to see Miato through to the lead. I reckon that was a small mistake from, a mistake from Tausha because he's all over the back of Miato again, looking to get back through, back into the race lead. He wants that place back. Well, yeah, we were saying there was three seconds back to, to Dietrich uh, just a lap ago. It must have been a mistake from Michael Tausha. Uh, being no told, it was just a, a bit of a slipstream and up the hill. So clearly a switch just legitimately on pace, but... Uh, either way, the harder they battle, the more they drop back towards Dietrich in that 14 as well. Unicorns of Love, their fan base will be very, very happy. No, they're always out in force. Uh, do very much love their team. Going exceptionally strong here, especially with a six and a half second gap to gamble. What's happened? There was a Ferrari in there. What has happened to a Ferrari? That's a very good point. I, I saw him. I, I, was, I was thinking, when was Gamble in fourth? And there was a Ferrari in there that has now just vanished off the face of the earth for some reason. Not sure what happened there, but that's going to be a big upset if there's been uh, a crash or a technical issue that took them out of the race early. We're being told that it is Nerby who is in the pits. He was the GTWR racing team Ferrari that was in there and is now into the pit lane. This is a replay from a little bit earlier. I think we're going to see this is Jordan Sherritt diving it to the inside and then spinning out the Aston Martin. Oh, a little bit clumsy, don't you think? Yeah, three cars into one wet corner. Very rarely work, and there's a little bit more contact on the exit, actually, as you just saw as the camera cut away. But it's all, it was all a little bit frantic, and uh, I'm hoping the field spread calms these guys down a little bit, because early start on a damp track, always going to be a little bit of chaos. Uh, now I'm in this uh, position, if I'm in this group, I'm very concerned now because that gap that was three seconds to the 91 which we're being told is a flat out just a disconnection uh from the race that gap that was three seconds to the next car obviously with that disconnection there was a three second gap either way is now out to six to seven seconds to dietrich and if i'm in this group i'm panicking now i'm thinking that's a long gap to try and close down i know it's obviously a 24-hour race but that's where you know you the desperation can can creep in you need to get through but overtaking in these conditions is immensely difficult and uh being told another yet yeah, the 118 having yellow flags once again at radion full pace racing bring out their second yellow flag of second the race ho. not yeah, the great wall. for some yeah, uh, interesting to note, as we noted the Audis on the wall, that actually Ciclari has got back past Henrik Gamble and is starting to stretch away. So he's made the move he needed to make, and now he's pushing on. It kind of makes you wonder in this group, if you're at the back, like uh, the likes of Yiga Rog Rogodikov, we know how aggressive he is. Is, is he going to force something a little bit too hard to push his way through? Or is it just about, what, what would you do in the scenario? Would you just be waiting? Could you force the move? Probably not. I mean, going offline, obviously, it's going to be more wet offline. Um, so you've got to keep, you've got to be careful in these conditions. If it was dry, you could obviously lean on the car a little bit more. Not so in these damp conditions. Here we go and have a look at the 118 into turn one. Just going to be. Oh, as we see an Aston Martin. Oh no. 
Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit speechless with that. I think we had, we had, we had. I think I'm pretty sure it was the RSR car, the Aston Martin uh, that was sideways to the road. Ooh. There's already damage on that car, and yeah, just let's go straight away for the 118. Uh, the Aston Martin that was side by that was perpendicular to the race circuit. I mean, what do you do about that running down the hill? It's because where you're too wide, you're too wide, you're too wide again, and then there's a car sideways. What do you do? I think that's one of the situations you can't really win. I mean, if, if you were to try moving and a car drove into you, that's your fault. So I, I think the most sensible thing to do is hold on the brakes and just try and give everyone behind you as much of a chance of getting by as we see uh, Knight and the Aston Martin around the outside losing the back end of the car and taking the shortcut through the top and losing it off the track, on the grass, easily lose a few places, hopefully he can get going again. Though. See Camera bottling up the field behind, he's got past Henrik Gamble that is, so Gamble all over the back of the BMW which we know is going to go long in the stint. Gamble needs to get that place back to save his first day. Yeah, a bit of changes in this pack as uh, the BMW of Arthur Camera has got by uh, a, a couple of drivers. There was, um, it's Saclari who's uh, able to, like, as you say, like whilst the BMW has got through, the the Saclari has been able to pull away and it seems to be pulling away by quite a big stretch it says 1.5 seconds but obviously once we pass the sector split i'm pretty sure that will be bigger uh, than that gap i think it might be up to like two and a half three seconds because has absolutely cleared off let's get that sector through there you go three seconds wow. so this is what happens when you're trying to force a move in these in this kind of scenario you just lose so much time Yep, now riding on an onboard, out of La Source. Is this going to be the crash from earlier? Cars go left, cars oh. go right, bang. Yeah, completely unsighted. That was uh, no fault to the 121 Audi there. Just thinking, well, had no idea. Didn't get, didn't get given enough time to react. No, it's just kind of one of those scenarios where the Aston was spinning out fairly late, running down the hill. No one predicted it. The car ahead maybe had enough time to break and try and get out of the way. But by the time that he's done that, someone else is unsighted coming down the hill. And unfortunately, the driver being unsighted, being that 121 Odox Motorsport. That's a, it's, it's a rough scenario. It's quite narrow there, especially with the pit lane, because you've got these, uh, the, the, the bollards and stuff there, the sort of wall between the pit lane. And like it, it where on a uh, you know on a Grand Prix day where you know you might have a bit more room there it's really quite narrow towards the top and yeah uh, uh, very unfortunate there just kind of one of those scenarios that's the triple seven being spun around uh, just a little bit clumsy from that SG Stern Mercedes but uh, kind of just one of those things where everyone's going so slow that in these conditions you basically just need to breathe on the back of them and they spin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The tiniest of taps, and that Mercedes has a notoriously long bonnet, so probably just a small misjudgment with slightly, um, yeah, unfortunate consequences. Oh, look at that move from Dondi around the outside of Mikhail Statsenko for Yazheet Pirelli. Now to the inside as they exit uh, that complex and run down the hill from Malmody to Rivage. And the Audi behind of Beck is also trying to take advantage. It was a great attempt from the Aston Martin of Dondi. Not going to work out, in fact, going to lose him a position. Shout out, by the way, to Yaz Heat running slightly different colours this round, running the yellow of Pirelli as they've jumped up with um, sponsorship with that, uh, with the Italian organisation being told. Penalty coming through first one of the day. Uh, this one going the way of that triple seven in that instant that we, oh, sorry, going the way of the 191 in the instant that we just saw where he spun the triple seven. And SG Stern receiving a penalty already. Not the, a good start to the race for those guys. Needed to keep their nose clean. And I think it was just a small misjudgment with blown up consequences, unfortunately. So a, a lost time. But you still got 23 hours and 40 minutes to go when you look at the clock. So if, if you still get everything right from now on, still chance for a good result. Absolutely. James Bacon currently on screen. Gamble and Camera. Camera has been able to pull away a little bit in this uh, in this sort of train. But as Saclari got ahead of Gamble, he has gone. He has absolutely cleared off. It's now up to 3.6 seconds. Was three on the previous lap. So pulling away quite quickly. 
I've been thoroughly, thoroughly impressed, impressed by James Bacon in his early stages. I don't think I've seen him make contact with another car yet. And he's moved up three places from his starting position and is now on the back of Henrik Gamble. And if he can get past Gamble, camera is open for grabs and then clear track for six and a few seconds in front. Looking at the 601 Audi, that one being the E Sport Performance car. We're more focused on the Audi uh, oh, the Aston Martin behind. Oh, they're both overdoing it a little bit with the Ferrari ahead. There's a bit more contact for good measure. Statsenko just picking his way through all of that and basically just locked in the middle of the road, trying to look for a bit of clear space to uh, get off the road. I'd say, to, all things considered, after being spun around in a difficult scenario like that, that's about as well handled as you could wish. James Bacon, not content with seventh wants himself a sixth place at present no way through decent effort around the outside but we've seen time and time again around the outside that they come yes it gives you the inside for the next bit but then you're on the outside for malmody and then running down the hill you just can't take advantage yeah bacon all over the back of gamble but you've got to bear in mind that whilst he scraps he's leaving himself open for attack from from contagianis behind in in the green in the green aston martin so he's got to be careful where he places his car this is triple six. We'll see what happens to him. So loses the rear end, then comes back onto the road. There's Jordan Sherritt, who just gets clipped ever so slightly. That's quite a hard hit into the barrier on the far side. We've seen that time and time again. It's just as the as you as you go up through the compression um, at Eau Rouge that it just really bottoms out of the car and causes difficulties. Look at that. You were saying about Conti Yanis, who was behind trying to attack James Bacon. Well, now it's Yiga Ogorognikov who's made that position up, just courtesy of the mistake from the Greek driver and the Russian moving forward as we ride on board with James Bacon. We seem to be missing all the action here, watching things and then hopping back and forth through replays. So, obviously, good move from Mogorodnikov, and uh, now he can try and push on to lose a few, uh, to gain back a few of those places. You can see from the onboard of James Bacon how difficult it is to see to spot. You can see, to be honest, no disrespect to uh, to Gamble, Henrik Gamble, who's currently leading this train. You can see where that car is slower. It's right at apex speed. Uh, I wonder if he's not so much running a, uh, a, a wet setup in this scenario because it seems like there is a lack of grip on that Aston Martin as things stand. And James Bacon looks a lot faster at present. Uh, Arthur Camera's gap has come down because uh, 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 I thought he pulled out a little bit more than that. But still, Saclari is pulling out even further. It's gone out to five seconds now over Arthur Camera. Camera's gapped the field of this group anyway. And uh, yeah, Bacon just not able to get through. Very much the cork in the bottle, as uh, to, to use the phrase. Uh, Gamble is in this scenario. Watch out for Rogorodnikov going up the camel straight. Bacon a little bit compromised over the top of Radion. Bacon goes defensive. Rogorodnikov tries to find a half a gap, but James Bacon not having any of it up to the top of the, of, of the camel straight. Oh, he's going around the outside. These two were close as wow. there we go from wow. Yigor Ogorognikov. That's what we expect to see from the young Russian around the outside at Lacom. Uh, clean move, great move around the outside where other people had uh, failed to make that one stick. The number 41 on a march forward and the fan base will be going wild now. Sets his sights on the sixth place of Gamble. I get the feeling he would be able to make that move stick. This is the overtake for the race lead. And I I think when we came back there, Tausha had skipped the top of Radion, maybe was a little bit careful, and that is what allowed uh, Miato to take the lead. Pretty easy move, and I don't think it'll be too harshly fought from the GTWR R8GE Sports squad. And a bit of a switch there, but that slip and slide in the exit of the corner did cost him a lot of time, though. Yes, it did, but as you can see, I think things have settled down a little bit. The gap to Dietrich has gone up again slightly, and then Siklari, camera all a bit more spread out in their own air. But going back to Ogorodnikov, we've seen people try that move around the outside of the chicane at the end of the camel straight, but no one so far had made it succeed. But Igor Ogorodnikov, sorry, it's easy for me to say, um, getting his elbows out as we know he can, and frankly, beautiful move around the outside. Yeah, it really was uh, stunning. Here's Capera under attack from the Jean Lacy Esports Academy Cup car. That one being the Ferrari. I'm pretty sure it's the Ferrari that's the uh, the Cup car anyway. Uh, they've got two cars on this grid. And where we've got trains up towards the front end, we've also got trains 
towards the back, towards the midfield as well. It's intense no matter where you look. And uh, Schoeniger, who was very, very impressive uh, last round out, if I remember correctly, was really, really pacey over the top and doesn't have too much sim racing experience to fall back on. Looking quite potent at the moment. You've got the Elvis Gratton, uh, Honda NSX behind, who's diving it to the inside, going around the outside of the Ferrari with Schoeniger. And I think he might make that one stick. The Elvis Gratton squad not able to do so. And getting escorted off wide by Jordan Sherritt as well on his march back up the order. So be amazed there wasn't a car facing the wrong way in the bus stop. Big dive from the Honda and I, I was very, very surprised and thankful to not see a car facing the wrong way again. We've seen quite a few of them so far. So good driving, good racing, guys. Yeah, it's hard stuff out there. They are battling for all they're worth. There's Jordan Sherritt making the position on Lozio and uh, going up yet another as uh, trying to come back from the instant. I, I'm not sure. Oh, that could be a big one. This pink performance up and over the uh, the top and going way off wide. Going to drop the position uh, all the way back behind even Issa. But Jordan Sherritt, I was going to ask you this question. Do you not think his car will be a bit more damaged than it is considering how hard he hit the wall at the top of Radion? Considering everything that's happened, I don't think he's doing half bad. And if you look back, the, the 777 Bentley moving his way back through after another incident as well in this race. So you have these guys out of position in the early stages of the race, pushing their way back through you, and it makes absolutely great viewing. I, it's just I, the last thing you want is a, is a bent car at the moment. Because, you know, if you, uh, you've you knocked off like a rear tow link or something like that, you're done. You're completely done. Because when it, if like the conditions are already unpredictable, right? And then you have a car that's unpredictable. Whoa, that's, that's hard to drive. Yep, difficult squared, I think, is what you'd call that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, tricky, tricky, definitely, depending on the damage in that. So we're hearing that uh, the 157 is around two seconds lap slower, but it's still pushing forwards. And that's the most important part, is that he's keeping his head down, going forwards, not spending time losing time being frustrated. And it's just pushing through. So we hear the, seven, the 787 has spun in Puons. That's never a nice place to spin, but it's now recovered. The Shermatitsky BMW, one of two BMWs in this grid. Unfortunately, not able to match the, rival, uh, the pace of the other BMW, Arthur Camera, currently running up in fifth place. Yeah, of course, it is important to note. Uh, oh, no! It rain me as we come back and away he goes down into the wall on the exit of Blanchemont. <sighs> That's a shame. We were just speaking to uh, Chris Herker behind uh, before the broadcast and they'd moved their way up the order so well. And yeah, for Re the Ren Welton Pro team, that is a shame. Hopefully not too much damage on the car, although I would suspect it's going to be a little bit slower. Yeah, that is a shame. Oh, it just looked like he lost the rear end on entry. I don't think he tagged the wall that hard. and It looked fairly square rather than on one corner, so maybe a little bit of aero damage, but I think the car tracking wise should still be okay but the big mover of the race so far knocked back down the field so yeah big shame but uh, hopefully he can gather his head and move forward again there's the WPS racing team Dennis Schoeniger who's uh, now passed but oh no he's, he's still got a pair up ahead I wonder if um, I wondered if Jordan Sherrod had passed him but uh, no, not quite yet. This is on board with Mike, Mike Noble, who's just got past Mikhail Stutsenko. That McLaren, where it was quite strong at Bathurst, and this team is, is a strong team. I mean, Yazhi is, a, is an incredibly strong outfit in sim racing in general. Not looking so strong at the moment. Stutsenko, who's a, a great driver, not ideal. Dropping three positions in the early phases of the race, certainly not what they signed up for. All of the McLarens seem to be struggling so far. The highest one being um, the Maskowski a McLaren in P12. So, for whatever reason, the McLarens seeming to be oh so good at Bathurst, seeming to struggle now. Yeah, there's a, a couple of big names on the grid noticing as well. 24th place ahead of this, Jack Keithley. For those of you who don't know who he is, he's a uh, multiple champion elsewhere in sim racing. He's been in sim racing for the best part, I think, about 12, 15 years, uh, winning a couple of days ago in a high-level competition. So he knows how to fight, in more so in touring cars, less so in endurance racing, but has his fair shout as well uh, a little bit further up the grid. Williams Esports, one of those squads that did not have a particularly good run uh, last time out from memory as we run on board with um, Samir Abrami who car touch wood 
car looks okay at the moment as we're riding on board from the nose. Looks like it's very much going on the attack and the wet conditions. It's going to try and pass the MCW Racing Team Audi that uh, they were in the Audi last season. So clearly a bit of a switch and potentially a move coming in here now for the Lamborghini. All oh, coming back across though was the MCW car. And there's going to be the switch either way. So it didn't even matter about that contact. Samira Brahmi up to 27. Good assertive move. I did notice a little bit, the car looked a little bit nervous going through the entry of Blanchon. Of course, he lost it this time one lap ago, but has obviously recovered well and is now pushing on and making those positions that he lost. Got their eyes on a whole bunch of Audis. Uh, Sherratt, who's been working his way up the order, is the second to last one. You've got Bokeh as the last one of it. Uh, Should go Capera and uh, Giglioli, who's currently leading that group, but seeming to be struggling for the MCW squad as they all ride up and over the top. And you can see there the issue uh, for Capera. I think this might allow Schoen to go through, but I think it might allow of all of them as we go three wide on the Camel Straight. was going to say Jordan Sherratt fancies his way through in all of this. And uh, the, the feisty South African, the defending series champion, there's still three wide as Schoen skips the chicane. And at Lecom, he's going to run straight over and try and rejoin cleanly, giving room, gaining the position on Capera. But I think he might drop behind as they run down to Rivage got to be careful to do so because I'm pretty sure Bokeh might also try and find his way through. Sherratt with the position done but yeah I think that was a required move across the outside there just to bail from that. Well uh, it is about survival and if that's how you survive then that's what you need to do but uh, well 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 done to him to not lose any places actually. Uh, obviously made up the one initially on Sherratt but gave it back and now can just clear his head obviously had a small moment but no damage to the car and get on with it. In the the thing is, though, where you have these races, where you've got, you know, you're in the wet, it's tricky conditions. And I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure, you know, at some point in sim racing, maybe you must have had it as well. And you know, maybe even the real world as well. When you skip across something like that, what about bumps? What about random bumps that you didn't even know were there? They can so easily catch you out. Oh, absolutely. I think I've had a couple of moments like that. Maybe at Spa, in fact, actually, because that's uh, Spa and Silverson, I think, are the two main tracks with the best runoff that I've actually been to. Actually, no, maybe Dubai. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just completely glossing the point here. But uh, yeah, you, you find random things and details about tracks that you never knew existed. And if you're not careful and if you don't keep your patience and just use your head to go through them, then it can easily catch you out and put you somewhere you really don't want to be, even though you were trying to avoid trouble in the first place. Yeah, most notably backwards, I think it's the the ideal one that people want to avoid because uh, that's the one that, that happens time and time again. I've had it so many times where I've skipped across something. There's been a bit of a dip. and um, I, I think uh, in sim racing terms, turn whatever the third to last corner is at Malaysia and you run wide there and there's a massive bit of concrete that just you don't see normally. But if you run wide, it can uh, it can very much end your day let's go with that uh, day's not ended though Yigor Ogorokov up a few positions from ninth to seventh after dropping down in the earlier stages of the race as well now on the back of Gamble as he's been for a few laps Gamble's defense looks very impressive at the moment because at no point really has the aggressive Russian of Yigor Ogorokov been able to get through He's doing a very, very good job to hold on to that place and the, he's had cars behind him all race long and has managed to keep his head and keep his composure in amongst the madness that he's been involved in and uh, has come through with it with a really, really strong defence. The Elvis Grattan team, oh, is about to give them some praise. Spins out eSports performance racing team just on the exit of Malmody. That slight tap from the Honda NSX on the rear end of the Audi R8 was just enough to unload the rear, lift it up off the road and go for a spin. Easy to do though, that. Yeah, don't be surprised if that is a penalty of some sort, unfortunately. Time or drive through, just a little bit of contact. On, uh, well, it was avoidable, but um, yeah, just, just the slightest of touches when the car's all loaded up. The smallest touch is all you need to send the car rotating, and I think that pretty much sums up what happened there. I mean, 
heard it before in you know motorsport terms of course the you know, we hear of things like the limit of adhesion and that lot so you know you're going through a corner you're on the very limit of your car and it only takes a very small amount to just knock it off that and go for a spin obviously in the wet conditions that isn't just doubled that's times by 10 times by a million even who knows as we see arthur camera on screen there on the right hand side g2 esports t-shirt on sim racing branded gear becoming very very frequent and common these days isn't it well how chilled does he look i mean as as, as far as guys in important circumstances goes i don't think i've ever seen anyone look more relaxed but uh, yeah going on about the uh, the esports branded stuff i'm very much looking forward to picking up my my, my bs competition stuff um they do look good but they do look good don't they i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to trying it on but uh yeah you 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 see it floating around now and it just looks the part and it's good to represent your brand especially if we go to uh, get back to the the standard of um, uh, LAN events and stuff and meeting up and then having your sim racing gear all looks very good you can see there on your screen car triple six car one at five four and lap three drive three penalty for the car 154 that is Dondi that's currently running in 13th position so drive through penalty picking up a couple uh, in the early stages, seeing these drive-throughs coming through. Uh, Jordan Sherritt still has escaped. I'm not sure if that's because race control have already looked at it and have denied it, or if they've just not even got around to seeing it yet, because there's been quite a lot of calamitous stuff happening towards the back. But this is what we were talking about. You, you, you said about like drive-through penalties and not getting drive-throughs in the early stages because of track limits and stuff. Uh, a a drive-through for contact? You're already in the bad books of race control. Not a way to start it. Absolutely, you've got to tread carefully, and that drive-through is going to drop them miles down the field. As we see, Campbell now on the defence mark from Ogoronikov, wide through Puel. Oh. There's a little bit of contact. Ogoronikov's going to hang it in there and get the inside for the next corner. Is he going to give a little bit of contact back? Good move from Yegor Ogoronikov up into P6. He's broken Campbell's stern defence, and well, we know he's aggressive. He used it, but as far as I'm concerned, that was fair game in my book. Yeah, feisty stuff. You could potentially argue he turned in a little bit too much, but I think by the trajectory was given enough room. The two just sort of came together there on the first apex of the uh, Fania Chicane, or Piff Path, which is the best name for it. Um, and yeah, had the move done before they even got to campus. Fantastic stuff from Ogorogonkov and exactly what he needed to do. I'm going to try and fire his way through and follow up the order. James Bacon as well to the inside for Ubic Events Racing, committed on the brakes but he's going to have the inside for the first part, the outside for the second part of the final chicane. And once again, Henrik Gamble is just able to hang on. And if Bacon attacks any harder, Lecom's also going to come through, the uh, AAA eSports driver as well. Going to try and go around the outside of the source. I don't really see this one working out. We've seen it happen a couple of times. Surely not towards Eau Rouge. Surely not. Oh, they're going to be side by side. Hold oh, they're going to go. Everyone. Bacon's got to back out. He's got to back out. He's not going to. He does eventually, but purely because Gamble held the inside. I cannot believe there wasn't a monumental crash there. Wow, wow, wow. That is bravery half an hour into the race. Oh, Lacom also here. He's maybe looking. You can see it in the rear view mirror at the top. Also, Conta Yanis also going to try and find his way up a position in this scenario. Maybe a little bit wide at Lacom as he's trying to get by the AAA. Esports has no grip out there and the position is held from AAA. No way through for Bacon yet, but that was a good attempt. Valiant effort bit concerning to see the, the attempt of side by side, but I don't think that's going to be the last time that we see that attempt at eh, Rouge throughout the rest of the day. Are we seeing the same race time that the drivers are seeing? This is not 24 hour driving, this is sprint race stuff as James Bacon gets a little bit wide there over the grass. But this is absolutely incredible battling with 23 hours and 20 minutes to go, I can't believe it. Being told that uh, some of the drivers are being told by race control, a little bit of a warning, a more of a, a stern warning to say, We've seen a lot of you running over the exit at Radion, uh, running over that kerb a little bit on the the entrance, you know, the first apex and then on the exit of Radion and basically race control getting on that and being like, yeah, can you cut that out, please? There's still 23 hours, 20 minutes to go. And I get the feeling that if some drivers, you know, it's kind of one of those things of do it within reason. You know, if you've got, if you're not taking the mick, if you're not pushing it too far, it's fine. But when you start pushing it that bit further, when you start, taking advantage in a really obvious way and just making things look a little bit silly 
race control will get on you and uh, our live stewards will be say giving a bit of a slap on the wrist potentially a drive-through penalty maybe a time penalty to add to the pit stop but potentially a drive-through like we said before drive-through round here i know it's a 24-hour race but you might as well kiss most of it goodbye yeah that was very much an oi watch it we're seeing you from race control and uh the drivers need to be careful to keep their notebooks completely unblotted by the stewards so keep it clean guys uh, we've seen a few contact we've seen a few incidents so far that have taken a few drivers out of the running we do think but um yeah it's uh there's a long way to go and uh, there's no point throwing your race away this early no, certainly not. A few drivers have been very, very close. Uh, certainly all of these ones on screen at the moment have had their fair bits of uh, either just moments around the circuit or assisted by others. Matushka for peak performance has been off the road a couple of times, including in a major way uh, up over uh, uh, the, the top of Radion and ran out wide, if we remember correctly, where there was such little grip out there. Currently on screen, Jack Keithley says Garrett's 59. It's the Williams eSports squad, I believe in the number five car, Jack Keithley behind the wheel for this round. Uh, uh, one of the uh, many teams that have been in sim racing for a little while as a partnership with a real world team, of course, Williams. Uh, and Jack Keithley has been a part of that squad for the best part of, oh, maybe two years now. He's been a part of it for quite a while, left um, a, a team called ACR Zach Speed, which um, then changed and whatever, but uh, this was, 2018 so he's been a part of the team for, for just over two years now has really really settled in with Williams Esports they've had a, a loss of a couple of drivers um, recently and had a, a, a fair few drama but I'm pretty sure as far as my understanding is, is anyone who's been keeping up to date with the social stuff on uh, sim racing terms there was a bit of drama with Williams Esports as far as I'm aware that is fully sorted now and they are back to being comfortable they're not collapsing they're not disappearing they are in sim racing for the long haul. Now attacking the triple one of Dominic Blyer. DV1 Triton victorious last time out. 40 kilos on board with that. We should probably talk about the success balance that some of those cars have. Up to 22nd. Yeah, Jack Heathley, very, very experienced sim racer. Uh, me. Very experienced sim racer. There we go, all over the back of the triple one Bentley. Um, yeah, the V carrying 40 kilos of ballast from the last time out and is doing a pretty solid job to run in 22nd place considering the extra weight that car has got on it. Going very much by its, you know, its nickname. We all know it's called the Boatly, isn't it? And in the wet weather of today, up 14 places on the day so far. Uh, less than an hour complete, so still eyeing their way up a little bit further. But you can see they're running through Blanchemont that just didn't have the ability to hook the apex as nicely as Keithley, missed it by uh, a solid half car width. And you do that time and time again, and the driver with the experience of Keithley will be able to, to march way past. Speaking of aggressive drivers, Keithley is one. He can be quite aggressive. He could be ruthless on the racetrack. Yeah, watch a move for into last horse. Is he going to show it? Oh, like I predicted it, dives in last minute. Is he there? Oh, he runs a little bit deep, a little bit of door banging. This is going to give an opportunity behind to the uh, Gietvan Bentley and yes he does get past Blair down towards Eau Rouge and Keith only moves off a of place but also completely free move for Gietvan behind. As was uh, the Rocket Simsport car of Luca Burke who's uh, worked up yet another spot as well so uh, the Rocket Simsport squad marching forward replay on our screen let's see what's Ooh. oh the Bentley just losing it on the uh, the exit there of Stavolo and the Aston Martin picked up the pieces of that in the worst possible way. The worst possible way. That is that is AstroTurf doing what AstroTurf does best. And from what I've been told, that is the Aston Martin that started this race from the pit lane. So a race not going well already, getting even worse, which is a big, big shame. Yeah, we were told it's, it's not, they didn't start from the pit lane to avoid the carnage, which to be fair, if you were starting from the mid pack of the grid, you know, I don't blame you if you wanted to do so. It was more so to, um, uh, through technical issues and stuff that put them in the pit lane. But yeah, talk about from bad to worse. You've got out of the back of someone, you're fancying making up a position and uh, not today, Sonny Jim. And yeah, it, it's a shame, but... I guess, you know, sometimes those rounds go for it. The problem is when it happens this early in a race, you've got such a long day ahead to try and make amends of those issues that, yeah, the, the next 23 hours are going to be a real long slog. 
Well, I, I know from experience, if you start a race badly, your head drops, and you just lose your confidence in yourself, really, especially if it's a driver bought error. I remember back, back in the Dubai 24 hours 2019, I was racing in Janetta, and we had um, one of the drivers in the car have an accident in the middle of the night, and we were leading class at that point, and it just, it just ruins your morale, and it's going to be really hard for those guys to pick their pecker up and get on with the race, but if you can, and you keep your head down, anything can still happen, still well over 23 hours to go. did a 12-hour race elsewhere in sim racing and got, uh, we, as a team, we got spun out at the sixth corner of the race. It broke the car. We had like 20 minutes of damage from it. And I'm like, yeah, no, I, I quit. Because uh, it's, it's one thing that's so easy to do in sim racing is just to bail. But there is that sort of strength of mentality to just stay in the race and just keep going and keep trying. Of course, prize money's up for grabs. Uh, in the race, um, and, and plenty of it indeed. The top 15 from each race receiving prize money, but not only that, the highest of each manufacturer will be receiving prize money as well. So, in that sense, I wouldn't want to be an Aston Martin right now because you've got to be leading. <laughs> well, I, uh, you've got to be fighting right in the front. Honda. Well, I, I, I definitely want to be a Honda in that regard because there's only Absolutely. one. So, here's, here's some free money for you, sir. Thank you very much. That's why I love it, though. It encourages you to take a random choice, to take something a bit different, because you get a bit of prize money from They're guaranteed that every round. Exactly, exactly. And uh, just scrolling through the running order right now, only, I believe, can I see two Porsches in the race. So, yeah, always good to have some, some diversity in cars, and there's quite a lot of Aston Martins, quite a lot of Bentleys, quite a lot of Audis, but some really good class diversity out there, which is always good to see. Speaking of that, uh, that Honda, the 416, got up to 30th position, just ahead now of the MCW Esports. Uh, just made that move stick up into where they come. Oh, look at this. Arthur Camera, speaking of some cars that are beating the other ones, there's only two BMWs on the grid, and Arthur Camera very much the head of that BMW squad. And look at that from Yigor Ogorognikov through the inside of Campus, then to the inside of Stavolo, up to the top five. And it is an Aston Martin, one, two, three, four, five. The only car in the top 10 that isn't an Aston Martin is that BMW. Wow, wow, and uh, just looking at the times, cameras last lap a second slower than Giga Rodnikov's Aston Martin. Also important to note, I believe I've just seen Kevin Siclari get past, uh, getting past Dietrich's Aston Martin into P3, so another change of position up the order. So. All moves for the Aston Martin so far uh, in, in these early runnings of the race. Pretty sure that was Jordan Sherritt off in the background. He might lose a position here to Hoban uh, in the Audi. Normally see Nick Hoban driving around, pretty sure from memory, in a, in a Porsche normally elsewhere in uh, the sim grid. But yeah, dropping a position there from Jordan Sherritt uh, just over the wet part of the track. We're looking at... Uh, oh, no, he's, he's always uh, he's always Audi is 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 human. It's fine. Um, Jack Keefe, though, who's currently on screen, then setting some very good times. Now on the back of the 22 of Luca Burke. Uh, Burke needs to get by. Uh, get Van pretty sharpish now. Yeah, a driver I'd expect to be out of position is Luca Burke down in 22nd place. If you look at the McLarens in front of him, I'd expect him to be around them, not down in P22. So he needs to get his head down and try and make as many places as he can. Do you not? Know, okay, right. We'll, we'll tackle this subject head on. Why not? Do you think Jack Keithley would be disappointed with where he is, considering the strength of the Aston Martins? Right. Do you not think that it would be a little bit like a. Uh, uh, he's quite a lot further down the order than he really should be? Well, as far as hit drives go, he's, he's taken the car and it's going to bring it back into the pits in one piece, albeit with a little bit of experience marks, as I like to call it. But, um, yeah, I, I think there's quite a few drivers in this grid who we maybe expect a little, to be a little bit higher up. And, um, obviously, when they do bring the car in in around maybe, I don't want to say around two hours' time, we don't know how they're running their pit strategies. But, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take quite a big personality to come back from quite a interesting first into the race. Uh, I, I mean, it's a smart move from Williams Esports to put Jack Keefley behind the wheel at the early stages because he did qualify. Oh, well, it wasn't him that qualified, but the Williams Esports car, uh, McCormick, that was the one that qualified. It's qualified all the way down in 44th spot. So it's worked its way up 21 positions in the opening hour of the race, which is pretty impressive. But naturally, in that Aston Martin, it's kind of what we'd expect. Jordan Sherritt to the inside of Hoban. There's the position done. 
that was uh, peaceful, fairly easy, realistically. I mean, it was a bold move and a good attempt, but it wasn't hardly fought by the 33. It just sort of almost, as soon as the move was at near completion, just allowed it to happen. Absolutely not, and I think um, it's important to pick your fights in a race as uh, as long as this. And um, yeah, as we can see, Sherat getting past Hoban, and Hoban not really knowing that his fight isn't with Sherat with over 23 hours left on the clock. And maybe if they get back together in the last hour, then maybe you'll fight harder. But with this much time left in the clock, definitely not worth putting your car off the road scrapping with someone. No, certainly not. Looking like it's going to be a pretty difficult pass here for uh, the Rocket SimSport car of Luca Burke, who just doesn't have the straight line speed in that McLaren uh, to get by the Bentley of Gietvin. And uh, behind, of course, he's going to be under pressure from the ever speedy Jack Keithley, as I think he might have been looking to the inside. He's a little bit wide there from uh, Luca Burke. He's got no car to his inside because he can pull it all over to the wall, but clearly under a fair amount of pressure a driver who's really um, become accustomed to a uh, set of course of competizione as Luca Burke very much comfortable within it and very much comfortable within the Zancho Simsport and Rocket Simsport squads and being a part of that team that he's been for a little while the Slovenian incredible speed from the young man and uh, I, I it, it's clearly quite a struggle in that McLaren though. Yeah, Luca Burke, a driver I have encountered on track from the British GT Esports Series uh, a few months ago. Very, very fast. Um, got a little bit unlucky to not be in a championship fight, perhaps. But uh, yeah, very experienced. And obviously the Rocket Sim Sport cars uh, are, well, they're very good at their craft. And I think it shows um, the amount of times they're out, the amount of drivers they have, the results they get. So Luca Burke definitely moving forward from that car starting position. So uh, yeah, the experience of him should hopefully show. Vera Bramey applying pressure to Jack Keithley, who's Aston Martin seems to have dropped off just a little bit the last couple of laps, a few mistakes creeping in. The Ren Welton car that had marched forward so well in the uh, early part of the race, we unfortunately were on it when it went for a bit of a, uh, a, a dabble with the exit of Blanchemont. And um, yeah, as he's trying to work his way back up the order, seems like there isn't too much damage on that Aston, um, on that Lamborghini rather. Focusing on the BMW of Arthur Camera, Gamble coming back into it. That BMW that took off a little bit earlier seems to be struggling now. Yeah, yeah, looks like the traction out of the corners just isn't there anymore. So the BMW, a long car, a lot of power and torque coming from that twin turbo V8 up front just hasn't got the same speed as the Aston Martins right now and although he's shot off at the front he's now starting to make his way backwards into the pack behind and Henry Gamble and, uh, and Bacon and, and, and Lacombe behind all pushing forwards. Yeah, I'm not sure which the Ferrari is that's uh, between them, but that is a lapped car as far as I'm aware. It is Nerby who had the disconnection a little bit earlier and clearly has the pace to be running up here because he was running fifth when that disconnection happened. Uh, but realistically, we'll need to hop out of the way at some point and let these all continue their battle. And I think that is exactly what he is doing now, allowing this battle to continue gamble right on the back of the BMW of Arthur Camera. And I know Niels Nyox will be keeping his eyes focused on this BMW. We're approaching the hour mark, though, and we, based on uh, Bathurst, this BMW can hit the 75 minute mark, can take it all the way up to the end of the stint limit um, that we have here in the VCO World Cup. Meanwhile, the Aston Martins, they're not going to be able to get to that point, we think. So potentially it might just be a little bit of fuel, so it might just be a little bit of conservation from camera at the moment. But clearly his rear tyre is going off just a little bit more than he'd want. Yeah, definitely not ideal, and I wonder if they went with a slightly more aggressive set upon the car just to try and get out the blocks a little bit faster. But uh, yeah, the tyre is coming back to bite that BMW, and we knew the Aston Martin. Oh, was, oh as we see Bacon get wide through Poo on good save, but does lose a place to like on behind. But uh, after the fantastic start, he needs to keep that car on the road. Uh, good, good catch from that snap. Very easy to overcorrect in that scenario. So for the Ubic Events Racing car to only drop a single position in that sense would be, uh, you'll take it. Uh, it could be worse. Uh, speaking of other Aston Martins that have been struggling a little bit recently, by the way, Conta Yanis uh, dropped back behind Debo Propst um, as well as the 720 uh, McLaren. So dropping just a little bit down the order. Uh, Machkovsky 
making that position up, but is under pressure from Contiannis as well behind. So a few drivers under pressure as we approach that potential first pit stop within the next 20 minutes, nearly an hour complete in the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa. Miato has pulled out an awfully large gap over Tauscher since getting through. The question was uh, on differential of setup. Uh, seems like Miato in that 164 car is running a lower downforce setup, the 211 of Tauscher running a higher downforce setup, which says to me that the 211 is more running a, a, a more wet focused setup. Clearly not working out 110% in this scenario. Yeah, in a race such as this, you've got to set up the car for all of the race. You can't really make big setup changes throughout the race in the pit stops. So you can start the race on a wet setup if you think it's going to be majority wet, but if the track dries out, some guys who have gone for a more intermediate or dry setup further back and start making their way back through. So we, we probably have a huge variety of setups on the grid right now, varying from the, the dry ones that they probably would have run a couple of days ago in qualifying to the full wets to get off uh, well at the start. So it'll be interesting to see how this race plays out. Of course, all rain, for the next 30 minutes you can see in the top right of the screen but if that does dry out expect to see more changes down the order. Lacom by the way got through into Lecom uh, on Gamble so the position switch ahead so finally another driver uh, getting past the 995 ambassadors for Ren Welton a bit of a snap there running down the hill as well is this James Bacon's best opportunity out onto that Astro turf for Gamble clearly losing a lot of the rear grip in that Aston Martin at present. And for for James Bacon, he'll be sat there thinking, oh, why couldn't I have made that move? Because it's taken me, I've been sat behind this guy for an hour now. I'm getting a bit bored of this. Need to get through, need to make some progress. Yeah, and now Lackham having got past Bacon and Gamble is now all over the back of Arthur Camera. So two laps, two places. Could he make it a third and move up into, into that top five with, with some fantastic race graph? Yeah. I I think some drivers have fitted better to the wet conditions than others. It's, you know, it's, it's the great leveller for some and uh, for others it, it, it really does cause some issues. We're on board with Jordan Sherritt, GTWR R8G Academy, now trying to make a move on Dominic Blyer, DV1 Triton, the car that foiled them back at Bathurst and took that victory. Uh, in the land down under Lecom as well on the left hand side of your screen going to try and make a move on Arthur Camera moves left right and centre and the Aston Martin for AAA gets by Gamble into Lecom gets by Camera into the chicane and up two positions in one lap and what a lap it is for AAA brilliant it looks like he's kept his tyres better than the other Aston Martins around him both Bacon and Steve Gamble pit so he's the first of the guys to pit after just 57 minutes so Gamble now first the, the first front runner down pit lane yeah potentially a little bit early but just heard in my ear is gamble taking a gamble i think i think i just oh, need to be left there for a little bit yeah 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 I'll let, I'll just <laughs> that for a minute, shall we? oh dear no i mean to be fair i, I get it you um clearly gamble was struggling on tires at that point also under a lot of pressure i kind of like the idea to get out of the train and try and um, uh, uh, breathe a little bit and get away from everyone. Hearing that Mikhail Statsenko has lost it in the 149. Ooh, that is not good also to note is um, the Honda, the only Honda in the field has a drive through penalty and I believe is taking it right now and I'm hearing for the earlier contact in the race so Still the leading Honda, which would be a nice thing to say, but definitely as far as the general race is concerned, definitely not what they need at this moment. The bright yellow Yaz Heat Pirelli car currently on screen, Stetsenko. Yeah, we're hearing that lost it, uh, uh, Radion, and no, as far as the call is, no damage uh, on this car. Got away with it, and you can kind of see, because as much as lost a few positions, hasn't lost too much. Currently running in 18th spot, so realistically hasn't lost too much in that scenario. And you'd hope would then be straight back up to speed obviously under pressure from Van Omen behind but the thing is is yes sure a spin you may not get damage from it you're going to get a large large you know hit to your confidence though confidence tire wear yeah it's, it's, it's all going to make a difference definitely um, so interesting to see that if the pace continues to decrease 
So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be keeping a keen eye on, on Statsenko's progress for the rest of the stint. And we'll be keeping our keen eye on Bacon, who, as cameras, tyres are dropping off. Is this Bacon's best opportunity to dive it down the inside? He is going to fire it on the brakes, but the brakes on that BMW seem more than matched to the Aston Martin. No one going into the pit lane from that group. Everyone staying out an hour complete. I would suspect most people will try and take it around the circuit for at least the next sort of five to ten minutes. The, the, the pit window for the first stint time closes uh, effectively in 15 minutes time from now. So there's still plenty of time. Again, I'm going to say I reckon that BMW is taking it all the way up to the edge of that limit. Other cars in this train, though, I very much doubt it. Yeah, absolutely. We know, well, we, we think we know that camera is going to run it right out to the edge of the fuel window. The question is, can the tyres make it as Bacon now goes to the outside down the camel straight? Obviously got a better run through Radion and Rouge. Camera, though, with that BMW, really impressive straight line speed. But the car looks an absolute handful to drive right now. We know it's good on fuel, but is it going to be able to make the tyres last? Yeah, that was... Um, I, I'm going to take a bit of an assumption there might have been a mistake there from camera because it was really, really slow over the top. And now Thibaut Propst, as well as a part of this, the number 32, I know he does well in wet weather conditions and certainly fancies himself in the trickier conditions. So, yeah, a little bit of a mistake there from camera and Bacon is fancying himself an extra position. Already, Igor Rognikov has pulled a, an enormous gap on this group and cameras tires this bmw i thought it was going to be I, you know we know fuel mileage potentially were better i did not expect the tires to be this bad in comparison to that aston martin fallen off by an absolute mile if we look at the gap from camera to ogorodnikov who was battling with earlier that is an enormous gap to lose in a small space of time yeah we're being told as well the triple eight car of Knight, who's currently in 11th position, has been faster than anyone in this queue, has really, really forced his way up the grid, has got uh, the McLaren to, to, to pass of Maszkowski, then Props, then Bacon, and if he can get all of that done before camera's through, uh, before uh, Bacon's through on camera, that'll be great, because I base, best, you know, uh, based on his pace right now, uh, surely he should be able to make that move stick a wide at Blanchemont not ideal from Bacon just pushing it too far through the exit of that corner an hour complete yep not as close as he was one lap ago but that car's definitely the faster package at the moment and everyone behind him looks to be a faster package as well so camera is right on the ragged edge trying to hold on to, uh, to that seventh place as best as he can but the tyres just aren't underneath him and when you lose that edge on the tyres you lose the confidence, you lose the traction, you lose the outright speed and it just all gets worse and worse. wonder what you can do about that kind of scenario. We'll see if we can grab ourselves our first little chat of the day with our legendary pit reporter who guided us through uh, the, so the entirety of Bathurst giving us bits of information. James Parker uh, in the pit lane from Coach Dave Academy we're seeing some drivers then struggle on tyres. We're seeing that mostly coming the way of Arthur Cameron, who might be passed here by James Bacon. Let's just see if this move happens. Bacon to the outside. Uh, no way through at present, and the BMW is going to hang on. Is there anything they can do on track to sort of negate that disadvantage of the tyres? It's very difficult. I mean, um, the, the Astons are... are, are Famed for their tyre wear, it's one of the best cars in the um, in the game on tyres. So it, it's very difficult to try and control that if you're in a, in a car like the BMW, because towards the you know 75 minutes on a single set of wets um, against cars that are going to have a natural advantage on you anyway is always going to be an uphill task. And this is just like a natural evolution of the, the stint now, where towards the end when the fuel gets lighter. Obviously, the rear um, rear of the BMW is going to raise because where the fuel tank is, it's going to be a little bit more nervous. Um, and the Aston is just with that superior advantage um, that they have. Um, it's just going to basically snowball now for the next 15 minutes. So Arthur's got a... I mean, as you can see, he had a massive moment there and, and James Bacon has now made the move. He's just got to hang on now. And this is this is the... They, they won't be panicking, G2, because this is, a, this is a, essentially still a race of... Um, fuel numbers it's still maximize the stint get the 75 minutes every time 
because these Aston Martins, if it, if it goes dry later on in the race, 12, 13 hours down the line, and we have 12 hours of dry running, they're still going to save a, a pit stop. On average, that's two minutes. Two minutes of time, driving time, that the Astons have got to gain. So I don't think the guys will be worried just yet. Um, but they do look like they are under, under serious pressure now. Serious yeah. pressure. Absolutely. That was a fantastic move from uh, Bacon and Thibaut Props as well, trying to get involved and move his way up. Is So this is the time that if you're an Aston Martin, if you're in any of that car and you know that you're not going to get to the 75 minute limit, that this is the time you have to take advantage of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the, <laughs> it's almost a double advantage at the moment for the Astons because it's wet and, um, and the car's good here. So you've got a double advantage um, where it can take advantage of the conditions and its natural speed at the circuit anyway. So this is why you see the top two um, have really sprinted away at the front in clean air. And then you've um, got the likes of the racing line um, car of Kevin Saclari behind as well disappearing because they can just hit their numbers and hit their lap times every time. So this is... Um, for G2 sake, the longer this race stays wet, the less their advantage is on fuel. So this is this is perfect for the Astons. They can make a longer stint, around 70 to 71 minutes, we think, on fuel in the wet. They're only a few minutes short, and um, and yeah, they'll be they'll be praying that the rain eventually stops. A couple of drivers very much struggling with this. Final question for you: We know that the uh, Aston Martin's quite good in these towards the end of this stint. Is there any other car as well that really we should be keeping our eyes focused on? Because if the Aston Martin's good, does that just mean that it's almost default to a potential Aston Martin winner? Or is there other cars as well that look after the tyres even better? Then, I mean, the, the trouble is the Bentley is also exceptional on tyre wear, um, but obviously the majority of them are carrying quite heavy weight. Um, the exception to that is the 194 Bentley that's actually up 19 places, the ra other racing line car. Um, in P21, but the, what, they're not so great in the wet, so that they don't have the same double advantage that the Astons do. So um, the Ferraris are good. Um, I'm actually surprised how far um, a lot of them have fallen away. Um, the exception, to see that is T-Bob Props in the 32 at the moment um, in P8. But yeah, it's it's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky for other cars. Um, this this needs to be a dry race, basically quicker than, than um, uh, very well, very quickly for it to negate the advantage that they have. So the longer this stays wet, the bigger the advantage the Astons have. Well, thank you, James Parker. He'll be joining us at various points on the broadcast, jumping in to drop a bit of analysis from Coach Dave Academy. You can head on over there for all of your setup tips and a little bit of coaching as well. Uh, back to you, Angus. Seen that we've got uh, Merchkovsky, who's into the pit lane. Cameras dropped a couple of spots and all of that as well, past props. A little bit of a mistake in uh, Puan, it seemed, there. Uh, now we're seeing Conta Yanis as well, going to potentially get by uh, camera. Look at those Aston Martins, one through seventh, though, on the, the race at the moment. Yep, camera's tyres have very clearly died at this point, and the Aston Martins coming on strong, keeping their wet tyres in a lot better shape than the BMW. Um, yeah, very interesting to hear that uh, the Astons can stretch their fuel in the wet. So we want it to stay as wet for as long as possible. The sooner it can dry for camera and BMW and pretty much anyone else for that matter, the more chance they have. If it does eventually dry out though, just again, consult yourself with the top right of the screen where we've got our weather. So you can see that the effectively it's supposed to stay wet. It's hot though. It is hot on track 26 degrees ambient 29 degrees track temperature so if it were to stop raining that's going to clear up pretty fast because it's so warm it is very warm it's that horrible kind of weather where it'll be really muggy so it'll be raining but you do, wouldn't want to wear a coat do, no can you relate to that but yeah you're right if it does stop raining and obviously there, there's a lot of carts circulating around this track this track will dry so fast so i want anything can change in a space of five or ten minutes i reckon i once came back from uh from from somewhere i came into london i had to walk down a road in london to get from one train station to another boring whatever um but it was 31 32 degrees middle of summer uh and it had just rained that was not fun 
because uh, it's just, it's really sticky. It's really, yeah. So out there right now, glad it's virtual world, not real, because that would be pretty nasty out there. Important though, into the pit lane, Miato from the race lead pulled out a decent gap on Tausha. Tausha seemed to be closing it down, but has come into the pit lane potentially even as uh, potentially a, a few laps earlier than Tausha. How long does Tausha stay out? Because seems to be getting quite close to the end of that window. Seems it, doesn't it? And Miato, the first, the first runner down. We we saw Gamble pit, and that was out of sequence. So we expect him to leapfrog around the running order a little bit. But Miato, the first one. We expect Tausha to be out, maybe probably another lap. I'd say the Astons are pretty close to the end of their fuel window now. So expect to see most of the top ten come down pit lane sooner rather than later. I would suspect it'll be this lap, surely. Uh, we'll have to wait and see whether the Aston Martins come in. The further they go, the less of an advantage that the BMW G2 Esports car will have later in the race. Remember as well that this will effectively be their shortest stint of the race, considering they had to do the formation lap as well for good measure. So things might actually be looking an awful lot better in this wet weather for the Aston Martins. Of course, uh, the wetter it is, the less grip you have, the less grip you have, the less on throttle you are, the less on throttle you are, the less fuel you burn. So that's where you can really start to extend that fuel mileage and also you know potentially look after your tires as well as we're seeing from those Aston Martins. Uh, Sutherland for Grip Hacks Engineering World Cup got a couple of cars uh, on the grid this one being the Merc uh, running down the hill now in the pit lane quite a lot of drivers and teams in the pit lane at the moment as Conta Yanis to the inside running down the hill at Rivage and gets the position done forceful on camera and absolutely sent it down there just what he needed. That was late. That was latest of the late people on a late day. He didn't give camera a chance to respond. Just beat him to the entry of the corner. He's next to grip, oh. but now runs wide through Puon. Almost throws his good work away. Yeah, he needed that move, but again, out of shape. Is camera going to get back by here? Using that BMW power into Piff Path, as you rightfully call it. Doesn't look like camera's going to fight it too hard. He knows he hasn't got as much grip as Contianis and Aston Martin, so... Contianis made the move, a good move, a hard move, and then nearly threw it all away again, but managed to recover it just in time. How many times have we seen that in sim racing and, um, you know, less so in motorsport, but still it's happened in motorsport, where you've been stuck behind someone, you finally get by. What's the first thing you do? You go straight off. The reason is you're well. using that. I've done it so many times. It's <laughs> terrible. Because you're using them as a, even if you're not using them as a brake marker, still psychologically you're like, oh, he's staying going out and I'm going to use my brake. Like, it's just all those things. You're in a rhythm when you've got that car. There's the moment that there's nothing ahead of you, you're just like, what what do I do? Because you just you, you genuinely forget. And yeah, clearly there just overdid it. All of them coming into the Here pit lane, those Aston Martins, Ferrari of Thibaut Prost and Arthur Camera of the BMW fame uh, are staying out. Oh no, camera's no, in camera. as well. Wow. Ooh. That is a surprise. Pit stop Interesting. City. I I wonder, has camera just pitted us to get off those tires? He was struggling so much towards the end of the stint. Has he just called the stint to an end, going to put less fuel in for next one and just run the same stint times to the Aston to save tyres, I wonder. Potentially not 100% sure. Let's take a look at what happened an hour ago then as we run down the hill. This is at the race start, so we begin just before that run to Eau Rouge and it's pretty tricky in the mid-pack and some of the drivers did indeed find that. It wasn't too chaotic, but you can see with the spray as well, there goes Jack Keithley marching up the order. This is very much towards the back end of the field, as we can see everyone trying to find their way through two, three wide at various points, but everything seeming fairly clean. It was the laps after that, once people had got settled into the race, that things got very chaotic. You can see the spray thinner than it is in in real life thinner than than what you'd normally get which in this sense is is kind of good although part of that comes down to the fact that it's not ridiculously heavy rain visibility though is still at a premium and you're you're squinting to try and find your way through to all the brake markers and stuff and hoping that the car behind the car to your side that all of this lot that everyone's in the understanding of taking it very very carefully well judged over the first lap from pretty much everyone on the field to be honest we saw relatively few instances actually as we see things get a little bit hectic down the hill but um yes and on the first lap when you are stuck in the spray it's not like you can duck out and find some place where it isn't 
brain because there's cars everywhere and there'll probably be a car to your left, a car to your right, a car directly behind you. You can't move around to try and get some visibility. You have to stay where you are. So surviving the first lap is uh, mission number one. And uh, it seems like everyone managed to do that more or less. And then after that, when we say they'd more or less settled in, then the chaos started, which we predicted before the race. So not too many teams staying out uh, to, to extend the stint limit to its very, very end. Uh, not long to go until that stint limit closes. It's 50 seconds. So uh, for the drivers like uh, Thibaut Props, who comes into the pit lane now, they all do need to come into the pit lane. Uh, Giet Van, uh, Dominic Blyer as well, and Matushka all yet to pit, all putting that window as far along as possible, which a gamble that may well play off. This is another shot of that race start looking down the hill. You can see uh, DV1 Triton, who's currently on screen, Dominic Blyer in the middle of that, the black and blue Bentley uh, to the left of the triple seven Bentley as well. Issa behind the wheel of that one. And then you've got the two John Lacey Esports Academy cars either side. So, uh, 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 like I say, uh, all things considered, knowing how hard that run is, I'd say that is probably about as good as the first few corners could have got. Yeah, well behaved with the drivers off the start there, and then all surviving the first lap, which was nice to see, and then uh, and then things changed a little bit. But just before we went to this replay, I believe I saw the 191 Aston Martin of Kevin Saclari facing backwards on the exit of Puon. Now, he was, in the, he was right at the front of the grid, and he probably lost thick end of five six seconds so interesting to see if that loses him any time through the pit window yeah a few drivers that would have lost time for the pit window did get the call that esports performance racing team it was alban bouquet who was behind the wheel of that one uh, had an issue coming through uh blanchemont and then hit the wall and had to come back into pit lane once again there's saclari in the pit lane dropping down the order uh we've had a change uh, for the race lead, I believe, as we're looking at uh, Savalainen, uh, who's got Luca Burke behind and Beck as well ahead. Uh, as far as our call is, the 211 that lost the race lead, courtesy of that mistake through Blanchemont, uh, is back out uh, at, the, at the front of the field. Tauscher at the front once again, jumping the 164 in the pit lane. Yeah, well good strategy from those guys they'll be very happy with themselves interesting to note that it looks like the 191 is back in pit lane so did Siklari hit the wall by any chance and damage his car interesting to note that also uh, Matushka in the Audi the 25 Audi got getting a drive through penalty so uh, it, it's all it's all moves during the pit window I'm pretty sure as well at least from what I can see because we've not had anything come through about the 25 receiving a penalty as far as I can see unless I'm uh Oh, it's, it could be uh, for ignoring yellow flags. Um, we've got... Uh, there was... Uh, an, it could be for track limits, either way. It could be for track limits. It could potentially be for uh, ignoring yellow flags. Not 100% sure. Could be speeding in the pit lane, yeah. Well, lots. This will clarify things. Ignoring lots indeed yellow through. flags. Um, warnings to those cars. The 25 being one of them, actually, didn't even get a penalty for that. Warning for yellow flags. But, yeah, speeding the pit lane, game issue, track limits, could be. Yeah, we're looking at Savaline and currently on screen at the moment. So they've worked their way up the order courtesy of the other drivers coming into pit lane. Some drivers that are yet to serve a drive through and then other drivers that uh, are potentially under investigation still. And yet the... Speeding in the pit lane is actually a really, really interesting one to, to tackle because on that run into pit lane, it's very easy just to push the pit lane a little bit too late. It's a very narrow pit lane entry. And as you rise up, you, you, know, you might assume that gravity is going to take a bit more speed off of the car and then just, just mistime it, misjudge it. It's one of those things in motorsport. You always want to push it as late as you can because you can find tenths of a second. Yet, if you cook it too far, that's all on you and you're going to, and you're going to beat yourself up for it later on if that loses you significant time, which... Around a circuit like Spa, it will. 90 seconds for a drive through penalty. So, yeah, big, big shame for the drivers. Don't forget as well, our affiliates joining us for this round being Qualo and, of course, ExpressVPN. Carlo, uh, you can get 15% off of your order. Uh, head to simgr.id slash bc hyphen Callow 
and get yourself on uh, on them. It's really, really important. You know, it's a, a supplement, so great for this kind of uh, scenario, keeping you awake, caffeine, etc., and getting you into the rhythm mentally a part of the race, which in this scenario, we were speaking earlier about the focus. At this point in the race, focus is going to be fine. Later in the race, towards the night stint, people are going to be wanting themselves some uh, something to keep them awake. And it's going to be hard when you get to that point. We've, we've all done endurance racing at uh, any sort of level and the exhaustion that you feel later in the race when you cross over the night period, it can be... That's where you see the mistakes. Yeah, the 3, 4 a.m. period, as I like to call it, the graveyard stints. The times where everyone else is asleep, it's just you on track, on your own. So easy to lose concentration. At that time, you've been up for well over a day at that point, and oh, it's just so mentally challenging to do a race of this length and actually manage your energy sufficiently. So, Callo, probably definitely worth a look in if you're doing this kind of thing. Oh no, the number nine's caused a yellow flag. That's the Ren Welton protein. That's that Lamborghini that we saw had worked their way up the order. Samira Bramey, who had an issue at uh, Blanchemont, has had an issue once again. And that car is sorted. I'm pretty sure that Aston Martin as well that came through uh, as well. That one looked pretty done and dust as well. Look at how that steering is though. A great, oh, that's a, that is heartbreaking. I, I wonder if that was the, I wonder if that was the 129 Aston we saw with big damage as well. I wonder if that was anything to do with it. Similar to him on track position at the start of the lap. So hopefully not, there's not a big crash at the top of the hill, but um, big, big damage. And that can be some really, really race damaging stuff for the Ren Welton protein they were second place uh, at Spa last season to GTWR Academy um, so uh, for for them yeah really not the Spa they wanted did not have the qualifying they wanted down in 33rd and their march up looked good then they hit uh issues going through this corner here and went off into the barrier got back going again had clearly another issue of a much larger variety. Back ahead of Sovelainen and Sovelainen in that Mercedes trying to fight his way through, but no way past. A couple of lapped cars as well, darting into the pit lane, some of them. Uh, Luca Burke, the next car down the road, good five seconds back from this battle. So quite a few cars between them. Um, for, for Luca Burke, he wants to clear those ASAP and get into some clean air and try and charge down this pack. Yep, Sublina with a good exit from um, from turn one down the hill. Are we going to do this again, guys? Are we going to go too wide again in over, shall we? Here we go. Oh. Is anyone going to lift? Yep, looks like Sublina backs out of it. Smart thinking. Definitely not worth trying to put your race on the line this early on. But he's got a good exit over the AstroTurf. Careful not to lose the car. Side by side with the Audi of Beck going up the hill towards the, uh, the chicane. Is there going to be an attempt around the outside? We saw Yigor Ogorodnikov do a fantastic move here earlier. Is Sovlani going to get the move done before he even gets there? Yes, he does. The straight line speed of that Mercedes. Very, very impressive. It moves himself up into 15th place. I get the feeling that Beck wasn't really fighting that one in that scenario, considering the differential in braking power between the two, because Sovlani was so fast and so committed. Of course, he's on what would effectively be bear with me here the drier line certainly not a dry line but um uh, could be potentially better um running into Lake Comler. being told that our race leader is under investigation uh, at present which is for hitting a back marker the number 77 that one is to be a sure who's currently in 14th spot Certainly not something you want to be under investigation for at any time. Certainly not when you're leading a 24-hour race in the opening hour and a half. No, of course, the bat markers, and you say the bat markers, they're, the, they're probably quicker than I'll ever be on this game, but um, the bat markers, they're still running their own race, and they don't want to lose a lap, obviously. Um, so, ooh, I just wonder if that was a mix-up, a miscommunication as... We see the 191 Aston Martin on the exit of Puan losing oh. the back. That's a hard impact into the wall. Ouch. He's going to spend a lot of time in the pit lane repairing that one. Looks like he gets going again and probably makes his way back onto pit road, but that's going to be there for a long time. 
racing line motorsport there the 191 i believe it might have been saclari who was uh, still behind the wheel of that one that is a strong outfit uh for those of you that know that have paid attention not only to us here at the sim grid but also elsewhere in the uh assetto corsa competizione stratosphere you've got george booth be a part of that squad you've got niels van der kelt a part of that squad two extremely strong drivers um especially as well in wet conditions george booth is incredibly fast uh and marek schintz as well a part of that squad so a really high profile team there caught out uh in these tricky wet conditions and it's it's so easy to do back in the pit lane to repair the damage should be back out and should be all sorted but yeah not not great down the order being told 32nd place ouch yeah definitely definitely not what the team would have wanted uh at any minute of this race so yeah that's really gonna damage their chances and pretty much unfortunately rule them out of any serious results in this race which it's going to hurt, especially for um, the driver at the time, knowing it's a driver error, but you've got to keep your pecker up and just keep on driving as best as you can and just do the best for the rest of the race. All German squad on screen at the moment, WPS Racing Team uh, still on the back uh, of Savalainen. So as Savalainen's got through, not been able to gap the Audi too much uh, of Beck and uh, behind Luca Burke as well is closing in. It's come down 1.5 seconds. That's the white green. Uh, green yellow probably more of a yellow uh of the rocket sim sport car that is closing in quite quickly uh that mclaren did seem to go better towards the end of the uh end of the stint uh rather than you know some of the cars that were going better out of the gate so the mclaren seems to be looking after its tires quite nicely in these conditions and yeah it was was quite strong later on and potentially that's the the aim once again Yep, yes, definitely seems like they're, they're coming on a little bit stronger now. Luka Burke obviously climbed places as well in 17th, Maciakowski in 11th, and uh, and Schur in the 77 McLaren also in 14th. So interesting how the pit window has shaken things up, and there's been a few driver changes to note, uh, least of which Niels Nyuk's getting into the 62 G2 Esports BMW. So uh, we know how good he can be, so maybe he'll be fighting his way back through the field from P12. Yeah, another switch that I can see straight from the off. The 149, Eamon Murphy behind the wheel of the Yaz Heat Pirelli car taken over from Stetsenko who had a couple of issues in the early stages. It's kind of the issue with uh, with going for, a, an, uh, you know, you, you go for 75 minutes, uh, an hour and 15. Um, it's, it's a long stint solo. You know, if you do one stint, fair enough, but not too long, but two and a half hours. That, that can be quite long. If you're staying in to do multiple stints, it's not ideal. Getting word that the 2-1-1 has received a penalty, but it's been cleared again. We'll uh, hold fire on any of that until we understand fully what's going on. And Whoa, what was that Bentley doing? I have absolutely no idea. A replay of the Bentley just completely losing his car going through the King Cup. The Camel Australian is putting it left into the wall. I don't. I really don't understand that been told there's a bit of a puddle there and uh, aquaplaning uh, was was a very key factor there and yeah that did not seem good gamble though losing the rear end in the RSR car here that uh, I do not believe is for position was trying to get its way through lapped car uh, at the moment for uh, for that squad uh, certainly not the race they've wanted but I thought I was wondering if it was going to be the uh, the Ubik car behind of Bacon, but not close enough to take advantage from that very costly mistake. You only make a mistake like that, you lose your confidence. It takes a little bit of time to rebuild that in conditions such as these. And James Bacon behind would have seen all of that. And that is a really good motivator to press on, uh, to press on and catch up with that gambler, Aston Martin. The Elvis Gratton team apparently having uh, issues and uh that that's the lone honda the uh, elvis gratton team the 416 apparently having issues once again uh, also getting word so the 211 did receive a penalty and they were very quick to instantly appeal it so that is being appealed at present i don't know about you i don't want that hanging over my head i don't want to be thinking am i getting a drive through what am i getting is it going to be a time what is about to happen you just, i just I, i'd almost it'd be that scenario i'd almost not inform whoever's driving i'd just be like look just drive just get on with what you're doing we'll sort it 
Absolutely. If you don't agree with the decision, the first thing you do is you do not tell your driver who's driving your race winning car. You let him do his job the best he can and when you know something is set for certain, then you can instruct him what to do. So obviously that team believed that penalty was not justified or the investigation was not justified and appealing that straight away. So we'll find out soon enough if that's been upheld or taken off. Yeah, high drama for them. Uh, of course, the the likes of the, the team that's chasing them down that got by through uh, earlier in the race. Uh, of course, Miato behind the wheel of the GTWR squad. And they'll be almost hoping that they do get a penalty because it just makes their life an awful lot easier as that position would go their way in the easiest possible way. Speaking of switches of position, Cody Pride has lost out to Luca Lozio, who's currently on screen in that Jean Lacy Esports Academy Ferrari, up to 28th position, getting past the number one Porsche, Amir Hosseini behind the triple seven now in that Bentley. Uh, one driver who is very, very fast indeed. Will be trying to work his way up the order and certainly a driver I wouldn't want having closing in on me in the early stage of the race. Yellow flags out once again, although certainly not sure where. It's down towards campus and it is the number 14. That's the Unicorns of Love. What has happened to them? Yeah, it looks like a moment through the double right. I wonder if they just lost it on entry and got in the gravel on the outside, but looks like they've recovered and no significant visible damage on that car. So fingers crossed they can recover and push on with their race. Yeah, they'll have a, a fan base up in arms if anyone sent them off, I'm sure. But uh, either way, was down off the road uh, from third position uh, at campus. The car that's taken advantage of all of that being the number 41 of Yiga Ogorognikov, who has worked his way forward and made an important move earlier. Has done a couple of very, very nice overtakes. Now up to third position, a fantastic march from the Lada Sport Rosneft squad as, uh, yeah, up to third. Got the triple A car behind though, and so there's some potential pressure uh, arriving on his shoulders uh, in the form of Lacan. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, this, this has been a great drive for Mogorognikov. Absolutely, but if you've seen the gap from P3 to P2 and P1, it's huge. As we see Contianis all over the back of Niels Nayaks in the 62 G2 Esports BMW. The Aston Martins we know are good in the wet and Conte Yanis using his race experience so far to close right up on the back of that big BMW. Yeah, it's uh, not been the easiest car to pass, but if I'm Conte Yanis, I want to get by because at least in the hands of Arthur Camera, the tyre wear on that BMW Sim Racing G2 Esports car just wasn't good. It really didn't survive well late into the stint. Nils Nyox behind the wheel, uh, exceptionally fast uh, on a set of course composites. And to be fair, everywhere in Sim Racing. does have a bit of a temper though. And he'll be basically looking in his mirrors, which is not where he wants to be looking in this scenario. They're running 12th. They want to be looking forward. And this was the car uh, from memory that if anyone can think back to last time out when we were running at Bathurst there was a little bit of a controversial bit at the end of the race where the top 15 received weight penalties and there was a fight to see who was going to finish 15th and I don't mean that in the I'm desperate to finish 15th I mean that in the way that they were desperate not to finish 15th so much so that it slowed down in quite a an abrupt way to try and drop out of that so they came into this with no weight and the eyes focused on spa not working out so great for them as i would almost say that bmw looks weaker here than it did at bathurst yeah that's a weird one isn't it trying trying your best to not get a little bit of yeah uh of course obviously yeah you then don't have to carry the weight through but it's not a it's not a hugely significant uh extra bit of ballast to carry for finishing 15th so I'm, it's, it's an interesting game strategy, and at the moment it doesn't look to be paying off an hour and a half into the race, but um, we'll be interested to see if that does affect their form come later in the race. I'd say that it's kind of one of those things that's impossible. We don't, I don't know how well the BMW takes its weight. Maybe it takes it really well. Maybe it doesn't take it well at all. Uh, and so if they had weight here, it would have been even worse than it was. I mean, you want to get all the weight. You always want to get weight off of the car. You don't want it, but it was... It was a little bit embarrassing 
at the end of the race, all for 10 kilos of weight. Uh, and clearly, they're not going super duper strong here anyway. Elvis Gratton squad uh, currently in the pit lane there in that uh, Honda, so back into it. And uh, where they were arguably one of the most impressive squads back at Bathurst, Spa is not working out for them. I don't think there are too many teams that are doing well here that did well at Bathurst. It's completely open. Absolutely. We, the, the running order is so mixed up compared to at Bathurst last time out. So, as we can see, that, that Honda having a dreary, dreary, miserable race for that car. And uh, with this long to go, it's just going to be so hard to salvage anything from it as we hear that the 43 has had a rotation at no name. So, uh, just looking down the running order, that is uh, Zachary Hamlin in the number 43 Bentley has had a rotation. So, running in 39th place at the moment, but... Um, Hope by the sounds of it, looks like he's got going without any significant damage on the car. There is Zachary Hannon. Logitech G Alta C Sports was uh, qualified yesterday by Simone Maria Marceno, who uh, started way down the order, seen uh, quite a few issues for Hannon. And you can see on the left hand side of the tower, it seems to have a little bit of connection as well to, for, for good measure. But um, where they, uh, I, I'm pretty sure they had a livery added quite late last round. Um, normally, you'd see them in colours actually quite similar to, um, to be honest, quite similar to R8G. Uh, normally, which is like a, a, a blue, although for them it's a bit of a lighter blue, and then an orange, um, and then for them it's a, a white as an extra colour. But uh, a, a squad that does well elsewhere in sim racing and uh, all over the place uh, here with the assistance. At least I'm still pretty sure they've got it. A, a technical alliance with GTWR not working out clearly at Spa because they are, they are looking like they are struggling right now. Yeah, definitely not the race they would have wanted for. Also, um, drive through penalty to the Revolution Sim Racing car of Dominic Galtz uh, running down in four to second place. That's Aston Martin getting a drive through penalty for avoidable contact with the 129. So uh, their race going from bad to worse down in 40 second place. Yeah, the 129 being the Clash Sim Racing car. So picking up a few bits already being told as well. The Peak Performance car has been off at Radion. That'll be for the second time. I've seen it uh, running out uh, at this part of the, the racetrack a, a couple of times this race. And so adding to that, uh, still in the very, very early stages. Also, uh, one thing to note as to how the points work here as uh, you've got the Ubit car that wants to lap Zachary Hanlon and gets through before they hit Lake Om. Uh, the way the points work here is as much as it is double points for it being a 24 hour race, it doesn't, it's not all delivered at the end of the race. For those of you that watch Spa and stuff in real life, you'll know that points are delivered at three different points of the race. You've got the six hour mark where we um, deliver half the standard points. Um, so it's 80 points for a race win. So at the six hour mark, you get. Here we go then, back live at Spa. Tausch is still leading the way from the 2.11 uh, from Miato as things happen. We are back here at Spa. 
Yiga Rogorognikov in third position on that march up the grid. And yeah, his pace looked really good right now. Yes, yeah, interesting to see as now the rain is decreasing, some of the cars running the different setups are starting to get better or worse, respectively. Uh, obviously, Yiga Rogorognikov, oh, <laughs> Ogorognikov as a McLaren in back of shot puts it in the wall on the exit. Was that the number 720 by any chance? Magic I think Kongsky. it must have been. Would have been on the exit of Piff Puff. They are, if you look at the map though, on the right hand side of the screen, look to have got going not too badly. It has got a lot of damage, we are being told. It has got an awful lot of damage, so certainly not ideal for the leading McLaren and could be $40 gone. Thibaut Props drops a position to Knight, who seems to get his way up into Knight's spot to make it Aston Martins 1 through 9 here. That's pretty impressive. Ferrari, the lone one up there. We obviously saw BMWs. We've seen some McLarens trying to get a, a, among them. Conte Yanis will be desperate to get up there and try and make it all Aston Martins in the top 10. Could you imagine if we had Aston Martins 1 through 10? That would be something absolutely incredible. But obviously, props. Machikovsky still running in P11 with the damage, and then now he ups in 12th in that BMW, keeping the Aston Martins on their toes, more or less. But definitely, who's miles out in front? Igor Ogoronikov in third, 30 seconds off Miato, who alone is three seconds off of Tauscher in the lead. Unbelievable run by these two guys up front. It really is. They gapped everyone whilst they were all sort of battling out for that sort of fifth place, that big train that we saw. And then as the others, the likes um, uh, of the BMW, which was Arthur Cameron behind the wheel, as they started to drop off as the, the, the stint went on. Other drivers that had taken too much out of their tyres in the early stages all sort of came back together again, because when you start losing grip in these wet conditions, it goes from bad to worse very, very quickly. Uh, Ogorogonikov finally got to the head of that train, and he's not running away from the AAA eSports car of Lacombe as well, who's very much keeping in tow just two seconds back. Yeah, it looks like Lacombe's actually starting to reel him back in ever so slowly as the track dries. Obviously, Dietrich, Gamble, Bacon and Noble all pretty much in sight of each other, um, running down to 8th. And then there's a little bit of a gap down to 9th from the Triple Eight, But all the Aston Martins fairly close together and um, all pushing each other to the absolute limit as we still see guys making mistakes. Yeah, it's so, so difficult out there. We've seen quite a few mistakes and uh, more so back uh, over at Radion. Look at that. At the top of your list, Tauscher in the 211 car of Sidemax Motorworks JLO team. They have the drive through penalty back. The appeal seems to not be successful. And that would be down to uh, making contact with a back marker. As far as we were told, it was car 77. There you go on the screen. Instant between car 77 and car 211 on lap 28. Drive through penalty for car 211. The 77 being the MRL Sim Racing Team. And that's that's a huge, huge issue for them. After such a big lead, I know they've got a great lead. It's looking fantastic. They're obviously going to lose all of that and more. Yeah, that's absolutely huge amount of time to give away. And with a back mark, you have to ask yourself, was it necessary? Now, we haven't seen what actually happened, so we just have to kind of guess off of what we've been told. But um, drive through penalty is going to really damage their race, especially when they're that far out in front. Oh, that's Jordan Sherritt up and over the exit and dropping the position to Jack Keefley. Keefley working his way up the order. There's another position. Sherritt's car, I would assume, isn't damaged anymore because he would have got that fixed in the pit lane. Obviously, received a bit of um, a bit of damage in the early stages. But for them working their way up the order, Jordan Sherritt in that Audi. I know the Aston Martin's really, really strong, but started out really quick out of the gates and then seems to have dropped off a little bit as the race has gone on. Yeah, even though Jordan Sherritt down in 23rd place, as you say, the second Audi in the grace, uh, in, in the grid behind the car that's currently running 17th, Julian Beck in in the um, in the 28th Audi, which actually was, I believe, the car that uh, was involved with Tauscher in that instance. So interesting to see how the field spreads worked out with the different manufacturers so far. 
Must be a little bit kinder, of course, to GTW RRHG Academy, considering that that is the car that finished third uh, back at Bathurst. And so they are currently crawling around the circuit with an extra 35 kilos to boot. An exceptionally talented squad, uh, of course. I mean, say that. Last season, we had four races in the World Cup here at SimGrid. They won three of them. They were the dominant force of last season. They came into this season looking very, very strong at Bathurst, qualified on pole, were beaten in the end uh, by DV1 Triton. It was a, a couple of issues, and in fact, I don't really want to throw him too much under the bus. I'm pretty sure it was, uh, there was an incident in the early stages with Jordan Sherritt um, that, that kind of caused a lot of damage to that car, meant they had to pit off sequence, and basically just threw a lot of the race under the bus they recovered really, really well, setting some exceptional lap times to work their way up the order. And uh, yeah, that day, good enough for third. It does mean, though, that with the success ballast that we have here in the VCO World Cup, that they are very much on the back foot here at the 24 hour of Spa. Yes, yeah, definitely. Just trying to uh, lick their wounds from the weight they're carrying in this race and not doing as well as they'd have hoped to be doing in these wet conditions, which we'd have thought actually would have helped the cars carrying the weight. So if the track does dry, then that'll be interesting to see if their pace differs anyway. But um, Tauscher back out of the pits after that drive through falling down from P1 to P8, losing one minute through pit road. That's a huge time to lose. Yeah, I knew they were going to lose a fair amount of time, but... That's an enormous uh, gap to drop after doing some fantastic stuff. wonder if they've uh, taken a little bit too much out of their tyres, taken too much out of this. You know, they're pushing very, very hard. Here is our new race leader then, Andrea Miato for GTWR R8G Academy. No weight on this uh, Aston Martin. Did not have the best run of things uh, last time out back at Bathurst. And... Um, <sighs> They seem to not care about that one bit because they're running fantastic around here. Saw them in the early stage of the race. They, they closed up to the 211 and then got the move done into Lacom. They lost that position uh, through the pit stop sequence. Actually still don't know how the 211 got past in that pit lane. The, the pit stop was so much shorter and so much faster in the pit lane. And uh, yeah, they, uh, for, for them, GTWR back out front. Yeah, they won't care a jot that Bathurst didn't go to plan for them. Out in front now, huge gap behind to Yegor Ogorognikov. And uh, yeah, they're just living the good life at the moment. Out in front, la uh, catching up to the sole Honda in the field in front to lap. Uh, but yeah, Miata doing a fantastic job in the early parts of this race. Looking forward to stretch that gap even further to the cars behind. But it's so easy in this scenario to either push too hard or not push hard enough. You don't push hard enough, you lose tyre temperature and then things can spiral from there. You push too hard, you get too much heat in your tyres, spirals from there. And it's kind of, it, it, it can go very much uh, a downhill very, very quickly. And Ogroglikov, yeah, 30 seconds back, still 22 hours to go in this race. So there's still plenty of time for that gap to be closed down. And... Uh, yeah, Ogre Ognikov will be pushing hard. He'll see that gap. He'll know that's the race leader and will try and go for it. But then you've got to think as well, Tauscher, who's in eighth place, he's going to be angry right now. That team's going to be angry. They did not feel that that penalty was just, hence their appealing of it. They're going to be coming back strong, surely, knowing their pace, knowing that they built that gap over everyone else. They know that they've got a quick car here. Absolutely. Tauscher's going to be pushing as hard as he possibly can to try and gain those places to the car in front. Expect to see him fighting through for the rest part of the stint, and we're not too far away from the pit window, so Tausch has got a mountain to climb, but he's definitely sure he can be quick enough, so let's see how he goes. Yeah, did uh, hear, and this is actually a very good point. Maybe they did actually think that the penalty, like, that, you know, they have no qualm about the penalty and understanding that it was just, but also delaying the penalty, because if you go for the appeal, the, the penalty is then removed, and yeah, sure, it'll hit you at some point fair enough but tactically that you know if you if you take that penalty straight away based on how early it was it may have come out in you know four or five positions behind whereas where they took it they delayed it so they've already been able to pull out a gap on some of those other cars and so the risk is a bit lower not 100 percent sure in that scenario but either way that's that they've they delayed it anyway and so whether they feel it was just or not um, they've used their appeal and, 
you know, fair enough. It, it might come across as a bit of the boy who cried wolf, but a tactical usage of it may well work in their favour later on in the race. Well, Tao Chanel, as we can see, running in P8. If he was 10 seconds further back, and this maybe justifies if it was just, uh, just a bit of a time blocker, 10 seconds further back would have put him P11. So that, that extra 10 seconds has actually found him four places. So, yeah, maybe it wasn't uh, a terrible idea in the end. And uh, now he has a bit of clear air in front of him to catch up to the Athens in front. Eamon Murphy currently on screen for Yaz Heat Pirelli. The car's been dropping backwards uh, a fair amount. And they're now down in 20th position. Seems to be eyes forward. They've dropped six positions from the start of the race. Yetvan, who is directly ahead in that uh, Bentley, seems to have been struggling a little bit over the last few laps as well. And uh, potentially backwards even to the clutches behind the 149 of Eamon Murphy. Uh, Murphy's got plenty of experience when it comes to GTs, uh, not just here, but elsewhere in sim racing has uh, been a part of anything from the likes of the ADAC GT Masters Esports Championship to various other things uh, in these cars. has found his home quite a lot, not only in Yaz Heat, but just on Assetto Corsa Competizione anyway just seems to be struggling a little bit in these conditions but potentially some of that's down to just their position they're one of the, the, the teams as well that's gone through a driver swap uh, in the early stages to get Stutsenko out of the car and that can throw you off rhythm a little bit everyone else is sort of in rhythm with the car could could just be you know like that change might just drop them onto the, the back foot yeah absolutely mixing up your strategy early in the race could always be a bit of a yeah, a mix-up, but a bit of a, um, a rhythm drop, getting getting Statsenko out of the car as early as they did and putting another driver in, Eamon Murphy, of course, being as good as he is. Maybe that, um, yeah, could just offset the balance a little bit, but um, still running still running strong and with a pretty much undamaged car, so still a very long way to go, as I'm sure a lot of people will say for the rest of this race and a lot of places to be gained and lost. Henrik Gamble, uh, eyes very much focused on his mirrors, as he has been since the very beginning uh, of the 24 hours of Spa. And uh, the current driver to try and fight his way through will be uh, Jan Marcel Dietrich. Of course, uh, Unicorns of Love, a team that's very, very popular and a, a team which, to be honest, should be ahead considering their uh, their earlier issue they dropped it down the road i'm pretty sure it was at campus from memory uh and yeah dropped it down the road lost the position got back on wasn't too bad but either way now has to try and get by a driver who's very much becoming accustomed to defending around spa yep henry gamble has had uh well he may as well have been facing the other way the entire race he's been having to look behind that much uh mr defense as as the first two hours have shown he's been all about holding track position and he's done a very very good job of it to run in p4 at the moment still um keeping dietrich behind him the unicorns love aston martin but um yeah henry gamble has been uh well it, one of my drivers of the race so far kept it clean and been assertive when he needs to be gone forwards when he needed to very very impressive stuff I do love me a bit of rain. I think quite a lot of people do, although I would quite like to see it dry out and just see how it unfolds over the first bit of the race. This rain though, doesn't seem to be going anywhere at present. We are expecting, you know, potentially that it could dry out at some point throughout the race. Uh, the heavy rain that we've got here at Spa is very typical of the Ardennes region and uh, I, I'd, I'd, hope, I'd hope it's going to dry out. I'm sure some drivers do. I'm sure a lot of the Aston Martin teams though very much don't want it to dry out because they're they're super quick in this uh, in this wet weather. Yep, I think all the leaderboard does all the talking for them. Uh, their lap yeah. times are absolutely fantastic, and Miata last lap seven tenths quicker than Ogorodnikov in P2. So he definitely will want it to stay as wet for as long as possible. But you can see in the top right, it's getting slightly less heavy the rainfall over the course of the next half an hour. So interesting to see how the track evolution works. The track temperatures and air temperatures still very high so this track will dry fast focused on murphy yet van ahead potential position change if the slipstream on the mclaren can go anyway but look at how punchy that bentley is in a straight line there's no way that the yaz heat pirelli car can get through uh, and yeah the, the door just isn't 
I mean, it's not even Pride. There's, it's not even Pride open. It's not anything. It's not a, a jar. There's nothing. It is just not there. It is slammed shut, and Murphy cannot get through. Yep, I, I can hear the Bentley jokes in the chat already. As uh, Gietvan putting up a very doubt defence in in the wide. Uh, quote unquote, Boatley seems to be handling the wet weather not too badly, actually, as it turns out, so quite fitting that. But um, yeah, Eamon Murphy, try, try as he might, cannot find a way past the 194 Bentley. It's a circuit which, of course, in, uh, you know, normally we come here and we speak of the different ways that you can set up a car, you know, slightly higher down, force lower. Obviously, in GTs, is a bit less extreme. Um, but there is still a lot of that. Then you apply rain to it as well, and it's even more um, open and where you can go on on sort of setup and some drivers will approach it with a wet setup some drivers will approach it with a dry um, I mean to be honest sometimes in wet weather even setting up for a dry setup might actually be a little bit more comfortable to drive it's what you're used to either way clearly no matter what that Bentley is punchy in a straight line clearly running some form of lower downforce on it and is able to keep at bay speaking of potentially lower downforce and keeping at bay gamble currently on screen got the pink performance audi as well that is a lap down to uh, to pass as speaking of lap traffic getting in the way as well of this battle for 19th position uh, these lapped cars i don't think are actually battling they are separated by a lap themselves it's 40th place and uh, potentially 45th you've got the clash car as well uh, in that white and black uh, Aston Martin that I'm very partial to. They get through it with no major issues, but I'm sure a bit of a heart and mouth moment for Gietman. Well, look how much it held up Murphy. He's lost the best part of half a second just through that. I mean, uh, whereas Gietman was able to get past them both on the exit of the bus stop, Murphy had to wait until La Source. And now, maybe out of the toe, maybe a little bit of a rhythm knock, and uh, he's got to rebuild himself as he takes a little bit of track limit liberties over the top of Radion. But uh, yeah, the traffic really playing a big part as we see them go side by side behind. It's, I mean, people taking liberties at uh, uh, the, the top of Radion. Uh, we've seen that quite a few times. We did mention before that Race Control had brought that up to the drivers and told them that you need to get into gear and into shape a little bit more because it's, it was a little bit naughty from uh, from some of them, and they just needed to tidy themselves up. Nearly two hours completed the Thrustmaster, 24 hours of Spa as things stand. It is uh, Miato leading the race from Yigor Ogrognikov and Lecom on that podium. Our eyes would be focused potentially uh, as the race unfolds between the, the response of uh, the Sidemax Motorworks car, Michael Tauscher behind the wheel at the moment, of the Aston Martins and how they unfold. They've done very, very well in the wet weather conditions, but if it dries out, they may find themselves dropping backwards. And to be fair, the likes of um, the McLarens have seemed pretty decent towards the end of stints, and maybe in that sense, they'll be going on the attack, reproaching the second pit stop sequence. The idea would be that I think we're going to see drivers coming in in sort of the next five, ten minutes, and uh, for some of those that extended it all the way out to the 75th minute, obviously they can go out for another half an hour. So they've got this. This is it. it. It builds up very quickly with that advantage of pushing it to the very limit of the pit window. And it'll be interesting to see if, uh, well, to name one, uh, the G2 BMW is able to stretch that stint out any longer. We thought they'd be good on fuel, but pitted at the same time as the majority of the Aston Martins. We believe it was for tyre wear, but uh, we'll see this time if Niels Nax has been able to stretch out those tyres any longer. Nox was very good um, on, on not only fuel but tyres as well back at Bethlehem. So hopefully he'll be very much in control of it. But um, there he is. And oh, there we go. Look at that. That's, that's what we were expecting to see. Not a black BMW. They've had it reliveried mid-race. Um, there we have Nils Nyox though, behind the wheel of the BMW Sim e Racing G2 eSports car. And does look very good. It's good, doesn't it? Very good very striking red white and black livery obviously the uh, g2 esports team a huge esports court uh, organization and they're their esports team just as strong with a uh, camera and nyux and obviously gregor schill and all over the back of machikovsky in the 720 mclaren ahead 
They've got a, a good couple of partnerships as well of, uh, of G2 Esports, of course, as we're looking at Jordan Sherratt making a move on DV1 Triton, coming into Lacom, and he's going to be up and over the curb and through on the position, up past the race winner at Bathurst. So the podium, uh, two, two people that are on the podium battling out and switching positions. But yeah, G2 Esports, they've got partnerships with BMW, that's why it's... BMW uh, Sim Racing Esports is why they're, they're, that is an official partnership with BMW. Also, you might have seen the Red Bull logo on there. G2 Esports run, run Red Bull Racing Esports. Uh, Dennis Lind, who's behind the scenes of that, as one of the team managers, uh, along with the likes of Niels Nyox, that have sort of pushed that team forwards. And G2 are a, a, a name and a brand synonymous with esports in general, not just sim racing. They've joined sim racing a good couple of years ago I think um, with uh, obviously for those of you that might even remember back there it was Fernando Alonso G2 Esports and sort of a bit uh, a split from that and then built up with their own brand and now with Red Bull they're a team that really are taking sim racing in its stride and I think this is an important thing that we're seeing from esports in general that we're seeing the likes of um, Cova uh, and obviously G2 and plenty of other esports teams moving from you know, your CSGOs, your League of Legends, whatever, they're coming into sim racing and, and really attacking it. Yeah, well, I, I think it's been fantastic to see the rise of esports, and there's so much talent uh, in this field here that would put several, pretty much all of the real-world GT drivers that drive the real-world versions of the cars you're seeing here, they would wipe the floor with those guys. Uh, I, I know there's a small difference between the real world and this, but... The broad skill set is pretty much the same, and I can speak from personal experience that if you are quick on a sim, you will be quick in a real life car. So all of these guys, huge driving talent. Exactly, it could be, very much be the, uh, the the future of motorsport in a sense that you know you've got. Uh, you were saying it earlier in the broadcast that to get into motorsport, it's exceptionally expensive, and we all know that. It's, it's, it costs an arm and a leg and then some to, to get your way even near uh, a, a grid of this and then to get on it. Oh, wow, well, yeah, you don't, don't want to even talk about that. Whereas sim racing is sort of, it can be that potential step. Uh, elsewhere in sim racing, you've got the likes um, of, of anyone picking up like a, a Formula E drive. Freddie Rab Rasmussen from uh, Red Bull Racing is now doing a test for the E. You've got um, Gogo Baudi who races for Mirror Esports, which for those of you that don't know, that is Norbert Michelitz, uh, WTCR champions team, sim racing team. Uh, and through competitions and stuff, he's now racing in TCR Hungary, uh, is Gogo Baudi. So it is becoming that, that step a little bit that you can make that jump from sim racing to esports. Satellite racing is, uh, is, is a small outfit that uh, does that in the States, run by Matt Strand. Um, and that is a team that recently has started progressing some drivers that they have from sim racing full time into motorsport. So it is very much becoming the stepping stone. Absolutely. And uh, I think you're seeing an increasing amount of real world drivers getting involved in esports. And it's great to see. I mean, I can speak for one from the team that I'm currently in BS competition. Uh, Florian Hasper has spent a huge amount of time investing in that. and. We have some amazing factory BMW drivers in the team and Chen Bollock Bassi who came from esports and is now doing LMP3 duty out in Europe at LMS this weekend and it's, uh, it's brilliant to see the places you can now go without, without the original funding to start in motorsport in the first place. Yeah, we're being told as well that, um, that uh, on lap 49 the 211 um, had a run uh, on the one, two, three, and overtakes into Lacom. Obviously, the two eleven um, being the uh, Tauscher who's working his way back up the order. The question is, though, is that might have cut Raddy on to do it. And considering that race control have been on the drivers about cutting Raddy on, have been on the dr on that team about an incident as well. Race control might take a second look at that. Yeah, yeah, they might take quite a dim view of that, actually. Um, already given a warning to all the drivers about track limits, and the one thing you don't want to do when you're already in the stewards' bad books is to go and end up in the office again, and we'll see if that gets looked at. And if it does, don't be surprised if there's uh, a time penalty, or probably not worse, but a time penalty added on to pit stop, maybe. Um, 
Uh, by the way, uh, Machkovsky, who we saw go off the road uh, uh, quite a while ago back at campus, and um, I I'm pretty sure he got a fair amount of damage uh, on his car from that, is under pressure from Nils Nyox. I think might actually be all right in this sense, because as much as there might be a little bit of damage on the car, clearly is hanging on. Still 11th position. I was expecting to see him in the pit lane as we're focused on Kontiannis and Tabur Scher who's behind the wheel of the 77. 77's been on the radar of, of course, the 211 when they made contact. This is the 211. Speaking of which, and this will be the move on the 1, 2, 3. And we'll just see. Let's watch them go through Radion and see if there is a bit of an excursion up the climb at Eau Rouge. Oh, that's a pretty big one. That is a pretty big one. Interesting, interesting, interesting. It's just about how much time does he gain as a result of it. Obviously, he's in the toes, so he's going to gain anyway, so that probably looks a little bit worse than it is, but it's black and white when it's down to track limits, isn't it? I, yeah, I, I, it's kind of, it's really, really hard, because obviously you have to, to say, you know, do did the, did uh, Tauscher in that scenario gain the position purely from a track excursion, and that's sort of the, that's the big question and that's almost the grey area around it as how much do you lift cutting the top of Radion? Was there a lift at all? Was the slipstream enough for him to draw alongside anyway? I'm not sure race control will look at that particularly well either way as we're going to see it once again and also to be fair um, uh, Noble ahead in the 1-2-3 also did push the limit as well and if you're following that car wherever he goes you go a little bit further over so there is a little bit of that involved as well so we're gonna look from up above and see as we rise up the climb so it was a little bit too much curb from the side max and you can see they bro it broke the curb so it was, yeah it was the tiniest amount off track i think the first camera angle made it look worse than it probably was looking at the overhead view so uh yeah it's very very close and as you say, uh, Noble being wide on the top of the hill as well, I don't think there'll be uh, a huge amount done in actuality about that. Personally, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd, I'd be okay with that. I'd be a little bit miffed if I'm the 1-2-3, if I'm, if I'm Noble, but it is what it is. It's, like, it's, it's a small bit, it's not too bad, it's not too major, and everyone's still going. I'd, I'd be okay with it. I, you know, I, I would I would suggest it'll probably just be brushed off and fine. Um, oh, I thought he had a bit of a moment there, did Eamon Murphy. Just a uh, camera angle a little bit. I've seen a few moments from him. Watch how much that rear end of the Azhi Pirelli car is sliding. Watch him come through Pilon, because on the exit, almost every lap that I've seen him go through is constantly sliding it on exit. It seems okay this time by, but clearly having rear grip struggles in this McLaren. Yep, yeah, and uh, I, I know from the McLaren that it does like uh, to turn from the rear a little bit, being a mid-engined car, so interesting to see how the how the balance of that car changes, and that car has been in a few uh, touches in this race, so I don't think there'll be any major damage, but interesting to see the balance of the, of the McLaren, especially compared to the big Bentley in front, as we have Henry Gamble, early pitter in the first stint, down pit lane again for a second stop. Yeah, pit before even the hour mark. So uh, obviously has pushed it to the 71 minute mark for this. So, you know, passing the 70. Um, stint limits for this are, of course, uh, 75 minutes being the stint limit. So um, a, a, a fair amount of time for drivers to get out on circuit. But, you know, some, some drivers can take it. Some teams can take it to the 75 minute mark. Thing is around here, we saw it was the drivers that took it up there, they were really, really close to going over that 75. Like, it was a matter of seconds as there's the dive from the Irishman of Eamon Murphy, opens the door with a dive and a slide at the source, and he is through on Gietven, and Jack Keithley is there as well. Yep, good hard move. The contact came and Murphy was ahead, so I don't think I'll be looked at at all. Good move, he was close enough and he needed to make that move there, and uh, it didn't look like uh, Gietven fought it that hard, so... Uh, yeah, good move from Murphy. Now he can progress his march through the field. It needed to happen as well, because look at the gap. I mean, that, that's the gap to Gamble, so it's not quite as bad. It's just as the timing's moving everyone around, because it was 56 seconds to Gamble when he came into the pit lane. But there, either way, there you go. Now it's loaded. Uh, 12 seconds. And that gap was getting bigger. 
um, for the 149. You've got that gap getting bigger. You've got Jack Keithley closing behind. You've also got the 157 of Jordan Sherritt not very far behind, who we've seen is getting faster and faster. This this track sort of coming back towards that Audi as they've, they've cured the issues that plagued them in the early stages. Uh, yes, they've got a lot of weight, but that, that car of Jordan Sherritt, I'm, if I'm looking backwards and I'm picking apart cars that I'm eyeing up to potentially catch as Jordan Sherritt's one, Dominic Blyer's potentially one, Jack Keithley is definitely one and you want to get by so you can start gapping them before they catch you. Yeah, definitely. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Murphy's able to pull a gap from Gieffen and Allen start to catch up to back of Van Omen in front in the Aston Martin, which we know is oh so good in the wet, but Murphy and the Yassi McLaren, the Pirelli Yassi McLaren I should say, um, moving forward and it'll be interesting to see how his pace progresses from here compared to the likes of Maciakowski in 10th and Burke in 15th and the other McLarens. Rip Hacks currently hanging on to 14th position, but Luca Burke, who we're currently riding on board with, the Slovenian driving the Rocket Sim Sport car, has closed in in that McLaren to, uh, to the number 11 car. It looks like the iconic colours of Rocket Sim Sport might be potentially trying to get through. We'll go side by side as we've got Luca Burke on the right hand side as he attacks that Mercedes. Niels Nyox currently on the central part of the screen. Uh, Machkovsky, who's ahead, might have escaped any major damage after he went off at campus, but I don't think it's going to matter one bit because look at the speed of that BMW. I don't think that is being held back any longer, and the 62 should be up inside the top 10 as they hit the braking zone at Lecom. The McLaren's trying to hang on. There is no way for him to do so and has to settle for 11th. Niels Nyox great run great slipstream and great speed from that bmw how simple do you like your overtakes sir uh is is the feeling from that move now it's just getting right in the toe of machikovsky and he could do nothing in that mclaren which we've seen so far struggling a little bit of top end speed so now it's using the strengths of that bmw to very good effect Decent downforce, decent profile and balance uh, normally in a, in, in a McLaren in that sense. Obviously, you saying it drives a little bit more in with the rear, which some drivers like, some drivers hate. Um, for, for them in this sense, they, we, we can see it here. But the straight line speed of that McLaren, it just, whilst it's great through this mid part of the circuit, its straight line speed really does hinder it from making progress. Uh, based on the tyres and stuff that we've seen, the McLarens normally more get a little bit better as the stint progresses, so I'd more suspect the likes of Luca Berg will get stronger and potentially when other drivers pit, try and take advantage of that scenario, but then your tyres are already worn down, etc, etc, that things can become a little bit uh, more tricky. Cody Pride has made a position on Capera. Uh, that's the, the, the drivers on screen, so the Porsche getting ahead of the Audi, so they've switched positioned. Uh, that was around the outside at La Source and Cody Pride marching forward in the Porsche. Do love seeing a Porsche, uh, by the way. We don't see too many of them, but always lovely to see. And a good livery as well, I like that. Nice black and gold, good contrast. It's a very nice livery. I'm a big fan of that one. And it's a shame, I, I thought we'd see more Porsches in this. Um, we know they can be really quick and they, for what I've heard, they have a tendency to be a little bit hard on their tires, but um, Cody Pride doing a good job in the, in the number one Porsche. Obviously, number one Porsche out of the two in the race. Um, but, yeah, good move around the outside of Turn 1. Always nice to see. The thing is with Porsches and stuff is that some some drivers love the way they drive. You're speaking of cars that drive more in with the rear. Porsche being uh, rear edge. Although, technically, now it's, it, it is, as far as I've been told, it's technically mid-engined. Yeah, technically. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a Porsche. It's not. Um, uh, yeah, from, from that, like some drivers really like the balance of a Porsche, others really, really don't. And it really it matches driving styles of some and just really not of others. And so it's a real Marmite car. And if you can drive it well, if you can get it to match conditions, it can, it can work really, really nicely in the wet. But you just need the right drivers, the right setup, the right everything. And it's rare to have that, that it either clicks and it works and you're a second lap faster or it doesn't and you're struggling and that's kind of the the vein that we're seeing there uh battles of aston martins towards the front though yiga rogorognikov under pressure now it was two seconds the gap not too long ago it's come down 
to half a second. It was three tenths a little bit earlier on this lap as Lacombe is fighting forward. Yep, yeah, Lacombe making a good move. Clearly that car's working well in these conditions. Ogorodnikov, who looked oh so quick at the end of the first stint, now seems to be slipping back slightly into the into the clutches of, of uh, Lacombe behind. Lacombe actually has gaps Dietrich and James Bacon slightly, so that car working very well at the moment. Fastest lap of the race as well, fairly recently by one Tauscher who said he might be angry, said he might be marching his way forward. And Tauscher, I mean, they're a little bit annoyed and they are showing it and they are going very, very fast. Uh, although I will say, as much as it was the fastest lap of the race, it wasn't by very much as Jack Keithley looks to the inside of Gietvern. That's very, very tight into Fania. He's going to be on the outside of the second part. That'll be the path. And there is no way through for Keefley at the moment. The Clash uh, car as well, that Aston Martin behind is not for position. That is a lap or two down on this group. So uh, Gepfen just under pressure from Keefley. Yeah, that was a late move by Keefley on the inside of Fanny. I left it really late. I was amazed there wasn't a little bit of contact. And that Keefley even managed to stop, for instance. But um, no, all's, all's well and good, but uh, it... It's clear to see that Kievan hasn't got the pace of Keithley behind him, so Keithley trying needs to try and get this move done as he looks at the outside of the bus stop. A little bit of the curve of that move should be done if he can get the car stopped. Very nice. Not the first we've seen around the outside of first part of bus stop today, but good move by Keithley, showing that experience. Yeah, that was uh, that was nice work to to gather that position. Just saw popping up on screen uh, incident between car one and car 199 uh, and their penalty going the way of the car 199. That is the SG Stern car uh, in that 199. The number one, of course, being PPR Esports. Cody Pride behind the wheel of that. So, uh, yeah, 199 receiving uh, another issue. Got a drive-through penalty on lap one for avoidable contact and picking up another one as we've passed two hours and 20 minutes into the race. Pushing the track limits quite a lot through Blanchemont, uh, through Blanchemont, through Radion, uh, was, was Keefley and Getvin, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Race leader into the pits, we're being told. Andrea Miato, who was in the pits earlier than the likes of Tauscher and, and such earlier in the race, going shorter once again. Yes, interesting to see the different strategies on fuel and Tauschman absolutely flying, so they're going to leave him out as long as they possibly can. But uh, Miato in the pits, they pitted one lap earlier than Tauscher last time, so expect to see a fair few of them dive in this time around. Yeah, I, I, well, the thing is, you know, you, like the, the way it works, of course, you go a lap longer on the first stint. It's not much, but it's a lap. You go two laps longer on the second stint. Again, that's fine, whatever. Then three, then four, then you're over half a stint ahead, yada, yada, yada. And this builds up quite quickly over a 24-hour period. And what was just an ominous one lap longer gets very, very hectic later on. Noble coming into the pit lane. I know that Tausha was one that I was surprised with, went um, quite far, was, was a, a lap short of reaching the 75-minute mark. So I would suspect he's going to be going until about... Uh, 21 35 to go so potentially another couple of laps which may just considering they've got shorter pit stops anyway considering how they've, how they've done it to get shorter pit stops they seem to jump quite a few drivers in the pit lane so they'll try and get close to the likes of Baker before the pit stop and then jump them through the sequence yes of course also worth bearing in mind um, tyre sets we don't know if people change tyres great the point stop or anything obviously um I believe it's a limited supply of tyres. I don't know if that applies to wets, but uh, obviously you lose more time. But, uh, okay. Yes, if one being hold, uh, heard, told, it's a limited amount of slicks, so unlimited wets. But we don't know if people changed wets in that last stop. Obviously, it takes more time to change four tyres in the car than just putting fuel in. So maybe that's a contributing factor into the pit order. So interesting to see if uh, there's another mix-up this time round. Yeah, it's uh, a, an interesting one for them. Uh, you can theoretically double stint the wet tyres, and maybe some teams did, some teams didn't. I would be, I'd almost be surprised. We're, we're, we're told that it's because obviously they do fuel the tyre at the same time, that Tausha could have skipped tyres on that, that stop. Although I would say that unless your tyres are, are holding together really, really well, which clearly are, but when they're struggling for others so drastically, how are they looking after them so well over that period? I'm not sure that's the case, but 
it does kind of make sense. It does fit into the time window that Tausch has saved on that first stop. I don't know how that quite works, but either way, they're very quick now. We can only guess and observe, can't we, really? We yeah. don't know what their strategies are. Uh, any of the guys on this team, Lacom and Ogorodnikov, staying out. So they're going two laps longer than um, than the ex-leader Aston Martin did earlier. So, interesting to see if Miyato is able to recover those lost laps or if um, this is going to become something that could potentially spiral a little bit out of control. It, it can do. It can, like, it can go from, oh, I was leading the race to, oh, no, actually, no, I'm definitely not. Romagnoli, by the way, has got behind the wheel of that car. Uh, 12th place at present after pit stops and our focus on the race leaders. And um, there is uh, the Rocket Sim Sports car out of the pit lane. Uh, so we're deep in that sequence. And considering some drivers have been in the car for uh, a couple of hours now, you know, approaching the two and a half hour point, some of these drivers are ready to get out of the car and just hand it over to someone else. Other drivers, other teams had switched drivers on that first stop. You know, the likes of G2 Esports, Nils Nyox getting in behind the wheel and now getting up to speed, up to rhythm. Of course, we also saw that Eamon Murphy got in behind the Yaz Heat Pirelli car. So a couple of teams switching and this might be their time to take advantage whilst other drivers are getting up to speed in these tricky conditions. Yep, expect to see quite a few guys uh, getting out of their cars and uh, some fresh some fresh hands getting behind the wheel so um, these guys have been running now for the thick end of two and a half hours and I'm sure will not be sad about jumping out a little bit um, before the three hour mark I suppose but uh, it, it's, it's how the race works and it'll be interesting to see if the pace of these cars changes with the new drivers on board What do you think is like the the limit of like driver time before you start losing speed and concentration i honestly think it's down to uh personal driver i don't think it's a set figure so i've known some guys to run in le mans for four stints and be absolutely Ugh. fine I've, i know right uh, um i've also known others that especially more towards the uh the bronze and uh slower silver graded drivers that struggle to do two stints so it's all down to team and driver preference, really. I, I think, obviously, there's a little bit of adaptation time when a new pair of hands gets behind the wheel. As we see two McLarens dive in, uh, two Aston Martins dive into the pits, I believe that was our two race leader cars dump into the pits. So, 17 minutes that last stint was. So, stretching the fuel longer than we thought they could, which is a surprising turn of fuel economy for the Aston Martins. Yeah, I mean, some of them are pushing it towards that 70-minute mark, which is about what we saw in the last one. Some of them might be pushing it a little bit further because we did see them get up to about the 73-minute mark, which obviously in that first, in that 73-minute mark would include your, your formation. So if you're burning fuel, you, you have that fuel in the tank, basically, that you know that you burnt half a lap of fuel when going slow on the... Um, uh, formation up as well. We know that all of the Aston Martins are in the pit lane as Tausch is also in. Jack McIntyre who's currently running in 27th position. Rosenbaum behind the wheel at the moment. Uh, so there's a bit of a switch between these squads. Jack McIntyre who qualified the 22 is now under a lot of pressure as he's trying to get up to speed. Yep, as you can see in your bottom right uh, change of driver for the Ubik Esports car uh, now I believe that is, uh, oh no, the Unicorns Love now, uh, the Unicorns Love car, Jan Marcel Dietrich, just coming into the pit now. I expect he'll be jumping out and a new pair of hands coming in. It'll be interesting to see who. But um, yes, all the Astons in on the same lap. For me, by the way, uh, when it comes to that note on driver time, I've always said that I think it's a roundabout. For, for most people, at least as far as I know, uh, the sort of like your rate of productivity kind of drops off around about the three hour mark uh, once you get past that you start to lose concentration you start to lose focus you start to lose the ability to nail laps consistently in these wet conditions where you're concentrating so much might even be a little bit shorter than that and so in this scenario i know some teams that will constantly be changing drivers if you've got drivers that can get up to speed in a lap then constantly change them, keep them fresh, keep them out of the car, get the new one in, and just boom, 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 because you're always fresh, you're in the car, and you're effectively just doing short sprint racing in that point. And, you know, you think about a sprint race, an hour and 15 minutes, to not make a mistake an hour and 15 minutes, that's, that's 
I would say easy, but that's fine. Uh, not make a mistake over three hours and 45. That's a long time to not make a mistake. It's a lot more difficult than, uh, as you say, yeah. I, I think this is one of the biggest differences between the real world and the sim is that whenever I've, well, from personal experience, done wet stints, um, I, I tend to focus better, actually, because the wet keeps you on your toes more. It's less predictable. You have to use your reflexes more, and that keeps you more alert. In the sim, I think, uh, obviously, you don't get the physical forces acting on your body, apart from, obviously, your arms and your shoulders. So I think it's maybe harder to drive for long periods of time on a sim than it is for real life. Yeah, because you need that stuff to sort of keep you focused a lot and keep you a part of the uh, part of the car. And obviously with that, in the sim racing terms, especially here, as we're going to see potentially Rosenbaum make a move on Jack McIntyre all over the rear end. Concentration of the fresh drivers uh, well in effect for Rosenbaum. And I think that move might be completed. Jack McIntyre, you can see there, lifting out, save a little bit of fuel drop back into the slipstream and not fight anything too hard yeah if you're worried a little bit about concentration and stuff it'd be the perfect time to talk about uh, one of our affiliates then wouldn't it be uh, of course Callow uh, joining us for this round and uh, hopefully the rest of the season as well uh, a focus boosting food supplement without caffeine so you don't get your jitters you don't get your nervousness you don't get your anxiety but it does help you keep focused and keep a part of the race you can get 15% off of your order by heading to the website on screen uh, simgr.id slash bc hyphen callow and get yourself some of that and trust me it'll probably help when it comes to the late night portion of the race that graveyard shift you were talking about link is down in the description so you can get on that and yeah when it comes to that graveyard shift uh, always was the bit that i got when i did uh yes. sim racing it's same for me it's hard work it is so hard to keep focused yeah, I, I remember rolling around Dubai Autodrome, uh, Dubai 24 Hours 2020, in a BMW M4, pouring with rain. That race eventually got red flagged at around 1, 2 a.m. Uh, and that was absolutely horrible. It wasn't particularly fun, I'll be honest with you. No, no, pushing it maybe a little bit too far. And some people like wet weather, but that, I do remember that. And they're flying in the pit lane. Did it flood in the pit lane? Did you buy that year? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Train the so much sand gets blown onto that circuit and obviously you don't expect huge rainstorms so the drainage isn't that good either so turn one and turn two was basically underwater and the pit lane flooded as well i remember making a boat and making a little sailboat out of some paper and sending it down yeah that's uh i mean that sounds about right it looked pretty nasty out there uh things currently on screen at the moment bastian richter who's dropped backwards a little bit uh, through the pack as we're uh, approaching that pit stop requirements for some of the drivers. I'm pretty sure Thibaut Props, who's not been in the pit lane, needs to be in the pit lane right now. Looking at where he is, oh, he's, I think he's just going to get into the pit lane as that timer hits the 75-minute mark for him. So that's pretty tight. That is pretty... Fine. Cutting it very, very fine on driver time. That is as close as it gets. Well done. Good judgment. Yeah, that is brave. That is really, really brave. I don't know anyone was like, oh, well, we can go an extra lap uh, uh, on fuel. It'll be fine. And you, you're kind of like looking at it and you, know, you, you use 2.9 litres of fuel a lap or whatever. And you've got like 2.89. You're kind of like, ah, I could do it. I just need to feel it's, it's like that. It's like, well, I mean, it does take two minutes and 15 seconds to do a lap. And you've got that time left of your, t your, your stint time. So make sure it's a perfect lap. Yeah, exactly. And then that'll be the lap where you slightly overshoot. A yeah. Corner, and before you know it, you've got yourself a penalty. That's that's, that's that's brave stuff from these guys. Either way, some of these drivers yeah, so, uh, have lost a little bit of position. Dominic Blyer into the pit lane. Uh, of course, I th I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm going to take a, uh, a bit of a guess, so hold, hold fire a little bit, that the stint timer is the time that you're out of the pit lane. So when you're in pit lane, the stint timer stops, I believe. Uh, being told that is correct. Um, so th this is why they can go a little bit further. That's why it's slightly over an hour and a half being told that there is a crash on screen. Silver Racing Team Eurowash, the 101, has had an enormous crash. There it is. It's Kirill Sadorov. Ooh, big uh, crash it, top of the hill. That's looking a little bit worse for wear. 
And, and from what we're being told, as he can't even turn the car at this point, from what we're told, this is his first lap in the car. On his own, first lap out of the pits, that's an absolute gut-wrencher. I did an eight hours of... S no, it was a 24 hours of spa. Never mind, not eight hours. It was 24 hours of spa. This was 2015, so a good while ago, and we were doing it in an LMP1. Um, and it was torrential rain, and it was hard work. And that car, on the first lap, was really, really hard. And that's the same thing here. Tyres aren't up to temperature. You're not very, Especially if your pit stops like quite early in the pit lane, you've got a lot of time for it to cool down tyres, as you were saying earlier. Um, at the moment that you come out of pit lane, you're trying to get your tyres up to speed. You're trying to get your car. You, you're trying to get up to speed with conditions that maybe you're not super duper familiar with. And it's so easy for the car to stop. That's what happened to me. We came out of pit lane, got to Eau Rouge. We were using the Grand Prix pit lane. Got to Eau Rouge and the rear end went. And there's, you're, you're fresh in the car. Yeah. There's very little you can do about it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's one of those horrible feelings. Just yeah. uh, knowing that whether you could have helped it or not, it was you that's behind the wheel and the buck stops at the driver with that kind of situation, which is a really horrible place to be in as a sim racer and a real racer. So, uh, yeah, it's one of those unfortunate racing situations that happens to all of us at least once. And uh, shame to see that Audi in the wall so soon after its last stop. Yeah, it really is. Tarek Gamel, though, under an awful lot of pressure, uh, fresh behind the Williams Esports car. Tobias Pfeffer, uh, our pole sitter from the previous round, behind the wheel now of the GTWRG Academy car. Uh, the young man, I think he was 14, 15 years of age. Wow. Incredible speed, though. Absolutely phenomenal pace. Uh, and certainly a driver that is one to keep an eye on not just through this race but over the next few years gtwr and rhg will be desperate to keep their hands on him because if he's got this pace at that age when you add experience when you add uh, you know, extra race cars race cars seem perfectly fine at the moment by the way uh when you add that sort of experience though it just gets better and better and better and yeah uh potential future superstar on our hands yep very, very good point you make there, Lewis, about uh, the experience and the racecraft of Tobias Pfeffer. Obviously, very young, very quick, as you can see on screen, as he's pressuring Tarek Gamel in front of him. But has he got the maturity? And that is a question that's going to be answered in a 24-hour race. So, interesting to see how his progress is made as he's all over the back of that Williams Esports uh, Aston Martin in front. We're seeing a lot of new waves of uh, sim races, particularly, actually, I'm going to say particularly on a set of courses competency only, more so than most other sims. Um, and that could be due to it just being so open and easy to get on and, you know, get involved in racing straight away. Um, but the younger demo demographic is becoming more a part of sim racing more and more. I mean, yeah, you've got Tobias Pfeffer, you've got um, part of the Larder team, which is not part of the Larder team in this because I think he's racing in split two. Uh, but you've got the likes of Kirill Antonov, who um, is a 15-year-old uh, 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 from Russia, incredibly talented, very, very fast. MRL Sim Racing currently on screen then. Rosenbaum, who's currently on screen in that leading McLaren, apparently has had issues uh, coming up through Radion. Yet another driver to add to that list. This is getting into a very, very long list this moment in time. Don't be surprised yeah. if you have every single driver in the race on this list by the end of the race. So. Obviously, the rain keeps on coming down and the track conditions stay just as treacherous, but it's meant to ease slightly over the next half an hour. So then when we get to that kind of greasy condition where the wet start to go off, then if these guys are making mistakes now, they're going to have to really be careful when the track starts to dry. Uh, caught up with Neat behind the uh, before the broadcast, who's currently leading uh, this little gaggle of cars, Richter, uh, apply pressure in the unicorns of love, but also joining in on this battle, the 211 of Malinowski, who's uh, dropped down the order courtesy of that drive through penalty they got for uh, making contact with the 77. Uh, now that Malinowski's got behind the wheel, is closing up and is looking fairly pacey himself in the tricky wet conditions. Speaking of tricky wet conditions, Things at Spa could be about to get harder and harder. Focus your way to the top right-hand side of your screen where you've got our weather uh, that is coming in at the moment. We are in uh, heavy rain. It's heavy rain for the next 10 minutes. Half an hour, though, starting to lighten up a little bit. And the, the lighter it gets, the greasier 
the the track is the more almost the more inconsistent it is it's widely different from one side of the track to the other yep yeah, interesting and uh, interesting to note up the camel straight how all four of those drivers on screen three Aston Martins and the Lamborghini all on the right hand side of the track now I reckon Nice might have been defending for Richter behind but the other two were they just trying to get a toe or were they cooling tyres which might be a little bit early for that but you don't know what tyre temperatures they're running so interesting to know if they're starting a little bit of early tyre cooling yeah, you've got to be, in these kind of conditions, you've got to be up to date with your tyre pressures and making sure that you're bringing them down at rates to match the conditions. Uh, if you have, as far as I'm, I'm going to speak from an engineering perspective that I don't understand, so forgive me, it's just what I've been told, that in um, wet weather you kind of actually want a slightly, I guess, a slightly higher tyre pressure because you want to force the um, parts, the, 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 the blocks of the tyre out a little bit so they can clear more water. Um, uh, and and so matching that to the condition because obviously if you've got them too high your uh, uh, tires are going to be overheating and whatnot as the the track dries out and stuff yeah balancing that and making sure that you follow the the sequence as everything unfolds that takes a proper engineer keeping on track of everything as it unfolds because it's very very hard to do as a driver when you don't understand the full picture of the races Tobias Pfeffer oh makes contact with Tarek Gamil and Tarek Gamil goes round and Tobias Pfeffer has sent him spinning and I don't know about you uh, but I think that might be a penalty yeah I, I suspect there might be a penalty I was just talking five minutes ago about if he can show his maturity and I think uh, I just think got a little bit over eager there really so Maybe a replay might be worth to look at and analyse it, but it just looked like he got a little bit over eager on the back of Tarek Gamble's Aston Martin. Yeah, just potentially just a, a, a little bit. <sighs> the, the thing is, in that scenario, we only caught it from one angle. It might be a little bit more from um, a defensive uh, perspective as to how that one unfolded. Not 100% sure. Um, but. <sighs> Either way, I think race control will take a look at it. Whether they'll take a dim view or not, we'll have to wait and see. I, I don't know about you. I think it might, at least from the angle we got, I think it might have just been a little bit too much from Tobias Pfeffer. Yes, that's what I suspect. Yeah, which is which is a big shame. Uh, so, yeah, that, that is a shame to see. But um, they they both recovered and they're both damage free on the most part. So uh, hopefully be able to carry on with their race. Well, we're going to have an interview very quickly then before we uh, run away for just a moment. We've got currently on screen Sidemax Motorworks, uh, Malinovsky, who's currently on screen, a car that has been leading the way uh, after starting from pole position, hit a little bit of issues with a penalty that's been dished out. We've got Killian Ryan Meenan currently in the commentary booth for a bit of an interview. Talk us through how the opening couple of hours have gone for you. Uh, could have gone better, but could have gone worse as well. I mean, we've seen some people have some big oofs uh, through poo on and hit walls and whatnot. So at least we got to build up a gap in the first int before the, that penalty came through. That's not the end of the world. We uh, seem to have the pace to get back through. So, yeah, we're just hoping for a clean race from now to the end and see where we can get to. Well, we're just watching Malinovsky putting on a pretty tall, pretty dicey move on the Unicorns of Love car at the moment. Wasn't quite able to get through in that scenario. You're saying about good pace. What's your view on that incident then? Talk us through it. Uh, yeah, I mean, no matter which way you look at it, we're the car behind that's faster. We're also the lead car in the race. So it was, I think, always going to be a penalty. The, the idea behind... Uh, appealing it was never to just completely delete the penalty i always knew we were going to get one but we tried to get it reduced just under the circumstance car had just came out of the pit lane called tires uh, quite a significant gap or a pace difference but look, i kind of knew that nothing would happen but it was worth a go i think anybody in our situation would have done the same and yeah i don't i mean i don't think any it's easy for other people to be like, oh yeah, they're you know they're going to get a drive through. They're, this is going to happen. Silly because, or silly to try and appeal it. But anybody in our position would have done the exact same thing. And yeah, so we just tried to get it appealed. But yeah, there's no way. I think it, it was 100% our fault. And we uh, look, we take the penalty and we move on. 
yeah, that kind of leads me on to the next question of like, what's the atmosphere like in the team? You've taken the penalty, you've served it, you look like you've got great pace. Chin still up, you know, still focused on the road ahead? Uh, yeah, of course. There's still about 21 hours, over 21 hours to go. So it's, it's definitely not the end of the world. We basically lost the, the gap that we pulled in the first two hours to back to where we are now. But I mean, if we can make that gap up, this what happened to us can happen to anybody so with the conditions as well you know we're we're talking about wet conditions now potentially drying up uh how do you personally feel in drying conditions and that sort of middle ground mixed wise or how does the team feel as well I think we've lost Killian, Ryan, Mean, and never mind. Uh, hopefully, all well and good anyway. So we'll let him jump back to his team as darting through a bit of lap traffic there. The Unicorns love maybe getting a little bit aggressive uh, running through traffic there. What do you think about that? Unicorns have lost their love, maybe. They've been very hard through the bat markers, weren't they? Yeah, really did push it. This is uh, on board running up the hill. This is on the back of Tarek Gamel. So we're on board with Tobias Pfeffer. And let's take another look at this incident. I'm not sure if this was defending and swiping or if it was just pushing it a little bit too much on the R8 side of you. Let's take a look and see if we can understand how it was. He's slow on the apex. Mm. I'm... So... The, I, I think there's a little bit of contact that just taps that uh, the Williams Aston Martin, which then sort of straight lines it a little bit. And then that's what kind of makes it look like he's sweeping across the road because he can't turn right. I'd be, I'd be interested to see his inputs on that Aston Martin. I'm pretty sure he's turning right in that scenario. And I, I'm going to stand by what I thought. I think that's... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit more on the R8. Yeah. On Gamil's left rear that puts him offline. And then from that point, you've already written your storyline for that. And unfortunately, I'm... Yeah, I, I think I'm right to stand by from what I said. Though. I think I was Pfeffer getting a little bit over eager. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not 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 an ideal. Sorry, a bit of a shame, but it's one of those things that's easy to do in these kind of conditions. Because, like you say, any bit of car contact in these um, in these sort of greasy, slippery, wet weather conditions just makes things so 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 difficult. Uh, and we've seen it plenty of times throughout this race, and I'm sure we're going to see it plenty of times in the future as well. Two hours and 45 minutes complete in the 24 hours of Spa. This is on board with the Aston Martin, and you can just see there, it just, there's not really much, I don't think there's much he could do in that scenario, I don't think, but... Ah, a bit of a shame. We'll have to wait and see how things unfold through the rest of the race. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more action here at Spa. As sim racers, we always want full focus. One single mistake might cost us the race. We're always improving our skills, our tactics, our consistency, being better than the competition. However, we sometimes forget to upgrade ourselves. That's why we created Q-Focus, an all-natural focus booster without caffeine. The formula is specifically designed to keep us calm and razor sharp during a race. My name is Alex. I'm a sim racer and the co-founder of the performance nutrition brand Gallo. We want to empower sim racers to reach their full potential. Go to gallo.com slash simgrid to find out more.
the exciting Florian Hasper, the Chief Executive Officer of the VCO, the Virtual Competition Organisation. Florian, first off, massive congrats on the the whole situation recently with the uh, the esports boom and the VCO. But how are you? How are you doing? All good. Thank you, Jess, for having me. Uh, quite excited about it. Um, I mean, it's always nice to get the chance to talk a bit about what we are doing and how we are connected to uh, the world of esports racing, I would say. So, yeah, personally, I'm doing fine. I mean, it's it's hard times, I think, for, for everyone yeah. out there uh, because with all restrictions and I think it, it, it could be a lot easier if, <laughs> if uh, the pandemic wouldn't be there. But uh, still, I think we we have some some luxury topics I would say that we can 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 deal with and uh, yeah but personally to answer your question all good and uh, we keep fighting we do indeed mate we certainly do um, so obviously the VCO a fantastic first year within the uh, the esports boom and you know going from strength to strength all the time you know I see the logo on everything now you know it's been absolutely fantastic but if somebody doesn't know who VCO are um, how would you explain what VCO is and what they're about. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we are a bunch of very passionate, I would say, people, and we 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 have our roots in in real motor racing. And uh, um, yeah, if, I mean, I don't want to give you the 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 whole long story. I mean, there are various connections, <laughs> and we've been working with, with manufacturers like BMW for 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 many many years with a different company, Berzut Plus. And from 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 this point on, we. At some point, we were looking into sim racing because it was growing and it was getting interesting for for manufacturers and and, and brands. So um, yeah. this was the first step. The second step was to establish our own team with BS Plus. Yeah, it was BS Competition. So we were learning so quickly and we were getting more and more excited about sim racing in general. And uh, at some point, we we then had the opinion: okay, um, there's a there's an entity missing or an organization that is. I would say neutral, yeah. I mean, yeah, we have a BMW pass, but VCO is fully independent. Um, so, uh, so a neutral organization that tries to, yeah, um, uh, bring in some some basics that you need for communication and to help growing the whole business. And uh, so we had the idea for VCO and to grow our own channels and to to uh, generate and not really an, a news platform or something like this, but to mm. but to be an independent stakeholder, I would say, to support certain series and to and to create our, our own stories and our own projects. And uh, and to be honest, there was no master plan in the very beginning. So it's a it's a lot of yeah. step by step things and it's a it's a progress. Uh, and it's been working out very, very positive so far. And the main thing is it's such good fun in the end. And and I think <laughs> this is what is so essential and and um, yeah and I would say what what separates us from maybe other players that are now now getting now getting into it i mean it's not about yeah we we want to earn money at some point with it but yeah. i mean this is something where we are i think we are we are driven by the passion first of all and we we got mm -hmm. really addicted uh, uh, on, on sim racing and this is this is a bit of a problem because we are just keep keep doing things and doing new things and and we have to keep track with the with the with the level of i would say stuff and everything that we have but it's good fun and uh, so we really enjoyed yeah. the past month yeah, well, I mean, it, I completely agree. You know, the the fact that sim racing does come so close to real motorsport in a lot of ways. You know, the the level of the, just the simulations themselves. You know, they have come on so so strong in the last few years, and just being involved with it and keeping the fun aspect of it, essentially what it is is gaming. You know, but it you know it keeps that fun aspect of it. There's still a great level of competition within it as well, and you know to make something of it and uh, like you say in the business sense you know you still want to make money out of it you know at the at the end of the day who doesn't want more money but um you know it does help develop careers i mean myself as an example you know i started out as a sim racing commentator i'm now a real world motorsport commentator traveling around europe and you know it's my full-time business now i do this every day and it's it just shows the strength that sim racing has to be able to put you into the real world of motorsport as well and i mean you know you you came from the real world of motorsport into sim racing as well so you've had a bit of best of both worlds the other way around as well haven't you yeah absolutely and, uh, and uh, i think sim racing has the ability to produce i would say i don't know the english term for this but these dream stories you know you can you yeah, can yeah. just 
uh, oh, maybe esports in general that you are you you start as a kid and you just do it and keep doing it and you love it and then you you spend time and then you get into a team and you get more professional and I think that that sim racing is producing these stories everywhere simultaneously around the world yeah and and yeah. And, and if you look at the growth or well growth is is always uh, sort of an economic term I would say it's not it, yeah. it's not just growth money and all that it's like attention i think it's attention and, mm. and i think that all people are aware of what many many people are doing already and this is u unique about sim racing i would say that the community yeah. itself is so strong and established and self-confident or let's say self-confident maybe maybe it's the wrong word it's like they are um, i would say sim racers are happy with themselves to a, to, a, to a certain degree but on the other hand they or many of them maybe have this real world motorsport goal then they have a then they have a, i don't know an esports approach where they say okay we, we want to do uh, or we want to do esports or uh, and i think it's it's about helping the scene to get more attention and more attention because so many people spend so much effort or so much time and also so much money um, uh, if you if you get a decent sim setup and all that this this costs a lot and and I think uh, and the time that is needed to be competitive is just crazy and uh, and yeah. um, so I think it's the whole scene just deserves more attention and it doesn't have to do with with the pandemic and blah blah i think it's a yeah. it's a general back then to continued coverage here at the thrustmaster 24 hours of spa the second chapter in the SimGrid vco world cup great to hear from the man himself florian hasper who's running things behind the scenes of uh, vco and pushing things forward in sim racing plenty has happened of course even over the five minutes that we've been away because so much goes on in this race constantly this is the 720 mclaren too much curve before even hitting the top Eau rouge just bottomed out before the uh, the compression and then slid up bit of contact with the wall slow to get back going again and just not an ideal circumstance lewis mcclade in the booth alongside me for the next hour or so angus fender hello welcome back thank you lewis thank you for having me back here this has been a fantastic race so far i've enjoyed every minute of it and uh, still 21 hours to go yeah, it's tricky stuff out there. I mean, you couldn't ask for much harder conditions with the heavy rain that we've had. It's made things exceptionally difficult for some, and some have felt foul to it. Others have gone on strong, but with the conditions potentially uh, easing a little bit on the rain. I'm not going to say drying up because we don't know that yet, but the rain is supposed to ease. Could actually make things more difficult with the differential between the wet line and the drying line. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty tricky. It is, as it is, you can see all these guys cooling their wet tyres down the Camel Strait towards Le Camp. And um, interesting to note that obviously the air and track temp is still really high. So when the rain does ease, those tyres are going to get to melting point very, very quickly. Yeah, certainly not an ideal circumstance for some. Of course, by the way, when it comes to partners and stuff throughout this, you mentioned uh, VCO and, of course, Thrustmaster could do this as well without AK Informatica, without Coach Dave Academy, uh, without Calo as well. Currently on your screen, get 15% off your order. Uh, the link is in the description below. And, of course, ExpressVPN as well for this round and for the rest of the season. ExpressVPN.com slash the SimGrid. Get three months for free at the link below also in the description so plenty more partners to join us throughout the season which we absolutely love to guide us through the vco world cup and we've got a long calendar to go of course after this we head to donington park for a 12-hour race then to kyle army and then rounding out the season of 24 hours at the nurburgring so many storylines to still unfold at the moment here at spa in the wet conditions it has been all about the Aston Martins currently running first through ninth looking incredibly strong round here incredibly strong incredibly good on tires and incredibly stable which is just what you want in these kind of conditions and the track is as tricky as this having a, having a supportive rear end is the absolute dream scenario we've seen other cars the ones having the spins they've not been Aston Martins they've been other cars mid-engine cars that have been having the issues so the Aston Martins have definitely been the car of the race so far, absolutely storming clear out front. 
yeah, not only quick but predictable as well whilst doing it. And yeah, for, for some teams, it's not been ideal. Don't get me wrong, we've still seen a couple of issues from some of the Aston Martins. It normally involves uh, another car, though, in the, uh, in the assistance of that scenario. Our focus at the moment on the Greek driver of Jim Parisis for the Greek Suvlaki squad. Uh, a, a driver with plenty of experience in sim racing. I'm pretty sure, I'm sure he'll love me bringing it up, but. Uh, I think it might have half a million views, but there is a clip of him driving in the Formula Sim Racing World Championship from, I'm pretty sure it was 2014 uh, at Hockenheim. And there's an incident and all of his monitors fall over. Uh, so he's been a sim racing superstar, obviously, for at least the last sort of eight, nine, ten years. Uh, has been right at the front of various championships over that time. And uh, now trying to apply pressure to Eamon Murphy, who has been in sim racing a fair while himself. Although these two probably haven't met too many times on circuit. The Yaz Heat Pirelli car that is currently hanging on to 17th position under a lot of pressure from the speedy Aston Martin. You know what, I've never seen that clip. I'm going to have to go and find it though. It's I'm great. When I, when, when, I, when I step out of the comms box, I'm going to have to go and find it because I guarantee you it'll <laughs> make me chuckle something rotten. It's, uh, I mean, I've never, I've never had my monitors and stuff fall over on me in that way quite dramatically, but uh, yeah, not ideal. Just, uh, I guess it's just one of those things. Like I've always said this before, is like this is I actually think we're seeing less and less of in sim racing these days. Everyone's got you know their professional sim racing rig. They've got a proper dedicated bit. They've got wheel. They've, you know the wheels like not just it's not clamped to the desk. It's like drilled onto the desk. You've got monitors that are properly attached. Whereas you know back then, and it's the same thing now with some people is that. To, people are so desperate to get their fix of sim racing that they've got stuff propped up on books on old Xbox games or whatever just to try and get everything as close as possible to you know their, their right line of sight it's insane the lengths people go to yeah I, I don't know about you but my first my first um wheel that I ever had was for an Xbox 360 and oh, nice and it was made to just go on your lap so nice. Didn't need a rig. Had no force feedback. Didn't care. I was like 13 at the time, I think. Now I'm 20, so a few years have passed since then. But um, for me at the time, I felt like I felt like a, I felt like Ken Block. I felt like an absolute professional drifting around in my no force feedback wheel on my lap. Obviously, uh, things have advanced since then, and there's so much money in the sim racing industry, and there's it's, it's so easy to get carried away with what equipment you can get. There's this and that, and obviously Thrustmaster is sponsoring this, and they have a range of great equipment. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> the level it's advanced by is incredible. I mean, I've seen people racing around with their whatever DD and you know, you know direct drive this and great pedals, you know, load cells that, and they're being beaten by someone on a controller. What? Uh, and don't get me wrong, that is exceptionally rare. There is there is very few people who can drive to a moderately competitive standard uh, in sim racing on a controller. One of them is Greek. His name's Lazarus Filipakos, and is actually fantastic on a controller. Uh, better on a controller than he is on a wheel, uh, shockingly enough. But uh, you know, it's obviously what you get used to in that kind of scenario. And you know, when you race long enough on a controller, or whatever. But it's not necessarily just about like the equipment you race with it's about the talent and stuff you have and how much you're willing to learn um you can be pretty fast and i've got a t300 wouldn't say I'm pretty fast though i've got a t300 class master great wheel and i know people that race in the top levels of sim racing on wheels very very similar it's about your approach about how much you learn and you can uh bit of a plug here we go coach dave academy you can uh, get over there, get yourself some tips from you know, their, their coaching. Nick Foster, who is currently watching, has got us on TV apparently uh, in his house. I'm sure we'll be waking up his missus or whatever. I'm sure she'll, she'll love it, uh, hearing our voices. But yeah, you can get uh, a great coaching and great setups and stuff from Coach Dave Academy that really do push you forward uh, in sim racing. You can learn a lot and there's skills that aren't just for one race. They're for your entire sim racing career in a sense absolutely i mean once you learn a skill you retain that skill like riding a bike you do it once you can easily do it again if you learn how to drive a car fast around a racetrack you will always know what it was that made you fast around that racetrack and um yeah if if you need the the help getting there then uh coach dave academy is a fantastic way to get started from ferrari gt racer david Perrow is um yeah fantastic that kind of thing and he's been a real pioneer when it comes to this whole esports coaching
But yeah, uh, you love seeing it. Obviously, I think the, the three people that do coaching for Coach Dave Academy, you've got Nick Foster, you've got Emma Perel, you've also got uh, Jordan Pepper as well, uh, all kind of doing coaching and stuff for them. And then, you know, setups galore and everything that really, really helps. And I mean, it's, it's all the simple stuff as well. Like even that you don't gen and genuinely it sounds really stupid but the best bit of advice i've got as we're watching uh heart of our defending from uh arthur camera who's back behind the wheel of the g2 esports bmw best bit of advice that i ever got was someone watched me do a lap around austria of all places and they were like you just need to think about where you're getting on the throttle and like it's such a small bit of like i know that that sounds really really stupid but most people when they drive you just especially if you're going out there and attacking a track you're just driving naturally you're just doing whatever kind of feels all right you don't think about what you're doing whereas the moment that someone says actually think about when you can get on throttle and then you start to weigh it up and you think actually i probably could get on throttle a little bit earlier but with a little bit less throttle and carry it speed through. And all those little bits are what pushes you closer and closer. You know, that might be a tip that will gain you a tenth, but then a slightly different tip will gain you half a second. You know, those kind of things, they build up and they are applicable to all of the circuits that you go to. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one thing that I was teaching Jimmy Broadbent at the Brick Car Race was actually don't be afraid to roll for a little bit because I looked through his data trace. Right. And one thing that people don't take into account is that when you're not on the brake, you don't have to be on the throttle. So coaching can find you so much time, even through tiny little simple things that you think are insignificant. It's one thing I'm really terrible for. I don't like my one 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 of my feet have to be doing something. Like it's either on the brake or on the throttle. It's, it's hard to learn. Uh, also, you know, you've got um, blipping. You've got um, if you really want to get fancy, heel toe, uh, or even just holding both at the same time, which works in some cars. You know, you you kind of don't want to lift off the throttle entirely. If you're talking about an LMP1 or something, you kind of want a little bit of throttle to keep it all both. It's all this kind of stuff. You can get all that coached to you, courtesy of Ask for Nick Foster. It has to be him because it's funny. Um, and either way, uh, our focus backwards from Tarek Gamel. Uh, in the Williams eSports car as he was looking backwards and under a lot of pressure. Malinowski, currently on screen, has just moved up into fourth position, getting ahead of Eric Neat. Uh, Richter as well is very, very close in this. So this three-way fight for fourth place, they're a fair way back from the podium that's currently being held by AAA of Axel Petit. But uh, yeah, Malinowski finally through, and we know this car is super duper fast. Yeah, they are on the absolute comeback charge. 1.3 seconds quicker than Petit last time around, according to to the information in front of me. And this car has been so fast from the light from the from from the green light. And despite having a drive-through penalty due to a collision with the bat marker, they're still running in fourth place and charging onto the back of P3. I am almost like I, I mean. So I was really happy to kind of hear when obviously we had that interview with um, Killian Ryamine and jumped in, told us basically that, you know, they were just trying to reduce the penalty. They understand that they were at fault. They understand all this. They were just trying to reduce the penalty a little bit and trying to sort of explain their scenario in that. But then it's sort of like they've accepted that. They've already moved on from it. You know, they're already focused on the race at hand. They're not worried about like, oh, but what if? And what if this? And what if that? And it's not about the what ifs. It's about the where you are now. And they are focused. That might be a little bit too much over the exit of Blanchemont anyway. But this car, incredibly fast. Been on pole position, of course. And uh, my only concern to that squad would be Killian Ryan Meenan's connection dropping out mid-interview. Hopefully that doesn't... Uh, rear its head once again absolutely that's uh hopefully not a sign of things to come but that we know how quick that car can be and currently is the the biggest rival to that car is michael is michael uh, romagnoli out front who that car started by a uh, miato has been flying as well doing trading fastest laps through the race so in in an idealistic world those two would be wheel to wheel all race long Got the 416, the Elvis Grattan uh, Honda NSX once again. That's the yellow flag that uh, you can just see on your track map there as to where they are. There they are currently on screen. Another casualty going up through uh, up through Radion. So they've been off once again. It's just a bit of a shame for them. Uh, seen quite a few drivers come a cropper to that. Jack McIntyre qualified the car, was not happy with qualifying, did not qualify particularly well. Uh, around here a couple of days ago. I'm pretty sure it was down around the 30th spot. Uh, was 26th 
Uh, so marching forward up to 14th, now uh, trying to get by the Aston Martin that's currently being piloted by Arnold, getting the SG Stern car out of the way. That is going to lap down the 199. That's had a couple of penalties today. So for Rocket Simsport, working in one direction and one direction only, and that is forwards right now. They have gone forwards in this race, more importantly so far. Now as the leading McLaren, it wasn't that way earlier, but they are now. Jack McIntyre doing a very good job on the back of Sean Arnold going up towards Lecom. That McLaren's been pretty weak so far in a straight line, so don't expect them to be close enough for the end of the Camel straight, but through the corners, that mid-engined, low, mean, aggressive-looking McLaren definitely has the cornering capability to be faster than the Aston Martin. Yeah, Jack McIntyre's plenty fast enough himself, so should be trying to work his way up the order. Obviously, we're uh, very much aware in these wet conditions where it's starting to uh, dry up. I mean, again, kind of hard to say dry up, um, but uh, as things get slightly less wet, uh, as the track state has gone to damp now, tyre pressures at this point in the race are going to be absolutely critical uh, as, you know, you, you need to get things perfect in this scenario and they're just it's so easy to go one way too far one way too little and then you're you know it gets worse you're stuck on that for an hour and 15 minutes absolutely and um looking at my timing list malinovsky in the 211's fallen back to sixth on that lap so lost two places and I saw a yellow flag in the last chicane, so it looks like there's been a little bit of contact, but Malinovsky, the guy who's only been going forwards, might have ended up facing backwards. Yeah, it'd be double trouble as uh, the 720 gets a little bit of a slide for Carbon Sim Sport as they're under pressure from Rosenbaum behind uh, the Clash car again, lap down. Don't worry about them too much. I've had a lapped car trying to get through them. Uh, as well, but uh, and Tobias Pfeffer is ahead of this as he's working his way back up the order. But yeah, the 211 that we're being told could have been hit uh, potentially. I think it might be by the Unicorns of Love car, which certainly wouldn't go down well, go down like a, a, a bag of bricks uh, if that is the case. Because if we can take a look at it at some point, then maybe we'll see. But yeah, potentially, potentially a penalty. I'm not 100% not sure, but either way, contact was at this part of the circuit, so easy to do. Such a slow speed corner, such a high braking zone, and yeah, not, not great. Yeah, a very loaded up part of the track. Uh, probably the biggest braking zone on this track for that matter, and in these wet, slippery, greasy, tricky conditions, it must be so easy to lock a wheel or get in the ABS a little bit early than you want to, as, um, as Tobias Pfeffer gets a drive through in P18, and that is that for the incident with Tarek Gamble we were looking at just before the break? Yep, sounds like it is. So, Tobias Pfeffer, we thought it might have been coming, and unfortunately he's now going to have to drive through the pit lane, and that'll drop him further back down the field. Yeah, so not great. Had had worked way forward a little bit, but yeah. It, as I say, we were, we were kind of expecting that one. You know, we, we looked over it a few times, and it did seem the way that there was going to be a penalty dished out, a drive through. Uh, being the one going away of Tobias Pfeffer, but knowing their pace and the 35 kilos they've got, 35 kilos not good, their pace good, those two come together, still should work out and still plenty of time left to go, still just under 21 hours left on the clock as we're going to see what happened then to the 211. Keep your eye on the, uh, yeah, it is the number 14 of the Unicorns of Love. Just that, over that the corner. Havoc, didn't it really? Yeah, yeah, right in the middle. Yeah, so <laughs> the bat mark got, I was like a was like a deer in headlights, just stunned in the middle, and yeah, unfortunately the unicorn love card just slightly too late, and obviously nothing intentional, but it is what it is, and do not be surprised to see to see a penalty given. Although, yeah, Malinovsky now back in front of Richter, has he given that place back? Maybe just to maybe soften the blow. Yeah, I mean, in that scenario, how race control view it, because obviously that's a, that's a bit more of an execution of the um, gentleman's rule in that sense. If he gets a penalty, that might see it reduced slightly from a drive through to something else. Um, but I mean, I, I would I would reduce it if that was the case. You know, if they've if they've switched back, like yes, obviously Malinovsky has lost time anyway, so you still need a bit of a payment in that sense. Um, but if they've switched back around again, then. I guess kind of fair enough, although 
This is oh, this was before. This was before. So this is when they were racing a little bit harder. I was going to say, I thought that was if that was them trying to switch positions. That is not good. This is how the 211 got through on the Unicorns of Love car. Uh, pretty, pretty forceful. Pretty dicey. It's a very hard racing from Malinowski. Taking no prisoners. No. I, I'd still maintain if he, I, I'd give them like a, I don't know, 10, 15 second yeah, time penalty to add to the pit stop. I think that'd be fair. Yeah, I'd, I'd say 10. You, you can't excuse the fact that contact was made, but uh, kudos to Richter for giving the place back. And I think um, being aware of that and being able to find some empathy, I think, is probably the uh, yes. Um, and the drive through being worth 90 seconds. Oh, that's Richter. There we go. 15 penalty but that is definitely better than a drive-through though you've got to say i'd take i'd take that it's 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 a pretty like i say it's pretty hard bit of contact but they don't have to come in and save serve that 15 second straight away they've got until their next pit stop when they come in for their pit stop obviously you know you've seen this in motorsport quite a few times they come in the pit stops held for 15 seconds and then it gets on with it right so you know you have your penalty get on with it like you say, you, you want to avoid, at all costs, you want to avoid a drive-through round here because it's such a harsh penalty. Because if it was the standard pit lane, you know, just the Grand Prix bit, you'd be, f I mean, don't get me wrong, you would be fine. Uh, 15 seconds is still better than the drive-through, but it's less harsh. Around here, though, such a long pit lane and such a tricky pit lane exit, yeah, you, you don't want that at all. Definitely not, but... um. Still in sixth place and with eight second gap to the Aston Martin behind and 15 seconds further to Chris McDade in P8, that'll only lose them probably worst case scenario of one place, which is definitely better than falling down to the outside of the top ten. We are approaching that pit stop sequence once again as uh, we have completed the 77th lap of racing. Romagnoli is currently out front by nearly 40 seconds as Chris McDade very much cuts across uh, Raddy on there in quite an extreme way. Uh, the, the way it is, I think a, a lot of the cars that we've seen, especially some of the Aston Martins towards the front actually, that have done really, really well at times, uh, uh, the 41, the 92, etc. They all seem to be pushing it quite far in the pit stop sequence so I don't expect that they're going to stop for maybe close to sort of 20-25 minutes meanwhile some others like the 164 Romagnoli behind the wheel of that one we've seen that one pitting in slightly earlier more so towards like the 65-70 minute stint mark and maybe they'll be coming in closer to the the sort of half an hour in, in the hour to, to go mark right so a little bit earlier 15-20 minutes earlier than everyone else Yes, yeah, seems so, and uh, it's, it's a slippery slope that is pitting early every time because it can stack up over the course of the race. One car we thought that would go longer than everyone else was the 62 BMW in P10, and maybe the, uh, the 32 Ferrari in P11 they thought would go longer. And the Ferrari has gone very long on fuel, and, and that will definitely help them uh, later in the race. 74 minute stints, for example, that will definitely help them, but we thought that the 62 would be tying them for the longest stint times as we know that car's good on fuel but apparently not staying around the 72 minute mark in their last stint so trying to keep more even to the Aston Martins on paper which is an interesting strategy yeah a bit of an odd call a bit more lap traffic as well working its way in this outfit we can see that Malinowski is now ahead of uh, Eric Neat so he has made that move at some point uh, around the back end of the circuit so uh, for Side Max Motorworks Finally, they are back ahead, and uh, they got back ahead of the Unicorns of Love in an easy move, and now they've got by uh, Neat as well. They've lost a little bit of time to uh, Axel Petit, but to be honest, clearly the hit that they got from the Unicorns of Love wasn't too bad, because they haven't lost too much time. I think it was five seconds, so it's already come down anyway. Exactly. We know Malinowski's been quick, and he remains to be quick, so clearly the damage hasn't been too substantial in that car, and nothing that a pit stop and maybe a few seconds lost fixing some aero damage won't fix yeah that's that's kind of i mean to be fair even then I, I, again if they've not been hit that hard then maybe they don't have to, to damage repair that much and it should be fine and uh easy to go from from that point on their car seems to be driving fine seems to be driving straight and seems to be driving more importantly fast and 
So I think they may well just hang on. We've got uh, Sammy Ratz currently on screen as Nick Hoban is directly behind. Shintz, the next car down the road as well, all fairly close on the racetrack. Three different cars, one Aston Martin, one Bentley and one Audi behind. The Audi, I think in the same sense as the, you know, like the McLarens and stuff, would struggle to pass this Bentley. But if he's battling with someone else, it might make things a little bit easier. And, and you can always capitalise on a little bit of confusion in traffic, maybe, and a little bit of uh, battling in front of you. So uh, it's interesting to see who has their brains switched on the most out of these guys and see who can uh, fight their way through the best. But important point I want to make quickly. You saw Tobias Feff from the Tarek Gamble collision. Tarek Gamble is now P20 and currently on the lead lap. Tobias Pfeffer is in P27 and is no longer on the lead lap, having taken his drive through from around 18th place. So that shows how much time he lost just by being a little bit too eager on an overtake. You can, you cannot afford to make costly mistakes like that. 21 hours, uh, sorry, three hours into a 24 hour race. And that, and now being off the lead lap, it's going to take an absolute miracle to come back from there. Yeah, for Pfeffer, I mean, for that squad, to see that squad's going a lap down this early in the race, I don't, I, I, I suspect they can mostly come back from that, right? But it's through, it's through their own doing, it's through them, you know, they've shot themselves in the foot quite a lot here. And, you know, they're, they're going to try and bounce back in some way, but they've got incredible speed, just not really using it around here. And with it being, you know, twice the points of a 12-hour race here you know we've got 80 points for the overall victory and then uh, uh twice throughout the race at various segments at the six and 12 hour points uh half points are added out so 40 and 40 so there's a, a total of 160 points up for grabs from this and for anyone who's watched um uh even like the best of british championship where we had uh points at the halfway point in the race they made such a big difference taking advantage of these races because they're worth it's double the length it's worth double the points than uh, a 12 hour race and so in that sense they really need to take advantage of them when you're having mistakes when you're having issues in a round like this you've got to come back from them otherwise you might as well kiss this championship goodbye and they are the returning series champions yep it's a race with layers it's not just about being there right at the end of the race you've got to be there the whole way through and uh you you, you see currently out in front romagnoli and aston martin he's been at the front well, that car's been at the front since the lights went out. So he, if he can keep up this form, and that team can keep up this form, can be can leave this meeting with a seriously big points haul in the championship, which can swing their championship position a huge amount. Currently on screen, I know there'll be a team that also is uh, very, very popular uh, in chat, did see the Dawkins community getting very much uh, up in, I wouldn't say up in arms, but they were just, you know, constantly posting about the Dawkins community because, you yeah, know, they love it. Fair enough. Uh, this car uh, is the Dawkins community car. Uh, up six places, Jack McIntyre, uh, 16 places, sorry, uh, is the Dawkins community. Jack McIntyre, who's directly behind, is closing in very, very quickly. He is right there to pounce on anything, but passing an Aston Martin, I think he might have to wait a little bit later in the stint because that's when the McLaren seems to get a little bit better. I think he might be right as we see Malinowski having a look at Petit into the final chicane, the bus stop. Petit is in a little bit deep. Malinowski is maybe going to try and come underneath. The only driver in the 225s, not even the leader, can get close to 25s. Uh, expect this move to be pretty straightforward for Malinowski as he goes to the outside for last source. Petit is going to fight it, but getting the oh. car straighter earlier there we go just easily just easily out traction to Petit on the exit of the corner and up back into third place this is a fantastic race from Malinowski it really is he is marching forward and I think from that angle where we were quite close to the ground on the exit of La Source you can see the track is getting uh, a, a little bit less wet than it was earlier that run around the outside though we've seen that move work a couple of times of course Yigor Ogoroknikov was uh, a driver who worked his way around the outside earlier in the race at La Source and uh, made that one stick or oh, I think AAA might have gone off the road there no nope, he's all right but was trying to go around the outside of Malinowski and uh, Axel Petit just getting it back on road but now he's got uh, Eric Neat to focus on directly in his rearview mirror and of course the unicorns of love behind that as well. 
Yeah, man obviously taking no prisoners. He's looking at that, at that first position. Romagnoli up the road at the moment, but not lapping anywhere near the same kind of speed that Malinovsky's got at the moment. So this is a man on a mission. One second lap faster than everyone else in the field at the moment. Yeah, looking incredibly strong. No real surprise in a sense, considering we know how fast this car is. Obviously, uh, did a fantastic job on qualifying day a couple of days ago to snatch that pole position. It was a fantastic lap as well. And uh, they led earlier. They lost the race lead um, to the 164 quite early, but then regained it through the pit stop sequence and once again look to be much, much faster. So after that drive through penalty, courtesy of hitting the 77, um, which was very costly, I'm still, I, I would most certainly not be ruling them out in any way, shape or form because their pace is incredible right now. Absolutely not. And uh, in these wet conditions, that car is absolutely flying. But the track is drying and that car seems to be keeping its speed Ooh. very much up. So when the track dries, will it be able to hold that level of intensity? Or will it start to go off where the cars may be on drier setups start to come back through again as Sean Arnold in the Dalkin community car gets a drive-through penalty for avoiding contact. Yep, up 16, now going to drop quite a few. I'm sure people will not be particularly happy in the chat about that, but uh, it is what it is. Another Aston dropping down the order, courtesy of issues uh, with uh, the Carbon Simsport car that's currently on screen. Uh, did get very much bought by the Clash car that just rejoined the circuit uh, at Le Com and uh, continuing to do so. Blue flags are being waved, the SG Stern car as well as part of that, and the 995 comes into pit lane. Yep, the 720 is going to be absolutely hopping mad behind these two bat markers. He's faster than them and has nearly been taken out once by a bat marker, which is a scary moment, I can say, from real world experience. He needs to get past these guys and the bat markers need to realise that this isn't their battle. Well, it's getting drier and drier, it seems. We'll head to our analyst, Mr. James Parker, to rejoin us with the conditions potentially drying up things are getting a little bit interesting for how drivers and teams are going to be setting things up this is swinging isn't it boys this is really interesting now so yeah the the guys that ran longer now have got much more flexibility with their strategy so those that have run 74 minutes 73 minute stints from the start are now going to have maybe 10 minutes extra after three hours or uh, three and a half hours um time to play with the track conditions and Obviously, the track is quite hot at the moment. The 995 has literally just pitted on their, you know, their schedule, their normal stop. But because they were out of sequence from the start, they've had to commit now to probably wet tyres because you don't want really to be running slicks yet. It's too, too early. So they've, they've got to try and make these wets last now a whole stint um, without losing any kind of pace. Um, whereas those ahead that have now um, that have gone long for each of their stints can now sit there and wait patiently for um, the, the the track to get drier and drier and then hopefully um, time it with a, a, a switch to slicks. Um, so we'll see, the track state is now damp and it is going to, to light rain in the next half an hour. So the, mo the longer you can now stretch this stint out, the much better position you're going to be in um, when it comes down to Tulsi, the, the change to, to, to slicks. And it will be fast because the track at 29 degrees, as soon as that precipitation stops, uh, that dry line is just going to immediately form. We did just see the SG Stern car just off at Malmody as well. Uh, obviously, they're a, a few laps down, so uh, not too much of a worry for the lead group. When it comes to that weather, you're saying that you know once it once that rain stops, it will probably dry up quite quickly. We've seen the rain ease down quite a lot. Like it's it's been you know big half hour periods of it just slightly getting lighter and lighter it's kind of seems the way that it's going at the moment is, is there a risk that it, it you know it, it may be a smoother transition into slick tires rather than it being quite an aggressive chop and so some drivers and teams might take a bit more of an advantage of that slick tire switch it's completely down to when what the forecast does so if it stays light rain for a little while that transition is going to be really slow but if it suddenly goes from light rain and then in 15 minutes uh, dry as soon as that rain stops 
uh, it's going to be pretty immediate. So the longer this drizzle uh, that's about to do to, to come in around half an hour's time carries on, that, that transition will be much more progressive and those that pitted earlier have a slightly longer window to hopefully then switch to slicks with everyone else. So that when as soon as that icon goes from 30 to 10 and we see what the next half an hour has um, has to bring, that's when it's going to um, to shake things up. But what I'm seeing here now is the cars that are running slightly more downforce or ones that are slightly more wet biased are really working in these kind of slimy conditions when the track's kind of not favoring the wet tires now that it's starting to dry out. So that 211, I noticed earlier, was five, six kilometers an hour, sometimes slower on the straights. They're quite clearly running high downforce. And what this allows them to do is when, when the wet tires start to overheat or the pressures go up, because also the pressures will be going up now that the, um, the track's getting drier, uh, they won't be sliding as much. And obviously this car has had phenomenal pace in the last 15, 20 minutes. And it's taken three uh, Aston Martins in the last 15, 20 minutes, uh, even after getting spun. So um, yeah, I expect them to carry on going They'll probably start to suffer when it dries out completely if they're running more wing, but at the moment they are in a really good position. And if it does eventually dry out, what kind of cars are we looking for? A manufacturer, not just a team, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you for a direct <laughs> pick. But, it's, a uh, earlier, it's a bit earlier. This. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Better as it dries out. I mean, the Astons are still going to have a little bit of an advantage because it is, it is the car to be in rounds here. I mean, it, it, even in the dry, we saw that from from um, Super Bowl and the quality session, didn't we? Um, how much they dominated. So, but their fuel mileage will be worse. So if we see now a period of prolonged dry weather, say 10 hours uh, before the rain comes again in the next cycle, um, then they will have to, to uh, make sure they make no mistakes. Obviously just seeing the 38 get a drive through penalty, which has cost them an, a minute in time. Uh, the Dow Kinker asked, that's clear penning peel. Okay, so um, Aston's, yeah, the um, the longer it stays dry, it will be rather than a large advantage, it will be a very small advantage. So, um, well, and that's just purely fuel mileage. They'll still have a pace advantage, but the, the fuel mileage will be much closer and they'll be much worse off compared to what it is right now. Well, thanks. Well, I'm sure we'll be catching up with you a little bit as the broadcast unfolds, because there's going to be plenty to talk about, especially when it starts drying up. James Parker from Coach Dave Academy you can go and grab yourself uh, the leading, uh, leading sort of the field of setups and resources to push your sim racing forward, and plenty to talk about and guide your way through your sim racing career. Focusing on the action that we've got, Shins versus Tarek Gamel switching positions and trying is Gamble to get through just caught and we're going to look at it again this is uh, looking at the Dolking community car what's your view on this Angus because I'm a little bit more I'm not so sure I I don't think it's worth a drive through but um, I think it's the Dolking's community car being over the curb now I don't see how that's the 28 Audi's fault in my opinion uh, I think clearing that altogether is actually quite lucky for Sean Arnold, and I'm probably going to get a little bit of abuse for this. Uh, okay, so from what I've heard, it's only been cleared because it's under appeal, so that might that might come back or it might be reduced. Uh, I think a drive-through maybe is a bit too much, but 15 seconds. I think if um, if the Unicorns Love Car got 15 seconds, I think that also should be another 15-second penalty, in my opinion. Yeah, I kind of I'd, I'd kind of head that way. It's a little bit of a tricky one, just got on the curb, bottomed out, went in a straight line and then made contact. It was very light. There was kind of trying to be room. I, a drive through is harsh. If I got a drive through for it, though, I'd kind of be like, oh, OK, fair enough. Considering some of the other stuff that we've seen drive throughs for, I, to be honest, looking at that and you know, having seen some of the other stuff, I reckon it will probably stay a drive through. I actually don't think it will change from a drive through, but potentially worth an appeal, not necessarily to save you a penalty, but as we've seen um, from the Unicorns of Love, like you said, having that penalty reduced, if it gets reduced to 15 seconds, that's an enormous um, save from the penalty. You're, you're talking 60 seconds um, saved in the pit lane because you're not coming down, but then you're, you're adding it to your pit stop. And so, yeah, I, I totally get the, the attempt of appeal there. I absolutely do understand. 
absolutely. And uh, I, I think it's worth trying to save yourself having to drive through at all costs, being how costly it is around this track. But personally, I think the stewards are doing a, I think the stewards are doing a good job with judicialing this race, being setting it nice and firm and no room Ooh. for messing the stewards around. I think it's worth being the stricter side of, of judicialing just to try and keep things in check. Wow, we are hearing some pretty big news right now as the conditions are getting a little bit better but still continuing to be what, in my opinion, is fairly obviously iffy. Uh, Romagnoli, currently on our screen, was the race leader, has come into the pit lane. We were worried that they they are in fact still on slicks they are on slicks so they've gone from the wet tire to the slick tire that is too early surely it's too early very very interesting and what a gamble seeing as they're leading the race well they were leading the race what a huge gamble from the lead they were they were 48 seconds out in front i could I, that I be can't not them? believe that they've done that when when they could lose a huge amount of time, not only is the car going to be probably slower, as he nearly loses the car there, it's going to be more dangerous, harder to keep it on the road. The bat markers are going to, go, are going to be coming past him. I cannot believe they've made this call. This is such a big risk this stage in the race. Yeah, when you're leading it, it's a safe call. Just stay, stay. You know the devil. You know, you know that the wet tires are fine, uh, pace-wise, and considering the weather, like. Uh, I, did, I get it, the sticks might be a little bit better at some point in, you know, 10, 15 laps, whatever time. But right now, you know, it's, it's always the advice that's given to people in motorsport. And, you know, this is true in sim racing as well, is you have the tyres of the track that you're currently racing on. You know, always be on the right tyres, right? And that even if you are pitting in an extra time, whatever, just stay on those right tires and in this scenario it looks very much like it is a wet tire position that said they do seem to be if they sector, get up the temperature they seem to be fine yeah romagnoli's last sector was on par with the cars on wets so very interesting of course the track temperature is very warm and i've had it before where rain is falling and just immediately evaporating when it hits the ground he's not cooling tires so yeah that car on slicks is either going to be an absolute nightmare or an absolute masterstroke, and I'm absolutely thrilled to see which one it is. Well, keep your eye on the Ferrari behind, because Hartevelt, who's pretty fast himself, um, is fairly close, right? Now, it's about the pace differential between the two, because Hartevelt's not been in the pit lane yet, so he's obviously going to light a car, more worn, wet tyres, uh, yada, yada, yada. But that gap is actually going out. Now, considering he's on wet tyres means that at least for now, Romagnoli is matching the pace. Oh, well, I mean, it's so easy for us to sit here and be like, why take that risk? But obviously, you know, they've done their homework, they've done their practice, they kind of know what's going on. And and they're kind of up to date with, with that. So you know, if, if anyone's going to take a risk, they're clearly in the know. Well, yeah, I mean, they've... Uh... They obviously know their way around this circuit and this car. We see the 121 Audi going slow at the top of Radion. Looks like that's had another excursion. And it's not the first time an Audi's had a moment at the top no. of Radion, is it? So another one to add to their tally. It's where it's quite a low car and you can bottom out on those curbs a little bit, especially the slippery one on the uh, right-hand side as you exit. Uh, had a couple of issues today for them. Bathurst was uh, an enormous success, finishing second. Here, though, not able to fulfil that once more. And mistakes galore is the order of the day. Here's Carbon Simswalk going straight on into the final chicane. Stetsenko back behind the wheel of the Yaz Heat Pirelli car. And uh, he's trying to uh, attack once again his fellow McLaren. Yeah, lucky enough to lose the place there to Stetsenko. Tell you what, just outbreaking itself behind Rosenbaum in the braking zone. And uh, interesting to see three of the four McLarens literally nose to tail uh, with each other and um, obviously Jack McIntyre further up the road doing a very good job for the Rocket Simsport car but McLarens all seem to be very equal to each other which is always good to see. 
Yeah, it seems to be. Where uh, the 720 that we've got on screen was the head of the McLaren field, it's now uh, chopping and changing. Obviously, slightly different through the pit lane sequence. The BMW that is directly ahead, uh, that is on a slightly different strategy. He's not been into the pit lane once again. I believe it is still Nils Nyox behind the wheel of that. Oh, no, it'll be off the camera. Never mind. Uh, cancel that. As we're seeing Carbon Simsport attacking the Yaz Heat. Yaz Heat uh, getting by on the 77 of Rosenbaum and does get that move sorted in that freshly liveried yellow, yellow Yaz Heat. Looks good. And uh, position-wise, gains another one. Yep, he, he's on a charge, isn't he? And uh, doing a very good job at the moment uh, in these, <laughs> got to be said, pretty miserable conditions. And it's very, very tricky to keep the car on the straight and narrow. As you see, the 120 Audi, that is, that is a very, very slow spin to have. And doesn't hit the wall very hard, just... Almost like he didn't realise the car was sliding, just couldn't quite correct it enough. Interesting, interesting place to spin. It's where as he's come up, so he's already come up and over the crest, crest so he's bottomed out a radial, so he's already sliding. And the moment that you touch that kerb, of course, in wet weather, you know, any any sort of painted white line, painted kerbs, whatever, they're going to have a little bit less grip, even if it's only minor they're going to have less grip than the race track itself. And so as he's already sliding a little bit catchable, the moment that you touch that kind of painted um, curbing, it is then uncatchable and you go round. Pit lane is getting busy once again as drivers approaching that 75 minute uh, end of uh, pit lane sequence, their end of stint limit. Some drivers we know that are pitting around the 70 minute mark. We know some drivers, some teams are pushing it much, much further than that and getting all the way up to the end of the 75 limit. And one of those would be that I'd be keeping an eye on the likes of DV1 Triton Racing, who don't have the favoured car around here, certainly don't have the favoured weight, but are pushing that, that strategy as far as they can to try and gain in the long run. Yes, and... Uh the, the pit window is going to be very interesting this time around because it is going to start to dry. And what's interesting to note is that Rognoli is in the 227s at the moment, which is pretty much on par with the rest of the field. So he needs to be careful on this damp track not to start to grain the tyres as he struggles for temperature. Either he's gone out really high pressures, which when the track does dry, those tyres are going to be horrible. Yeah. Or he's gone out on normal dry pressures and the tyres are horrible now. So really really risky call i can't stress that enough it's been so enthralling to see what happens it's risky but at least for now seems to be somewhat working surprisingly enough because pace and this is the important bit is that right now pace seems okay and uh, if you can if you can you know stay out on circuit as it dries out a little bit if you can um sort of hold position you can still set decent lap times. I'm not talking about amazing lap times. I'm talking about decent lap times. You don't have to be the fastest car on track, but if you're on slicks, if it dries out enough that other people need to come in and get off sequence, you've saved yourself that sort of that entire period, which will work its way out in the long run. And that's what this is all about playing is the longer run. It's about playing out the stint all the way to the checkered flag and already working out where you want to be. Absolutely, it's all about losing as little time as possible. And if the track does turn out to be super for dry tyres, what an absolute masterstroke by those guys um, in the uh, 164 Aston Martin. What an absolute fantastic call that would turn out to be if he can keep it on the road. But he has to get through the tricky part first. So, some teams and some drivers taking very different strategies around here. The 41 uh, of the Lada Sport Roseneft car, that is on the wet, oh, slick tyres at the moment, sorry. But coming into the pit lane, uh, Camera has been into the pit lane for BMW uh, G2 Esports. They've been in the pit lane. They've come out on fresh wet tyres. Uh, interesting calls from some, odd calls for other. Romagnoli's uh, cycling his way back towards the front as he's uh, got battles happening behind. That is, I believe, the Williams uh, eSports car battling it out with the Yaz Heat uh, Pirelli car as well. Drive through penalty has been dished out then to the 38. They tried getting away from it and as kind of predicted, it, it's going to remain a drive through. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, it was a 38's fault, unfortunately. Didn't lead to anything 
career ending for the 28, but uh, contact was made and it was uh, Sean Arnold's fault, unfortunately. So they'll have, to, they'll have to serve that drive through through the next three laps and it'll drop them down. But still, well over 20 hours to go. We're hardly even a fifth of the way into this race. Yeah, Nils Nyok's currently on screen and you can see uh, how hard he's fighting it. Watch, this is what I, I love about some sim races, if you watch them. Look how much he, he's leaning going into the corner. Not, not much, but a little bit. Uh, and I have seen some people, I always speak about this every time we see um, webcams and stuff, is that uh, I was in Germany at the Nürburgring. I was watching someone on a, on a simulator and... Um, they would they would turn and they would like it's almost as if they're Mark Marquez right like really really going in it's like watching my dad drive and and uh, yeah I love to like, I love the intensity that some people have others are really casual other people that are really really intense behind the wheel yeah it's, it's, it's quite funny to see the different styles that people have with their driving I know some guys who chat around and uh, laugh and joke and talk and race exactly at the same time and full credit to them I wish I could do that but um then you have some guys who it, they have to be in the absolute zone to get the most out of the car and um, that level of intensity is so easy to get knocked uh, and retaining that can be tricky at times but if you get it right then everyone has their different ways of extracting the most out of a car. Yeah, I mean, everyone needs their own sort of level of preparation. So what my, uh, I was racing with someone once who joined, you, know, you have your open team speak channel with everyone driving or whatever. And, you know, if it's a bit of a fun league, whatever. And um, a, a guy, his name's David Carter, uh, once said, um, just before a race, just jumped into their channel and went, do you, um, do you, when you're racing, do you breathe with your nose or your mouth? And then left. Right? Now the thing is, is right before the start of the race, you kind of you think like that's not that's not an ominous question at all. But it's still a bit like a uh, wait, hang on, do I what, what do, do I nose mouth? I don't know. And it's like that is enough to throw some people off. Other people will just brush it and be like, I, yeah, I already know. Mind games. That that's incredible. <laughs> Very good though. <laughs> oh dear. Is, is this man in sports psychology? Someone get him into sports psychology. Yeah, right. Uh, I am a nose breather. I'm just going to say it again. I am also a nose breather for those out there. If you're a mouth breather, uh, if you're a mouth breather, as I can't talk, you're weird, mate. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, to be fair, I, I, you know, some people, I mean, any mouth breather you can hear. So that's, that's, it's, it's such an offensive way of putting it because mouth breathers are always really loud on TeamSpeak and Discord. So yeah. for some, like less, they, they don't like it so much. But either way, uh, I focus know that we on. I can name a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I can name more than a couple. I can name more than a couple. We've got this battle on screen at the moment. Tarek Gamil and Fotcha as they're switching their positions. And Tarek Gamil then for Williams Esports up to 23rd uh for now though as we've already done i mean obviously there's a little bit of a delay courtesy of uh you know 15 minutes behind but it is time to hand over so from me lewis mcglaid angus fender alongside good stuff i i enjoyed the opening four hours of this but we do have to pass it over to alex goldschmidt and david christie very good afternoon, thank you very, very much. Well, the energy and noise of the SimGrid VCO World Cup has returned in force this weekend as we visit Spa for the second round of this incredible championship, seeing teams fight for their share of a cool $10,000 prize pot over the championship and $2,000 over the top 15 for this race. Uh, Belgium is our home this weekend for a race that's already seen its fair share of drama over the past four hours, but the huge news to recap is that after a torrential deluge that greeted the start of the race, the clouds look like they're starting to part and the number 164 GT TWR Racing Team number 4 car is the centre of all of our focus right now. Having led the race for the past three and a half hours, they've played the ultimate game of Russian roulette and became the first car to go on to slick tyres on a track that, if we're honest, seems to be still a little bit too slippery for them, but they are still setting the times. Your championship leader, the number 111 DV1 Triton Racing Bentley, ran just inside the top 20, so don't discuss count them at this stage in the uh, race but so far it's been overwhelmingly a story of the Aston Martins who have done their very best to completely lock out the top 10s in the standings so far.
It's David Christie and Alex Goldschmidt here taking the reins from the fantastic opening coverage that you just heard there from Lewis McLeod and Angus Fender. We're here for the next four hours and Alex, oh my goodness me, what a race we've had so far. Yeah, just keeping an eye on the live timing. Romagnoli currently in the 2.25.9. So they've gone with the old Jensen button strategy. Uh, you know, going for slick tyres in, in damp conditions. Uh, and firstly, I have to say, well done to Angus Fender on Simgrid de uh, commentary debut alongside uh, Lewis McGlade. Uh, chapeau, sir, I must say. Uh, but, and it looks like uh, the number 32 is back in the pit lane. So uh, Chris Hartfelt pushing the envelope with the uh, maximum 75 minute stint time. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a very bold call uh, from Romagnoli and GTWR, the 164 car. And uh, they start, you know, that had Miato putting it on P2 uh, in the top 10 Super Bowl that myself and Andy McEwen commentated on back on Thursday night. Uh, but you can you can just see now that uh, there's an interesting battle uh, happening here and you've got uh, Andre Franco in the FFS racing car and is behind Neath in the 125 Ubix Aston Martin so it is a bit of a, an Aston Martin meritocracy uh, that we've seen but this is this is this just shows uh, the uh, person uh, um, you know th this is why this um, this balance of performance has been brought in and it has changed everything up as well and it's yes. uh, the funny thing is, is that 123 of Andre Franca is currently on slick tyres. I understand on wet tyres. I understand so. But it's uh, Neath in the Ubix 125 Aston Martin that has also decided to go on slick tyres. So there's a couple of brave souls and brave teams out there, and whether that's going to pay dividend, David, could be uh, very much the case because uh, just look at the weather up in the top right-hand corner. Um, it looks to be uh, dissipating in terms of precipitation, possibly. Yeah, that's that's certainly what the weather forecast is looking as we do our best Michael Fish impression. But uh, over the next half hour, we are looking to see conditions perhaps stabilising uh, with what we've got here at Spa Francorchamps. But a very good afternoon to everybody that is watching on the YouTube chat. As always, I've seen that you've been uh, very vocal, very supportive of your drivers. As always, that's what we love to see here at the, uh, the Sim Grid. So as always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and uh, we'd love to have you as part of the community here but what a race we've got so far the Aston Martins almost single-handedly dominating this race so far but I get the feeling Alex that this is just the first chapter this is the first page of the story in this race here because we're still very very early and uh, Angus Fender as you pointed out did a cracking cracking job uh, making his debut here for the uh, the sim grids on commentary aside the uh, the, the ever awesome um, Lewis McGlade. I mean, it's he, he just raises the bar there. We'll uh, come back to that in a second as Patrick Bignon is uh, in a bit of a dogfight there. That's the uh, number five machine of uh, Gannel that he was fighting on. That was, um, yeah, that was that was quite a bold and uh, ballsy move around the inside of the corner there. Gets it done and he is definitely not looking back just now. So that was, of course, for, uh, I believe, uh, Rutronic E-Racing and that was on the number five of Williams Esports. So Tarek Gamel getting absolutely mugged there. The uh, positions will change on the board very, very shortly. And I think that is going to be the number 38 for Dalkin Community just behind as well. And that is Sean Arnold that is all over the back of Tarek just now. So, uh, yeah, some, some great racing going on still with just uh, four hours in the books, 20 hours still to go, Alex. It's... Um, the one thing that we keep mentioning is that it's all about setting yourself up to the, uh, the the final edge of the race. But something that Angus mentioned is that you know it's it's not like these guys are just sort of cruising about at maybe ninety percent for the the majority of the race. Every single hour of this race is a sprint race. That's very very true, and I completely understand and I agree with that sentiment. But in the meantime, Grabowski in the forty one Lada Sport Rosneft car. So we now turn our attention to Sean Arnold and uh, Gamil. Uh, Grabowski's just on a 2.25.4, so is Eric Neath. So the tyres are coming to these drivers that have gone onto slick tyres. There's now Sean Arnold looking uh, on the exit of Moshmog going into the bus stop chicane for what is 23rd on the road. So it is Aston Martin versus Aston Martin and Patrick Pignon uh, has now got into the distance by a little bit of a comfortable gap. 
just call that nearly 1.4 seconds for the Audi from Rootronic e Racing in the number 33. Um, and Sean Arnold getting very up close and personal to the back bumper and the rear diffuser of Gamel going through into La Source. And this is where, if Arnold positions the car correctly, he's going to be able to make it count, but as long as he doesn't exceed track limits going through Radio, because that, as we saw with the Odox Motorsport 121 Audi earlier on, that can cause a problem. Oh, and look at that as they come through that run then. That is through Eau Rouge and Radion and gets a great run. The Sean Arnold tries to dip into the slipstream. It's going to be the run up to Lecum. I think it's going to be a battle of the late breakers right now, but Sean Arnold thinks better of it. Crazy to think that we're four hours into a race and we've still got this door-to-door -door action going on right now. And this is after we've done the latest bout of pit stops right now. But Sean Arnold having to think better of it. Maybe just thinking, I'm going to try and make the move when I possibly can, but also try and force Tarek Gamel into making a mistake here, rather than actually trying to, to force the issue here, because this is for 23rd and 24th, and in the grand scheme of things, it's uh, it's it's pretty much going to be uh, for those those all important points that count towards the end of the championship. And I'm just hearing the uh, 101 that Silver Racing team uh, Eurowash has had a drive through for speeding in the pit lane. So obviously the uh, the race leader or the former race leader getting a drive through early on as well. So again across the field, a lot of these teams getting caught out, Alex. Yeah, very much the case. I'm just keeping an eye on Grabowski again. He's just done a 2.25.1 and has gone purple in sector two. So the, the lap times are coming down as Sean Arnold up through the exit of the second part of Stavlo, runs Gamil wide and gets the position. Sean Arnold was placing that car. He got the move done. A little bit of elbows out there, but I think uh, rubbing's racing, as they say. Yeah, that was, that was again what we were pointing out earlier, it was all about mind games, it was all about Sean Arnold trying to force Tariq into making a mistake, that's what exactly happened there. Uh, Bastian Richter, meanwhile, in the number 14, uh, Unicorns of Love Aston Martin, doing his bit to secure that Aston Martin top nine, I mean, that is an impressive lockout from the machine, but again, we're seeing that the uh, more indications that the track is going to get drier and drier over our next couple of hours here, Alex. And I think that I, I'd heard before the race and during the start of the race that a lot of teams had gambled on wet weather setups here. And I wonder how much that's potentially going to compromise them as we hit 5.03 p.m. here at track time. Bass and Richter are going... Uh, around and around and around the corner there at, uh, at Blanchemont gets into the uh, the final chicane here but uh, track limits again we saw uh, through the the uh, the early parts of the the stream being very much looked at now by race control they, they had about an hour of leeway where they were allowed to uh, to be a little bit more lenient and now they were well warned by race control that specific corners were being looked at it's always going to be the case and uh, you know we're, we're getting close to the completion of the first hour uh, four hours of the race itself um, yeah race control will be uh, over it like a rash if if someone exceeds a certain corner and, and violates track limits on multiple occasions and it is about being consistent it's about having that patience it's about making sure that you are a bit I think apart from consistent, the word is metronomic. You've, you've got to know where to place the car. You've got to know where your braking points are and how to affect them. And now I've just seen that um, Dennis Grabowski has just gone into the 2 minute 24.9s. The track is uh, evolving rather quickly. Um, and I think a point that Angus Fender made earlier on, um, he said about the fact that when it's damp and there is rainfall coming and the track temperature is that high it's 26 degrees air ambient temperature and 29 degrees track as sean arnold runs wide oh and that's going to allow uh, patrick pignon possibly to uh, close up in on the out uh, with the audi but yeah he he said that he's known it before and he's got real life racing experience as well let's not forget that the minute the rain hits the surface it literally evaporates and that's absolutely spot on because they've done so well to keep the heat into the track, into the tarmac here at the uh, the virtual rendition of Spa. That uh, that's exactly what happens. The the moisture hits the track, but the the 
temperature in the track just dissipates that moisture uh, almost as soon as it's done and with the fact that the you can see there the, the weather forecast is updated again even less weather there is uh, I think that's uh, Statsenko just in front is it um, again just gets rid of any moisture that's not only on the track but in the air as well it almost creates this little layer this little air pocket where uh, things dry up very very quickly so the track has now gone from damp to greasy and uh, again that'll start going to green at probably i would say in about the next half hour so again these uh, wet tyres, Alex, are going to start burning up very, very quickly and you're going to see uh, cars um, start to move across because we've just been told that there is a dry line, a, a very visible dry line throughout the track. But what you're going to start seeing now is these drivers that have decided to stay on wet moving off that dry line to try and cool the tyres down. What did you notice with the fact that uh, Alessandro Fosha and... Um Mikhail Satsenko. Satsenko went to the right of the dry line and Fosha went to the left and then Fosha uh, got up the inside of him uh, before they ended up through uh, Rivage as now uh, Tarek Gamal closing in on Patrick Pignone in the uh, number 33 Rootronic e-racing uh, car and yeah so uh, yeah I mean effectively the, the track is coming to those I mean uh, Romagnoli's now done a 2 minute 25.1 so it looks like the strategy call has paid off and there, there, there were those that decided to brave it and go out there first and so now everyone else that is running all wet to the minute is going to be looking, well, they'll have eyeballs on stalks looking at who is on wets, who is on dries and what lap times people are doing so um, I'm just having a look. Uh, I've just seen that the 995, the ambassadors for Renvelden car, uh, that has currently currently got Jan Biermann at the moment, is running in the 2.28.7s. So um, we we know that it will, uh, and and they were the only, they, they they're on wets at the moment. So those tyres are literally being ripped to shreds at the, the uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we're getting close to 100 laps uh, because Romagnoli at the moment is uh, heading down uh, the Kemmel Strait uh, and you can now see there's a lot of backmarkers uh, and there's a WPS uh, 28 Audi of uh, Weidelich uh, closing on Marek Shins in the 191 racing line, uh, racing line car and that's the battle for 14th position. These tyres, if they're on wets, they will start falling off the proverbial cliff they certainly will uh, and the thing is is as we come up to uh, to 20 hours to go alex it's it's going to be uh, literally when we say a cliff edge that's not just us trying to be dramatic here in the virtual commentary booth that's literally what you'll see is within one lap probably within half a lap for instance you'll see the cars that are on dry tires the track will get to a point where the tyres start overworking themselves, they get too much heat uh, because they just don't have water to dissipate and they don't have enough water to keep them within that optimum temperature and they'll start sliding, they'll start being much, much slower and you'll start seeing the time going down. Getting back to our race leaders here, uh, uh, Michael Romagnoli in that, uh, that 164 just now in the GTA WR number four. Um, I, I've got to be honest, I, I, I don't think the gamble has brought them any massive rewards for that. Sure, they've got in a great position, they're uh, 46 seconds ahead, but, I mean, it's not like they've they've started taking, you know, two, three, four, five seconds a, a, a lap out of the cars behind them or anyone else on the track. So, yes, it was a, a, a very brave move to do, but I, I don't see what the reward was for it. Um, compared to the to the cars around them, so we'll maybe see that might still come to fruition. But I mean that that had the potential uh, to um, maybe have more downsides than it did have on upsides. Doesn't matter though; they've still got the job done. GTWR uh, Racing number four team, the 164 right now with 20 hours left to go in the race, still in the lead and still in a very commanding lead. But everything can change with these changing track conditions. Yeah, um, just been given some uh, information courtesy of James Parker. A big thank you to him for his uh, analytical insights so far this race. Um, it's a 50-50 split between the top 10. So 
cars, uh, well, positions one to four are on dries. Then from five to eight, it's wet. And then uh, the night of the triple eight car in ninth position, Dom Healy in the triple eight car, ahead of uh, Niles Noyox for BMW Sim Racing G2 Esports, uh, is also on the wet weather tyres. Still have to give a bit of a prop to, to Noyox because he's running in the two twenty six fours on wet weather tyres. I've just seen that Chris Hartfelt in the number 32, he's just put in a 2.26.1, which is a personal best uh, for um, that one. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, and I've just seen that Eric Neath has just gone fastest of anybody through the first set. But you can see now Tarek Gamel and Patrick Pignon uh, battling away, going through Lecom as uh, Alessandro Foscher has just got a drive-through penalty uh, for avoidable contact on car number five. Uh, and that would have been uh, on Gamel, who you actually see on your screen. So this is going down into Rivage. Gamel looks to sweep in, taking the outside line to cut through into a tighter apex on Pignon. Uh, and then going into the next left-hander, looks towards the inside of the Audi. Can't get through on that particular point. But now they're going to go through into the double left-hander here at uh, Pouin. And uh, Pignon is making the Audi wide, but Gamel's just trying to force that opportunity open at a moment's notice. Yeah, he certainly is, and uh, it's all about the Aston Martin. You think that it's got the uh, the legs right now as they come down towards the second half of the circuit. They're side by side. Oh, this is going to be a brave move. The Aston Martin thinks better of it, pulls on the anchors as they uh, they come through Lefania and then towards uh, campus as well. This is a bright little battle, though, that we've got going on right now. This is Marcus Beltoran in the number 11. Do you know what? Another, I had an absolute, like, brain melting moment today when uh, when Lewis was on the comms earlier on when he actually said the proper way of saying that I, for all this time for like the past 8 to 10, 10 months I've been calling it Grifax Engineering of course it's Griphax Engineering uh, so yeah a bit of a, a dense moment for myself there when I realised that one uh, but uh, cracking job for the number 11 but this is a stormer of a battle we've got Tarek Gamel trying to go around the outside of the chicane and at the moment he's trying to throw everything at the kitchen sink at the Audi and it doesn't matter because Patrick Bignon goes into pit lane and uh, I, yeah I think he's saw sense out of that one meanwhile Marcus Beltonen tries to go around the outside of the number 36 that is a car that is uh, at least one lap down that is of course uh, Simon de Mori in that Aston Martin right now for the number 36 and uh, it's it's not really working out so far and who was that trying to go up the inside that was a 28 of uh, Weidlich and this is for position so Weidlich while the number 11 is trying to get past that lap traffic thinks uh, thank you very much that was cheeky and uh, what an opportunistic move from Luca Weidlich there in the Audi. That was, uh, that was pretty much textbook. He was just waiting for what was going on up ahead. And then uh, Pelton just pretty much left the door open. So Weidlich uh, just went, yep, thank you very much. That'll do. And it's all about these little positional games. Games, you know, you're not going to have battles all the way through the 24 hours. Um, but um, I'm just going to throw a little bit of a, uh, a curveball here because Grabowski is quicker than Malinowski in second position by the best part of well over two tenths of a second close to two and a half tenths so the battle for P2 and P3 I think is going to ignite rather shortly because they're about 1.2 seconds apart and then is Grabowski uh, now this car qualified by Igor Orgorodnikov um, who was actually the he, he got literally into the top ten on having set the same lap time as I, th I I can't remember who it was exactly off the top of my head, but they set exactly the same lap time and Ogorodnikov got through on the basis that he set the lap time first and that's normally what happens in quali. So for them to be up into uh, third place uh, and uh, you, know, you know what's really, really funny though, that Grabowski, Ogorodnikov and the, and the whole crew there, you know, they're doing a really good job uh, so far to be up, what is it? Six, six positions up to P3 and we're four hours in um, you know it's looking pretty good for them at the moment it sure is and I think that cliff edge has already come for the wet weather tyres because at the moment the uh, the one to four are uh, looks like 1.5 seconds minimum 1.5 seconds ahead 
of the wet weather tyres behind them, so places one to four, they are absolutely going away with it. And the uh, number 92, uh, it looks like into the pit lane, that's Max, Maxime Batifui, uh into the pits with only 10 laps on those wet tyres. So uh, that has been a huge, huge, um, uh, that's been a disaster for that 92 team. Uh, I think uh, what we're hearing in our ears, I, I have to agree, I think they would have been better just trying to minimise the damage, keeping things going, but it's not to be. Meanwhile, David McKell sent it up the inside of the chicane, last to the late breakers there in that Lamborghini, uh, that lonely Lamborghini down in 39th place. Uh, that was a heck of a move there on Mikel Noros there in the 44. Cracking, cracking job there, and uh, keeps things going as well. In fact, sorry, excuse me, that was, of course, the Audi of uh, Martina Zemir that he uh, just got for that position there, but... Yeah, 92, that is uh, how things go badly very, very quickly. And Alex, these uh, dry tyres now starting to come into their own. Yeah, uh, also, uh, we just had another penalty issued by race control. Penalty going to the number 44 of Revolution Sim Racing Blue for avoidable contact with car 194. And that is the uh, second of the racing line motorsport cars for avoidable contact on lap 87. So that will have to serve that in the next couple of laps. Um, so, yeah, um, Botile also in the pits now in the 129, and that's the uh, Kilash Sim Racing car. So, uh, 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 yeah, these these tyres, I mean, it was very interesting to to find that out, that obviously, you know, being on wet tyres for 10 laps. Oh, and I've just heard that 995 is currently under investigation. That's the um, Ambassadors for Renvelton car. Um, and yeah there could be a penalty incoming for that team as well but i've just seen that <laughs> marek shins has just put in a two minute 24.0 fastest lap of the race two laps away from the century being hit here at spa francorchamps fastest in the first sector did a 42.4 in sector one and a one minute 3.6 on sector two and he is on He's on dry tyres, he's on slicks, so the track has really, really come through right now. And that's a 224.096, so uh, that dry line is really starting to expand. You can actually see it uh, on the circuit right now. And there's uh, David Mikel going through, and here is Grabowski. And now is with the pole sitters, Cymax Motorworks, coming through the exit of the source. And down into the dip through Au Rouge we go. Here we go then, Valerie Suman giving us the heads up in uh, YouTube chat for that one. This is the battle then for P2 and P3. And over the past couple of laps, Grabowski in that number 41 Ladder Sport Rosneft car has been the faster, just very marginally, but has consistently brought down that gap. I say uh, gradually, but I mean, that was a whole eight tenths there of a second that he brought down on that. in uh, second place of uh, Masek Malinowski. The tyres are on the same sort of length right now from what I'm seeing. Um, tyre pressures was an issue, so from what I was hearing on the uh, the YouTube chat, the, the, I think it was uh, it was Yeager, wasn't it? It was Ogorodnikov that was in the car before, and uh, his rears were absolutely shot to pieces. They were uh, bright red from the, uh, the, the back, so on this stint, they're just taking a wild shot in the dark with the changing conditions, and Early signs, Alex, looking very, very positive for this uh, number 41 machine. But Malinowski doing a, a decent job along with uh, Killing Ryan Meenan, uh, Mikhail Kundakleoglu and uh, Mikhail Tauscher for that uh, uh, car in front of the 211 of Sidemax Motorworks JLO team. But again, backmarker traffic coming into play here, Alex. And uh, I, I think Dennis Grabowski looking to keep things going very, very uh, Calm at the moment. Yeah, we've already gone into the 23s. Marek Shins, uh, a two minute 23.916, but now the back marker traffic will really give the advantage to Grabowski as they now head their way through into Blanchimont and uh, Magic Malinows uh, Malinowski really feeling the pressure from the Rolado Sport Rosneft 41 Aston Martin 
out through in towards the bus stop chicane. It's just about making it neat and tidy and get the run going through into La Source. You can just see how aggressive Grabowski is, not taking any curbing there. A good call there. Right up the back bumper, switches to the left hand side on the run down to La Source. And Grabowski is going to try and plant it around the outside, maybe get the cut back. Do the old switcheroo going through into La Source and get the run through into Radion. He's going to try and make it work. But Ma Magic Malinowski doesn't make it happen. That's a great defensive move there from the 211 as they head down the hill back into uh, Eau Rouge and up towards Radion. But at the moment, Malinowski holding on ahead of Grabowski for second positions. They come through. A little bit of a run wide through Radion from uh, Grabowski. And Malinowski having to go a little bit more to the right coming out of the exit of Radion. And down the Kemmel Strait, Grabowski could get a double toe. Is now Malinowski flashing the lights of the car in front saying, come on, get out of the way, please. Yeah, it's not happening though as they come through Lecum and that was a, a cracking bit of uh, patience from Grabowski and Malinowski. There we go, that's what you like to see. Brilliant, brilliant moving to the side there from, uh, I think that was only Aston Martins behind. That was the number five of Tarek Gamil uh, who moved to the side there. Great opportunity for him to be able to do that, but uh, Grabowski trying as he can. And again, I think this is mind games right now. I think Grabowski, given the pace that he's got, look at how rattled Malinowski is right now he is having to push that car to the absolute nth degree in terms of traction and in terms of limit and don't be fooled whatsoever just because this track is decreasing in terms of the wetness here it is still very very easy for these drivers to make a huge mistake and potentially uh, race changing implications given that there's still 20 hours to go but it is still uh, Grabowski and the other great thing for Grabowski is this is a complete win-win because the more that he pushes Malinowski right now uh, the hotter Malinowski's tyres are going to get the more warm that Malinowski's tyres are going to get and could even force them into becoming blistered and a little bit bobbly and uh, potentially even have to pit earlier so again fantastic pressure right now from Grabowski he doesn't really need to uh, to get this done but the 995 confirmation then drive through penalty this is a replay of earlier on this is the 154 of uh, GTWR racing 5 and I think this is going to be avoidable contact from the entry to the chicane on the 5 of Tarek Gamel there oh yeah you hate to say it that's really really unfortunate simple mistake to make uh, I don't think there's any maliciousness or any intent in that but uh, it is what it is meanwhile down to turn one then for uh, Masik Malinowski for side Max Motorworks oh there's a big big moment there and that means that Grabowski can possibly go through I wonder if Grabowski hit into the back of Malinowski there because it looked like Grabowski instantly off the throttle Alex and uh, let him back through yeah I think at the uh, that was discretion being the better part of valor there from Grabowski uh, so Malinowski lives to fight another day. And you can see there's a couple more Aston Martins. But look, Grabowski right in the toe. Uh, just seeing that Franco in the 123 is in the pits. Grabowski now pulling alongside of Malinowski and gets through before they even hit the first apex up Lecom. So Grabowski timed that to uh, perfection. Actually did the right thing there, I think. Um, to uh, just, just to let uh, Grabowski get back. Uh, in well, Grabowski to let Malinowski go through after what happened through La Source, and it's not the easiest thing to see, but it's part and parcel of racing. Sometimes you have to make that decision uh, to safeguard where you are on the grid. Certainly, yeah. So the one, two, three, FFS racing of Andre Frank into the pits. Then that was the leading car, I believe. Or that was on wets they almost certainly are going to be changing to dry tires and let's have a look at what the drop off is uh yeah it's still although to be fair dom healy in the triple eight up to uh, 225s right now but again it looks like we're through that 224 barrier firmly uh, maybe even on a good lap without traffic able to reach into those uh, 223s track not quite optimum in terms of the dryness right now you can see that wide dry line there but it isn't quite at where the uh, drivers would want to be to get an optimum racing line through that. Um, probably going to have to wait another 15 minutes to half an hour, but you can see here, looks like Marcus Peltoran uh, deliberately going off that racing line, potentially to uh, to keep those tyres nice and cool. If he is on those wet tyres, we'll get confirmation of that in just a moment. But uh, the number 11 there, currently down in 16th place and uh, doing 232s 
at the moment. So yeah, he is significantly off the pace in that number 11. And again, this is what we saw on to, uh, to earlier, Alex, is the fact that, uh, again, you can come in early on your stint and change over. But for this part, you may as well kind of stick it out for another five, ten laps and uh, and just eat up that, that time difference and then come on to the drives. Yeah, a bit of uh, short-term pain for long-term gain. Uh, but I've just heard that the 123 car has just come back out, out into the circuit. That's the FFS racing car with uh, Andre Franco back behind the wheel. And it looks to have dry... Uh, he, he and he was uh, he was on the wet weather tires before switching to slip to dries for 40 minutes. So um, you know that's what 35 minutes off of uh, a full 75 minutes. But he's had to lose um, f you know five <laughs> it's five or so places in order to get to that position and, and to make that choice of going on to slicks because the likes of Grabowski, who now has got clean air. He's well and truly up the road from Malinowski. The gap now is over 1.2 seconds. Well, actually, make that 1.7. Grabowski last time was well over one, nearly 1.3 seconds to the decimal point quicker. Um, so Grabowski's tactic worked on Malinowski, and now he's got some clean air going through into the uh, double left here at Puon. And the next car up ahead is uh, uh, Peltonen in the uh, Grip Hacks uh, engineering car in the uh, Mercedes, who are currently running in 16th position. Cracking little battle, we've resumed watching here just now as Andre Frank trying to make his way round. That is for position because he's got Bastian Richter in the number 14 just in front of him. That is, of course, Unicorns of Love as they come round towards the final chicane. Andre Frank going to have to slam on the anchors and uh, get a better exit. And that's what it looks like he is. The, uh, the Unicorns of Love car really struggling to get any sort of traction out of that final corner as we see FFS Racing's Andre Frank come across the line. This, though, going picture in picture is in melee. That's Tariq Gamil. Uh, and I think that might have been uh, Batefui. As we see a Bentley in the background getting all sorts of sideways. That might have been uh, Sharko in the treble one car just now. But uh, Tariq Gamil doing a cracking job of getting past all of that. Getting himself to safety there. As it uh, is indeed the uh, 111 of Sharko behind in that Bentley that we saw having a bit of a moment and very very easy to do at the exit of Blanchemont Alex yeah uh, the triple one DV1 Triton Racing came, coming into this round having uh, drawn first blood at Mount Panorama back in early April and they're running with a maximum amount of ki uh, maximum amount of I think it's 40 kilos of ballast due to the balance and performance system initiated for the Simgrid VCO World Cup and uh, considering where they actually qualified, they started 37th and now up 18 positions to uh, 19th on the road at the moment. And uh, for those wondering, the uh, current gap between first and second is just over 48.7 uh, seconds. So that's Romagnoli and uh, Grabowski uh, in. And, and at the moment, it's a top five lockout for Aston Martin. But Niles Noyok still staying out on the wet weather ties. He's currently in the 228.9s and uh, has got a couple of cars just behind. Looks like that is the Yaz Heat Pirelli car uh, just behind as well. And then you'll probably have the like, likes of uh, Marek Shins not too far adrift. And then there's also the 666 Ferrari that I've just spotted as well just behind. And that would be the Racing ON3 uh, Ferrari 488. So Noyok is just hanging on. He's trying to... Uh, just get through all the pain and then hand over the car um, at the end of this stint. And that's going to be a tall order because that was Mikhail Statsenko in the uh, number twenty, uh, the number 149 uh, machine in 26th place down there in the Yaz Heat McLaren. Uh, just firing and past him at turn one like he wasn't even there. But that BMW is severely, severely compromised right now. The other thing to, to bear in mind as well as you see him losing uh, all sorts of traction on the entry to Lacoon there is the fact that we're all obviously presuming that the rain is just going to stop at some point because we see the uh, the continuous decreasing there in the uh, the weather prediction but it could just as easily go the other way it could start in 
intensifying again, which I think would catch uh, quite a lot of these teams out as well. And their strategists are going to have to be on their uh, A game and earning quite a lot of their pennies today, I think, until we actually see how the weather is going to uh, to pan out here at Spa. But uh, just coming up for our, uh, what's that, about 20 minutes to go here until 5 o'clock here on the SimGrid's coverage of the uh, SimGrid VCO World Cup. Uh, round two here at Spa Francorchamps. It's Dave Christie and Alex Goldschmidt bringing you coverage for the next three and uh, three hours and 20 minutes, I think, is uh, what we've got left to go. And, uh, you know, hats off to, to Lewis McGlade, Alex, who's doing one heck of a synth. I think he's got about 12 hours of coverage that he's, uh, or 10 hours of coverage that he's going to be doing uh, this weekend. Yeah, well, we'll be handing back over to him and uh, you and O'Leary uh, just around eight o'clock this evening, um, UK time. So that'll be uh, 2100 uh, Central European uh, Summertime as Jim Paresis from the Greek Sivlaki squad. Uh, oh, and uh, Jakub uh, Harcott has just gone off going through Lecom and has got Gamil just behind as well. <laughs> it's this is not getting any easier out there. These these conditions are so unstable, and I use that term very, very loosely because I've commentated in real life in Belgium before myself personally. When the rain comes down, you I, I've seen it on over race weekends or race races happening that <laughs> um, it can be light and then all of a sudden it can intensify uh, and this is very much part and parcel of what I expected but I was hope I was wondering that with the higher track temperature which has actually dipped a degree in the process um, would probably come to the drivers a little bit more because the dry line hasn't really presented itself as there oh Pelt uh, Pelton and from grip, uh, grip hacks has just lost another place as that's Gamil going around the outside of the Mercedes now is there an issue for them and could that be tyres well we'll soon see because uh, the number 11 did a 235 that last lap round there so it certainly would add some fuel to that suggestion there and the number 11 does seem to be going backwards does Pelton and that's two places that he's lost in the space of a lap here and uh, yeah that's that's a bad day going to worse uh, because he's dropped now back behind uh, Tarek Gamal on the track you can see him just coming up towards the uh, the final chicane it looks like the uh, the number 211 uh, very slow out of the uh, the chicane there but uh, I, I mean this is just absolutely fascinating to see how this is going because I, I think all of the teams and all of the drivers are on tenter hooks right now because they need some sort of confirmation and the only confirmation we can give them in terms of weather is that it is going to stay like this for the uh, the next what 20 30 minutes where we get our uh, our next update so this this greasy horrible conditions going to continue for a little while longer and it's really it's no man's land right now it's not dry enough really to uh, to to get the best out of the slicks and it's definitely not wet enough to be on the uh, the wet tires anymore it's a uh, it's a case of on the slicks but nice and gentle nice and gingerly round and the confirmation uh that zahir essa in the uh, the number 777 up into uh, 20 first position and just having confirmation there that uh, Maxime Batifoui in the number 92 AAA esports machine has pitted twice in very quick succession um, and is now down to 29th place he was as far up I believe as 21st early on and he's done one stop to get the slicks on and uh, He's just done another run. I'm really not too sure on that. We'll have to uh, to head down to pit lane very, very shortly and get the uh, inside scoop on that. But the number 92 into some real problems there for AAA Esports. Uh, and that has cost them quite significantly on that one. Uh, but a lap down for the 92. Uh, Alex, what, what's your thoughts on that one? Um, I'm just as intrigued as everybody else. Um, whether it, you know, whether even in these incremental conditions if they've had an off-track excursion there's going to be damage to be repaired and that is probably i'm just wondering or uh, there could be another alternative strategy you know two times in 45 minutes um you know that could be the fact that maybe they've decided well let's just go for something a bit different and keep people guessing because 
Uh, who knows? As now, Samuel Lovatz from Racing Line Motorsport coming uh, up to a lot of cars, one of which is towards Seedlo in the 720 McLaren. Now, this is a battle for position, um, and that is for 14th between the McLaren and the Bentley. I think you've got... Uh, just seeing that, I think I've just seen the uh, pink performance Audi uh, just up ahead as well as they go up the hill. Uh, now this is a pretty lengthy train is now Samuel Ratz getting the run on Marius towards Zidlo and that's the 25 pink performance car on the right that is actually in front of towards Zidlo and that gave Ratz the opportunity that he needed and the Bentley just literally went straight lining it and they're now up 20 they are now up from 41st to get this 26 positions that's 14th place after nearly four and a half hours of racing good stuff yeah fantastic fantastic stuff great to see the uh, the spirit of chat in youtube as well from our our armchair critics it's always fantastic to have you along guys uh, and as always we have to say a huge thank you to our uh, our stewards panel who uh, mercilessly sit through these weekends and uh, do a fantastic job of towing the line, uh, reading their own rule book and uh, being very well informed on it from uh, everything that we can see here. But rats up the inside there, cracking move there. Fair enough, it was on one of the uh, the cars uh, several laps down of Alexander Novikov there, but that did look glorious uh, coming through that left-hander there uh, at uh, Double Garsh. But uh, 19 and a half hours left to go in this race. We're currently watching Danilo Santoro for the Jean-Lacy Esports Academy team, that number 27 Ferrari. And the Ferrari's really not getting a chance to uh, to show what they can do in this race so far. Maybe that will uh, come into its own towards the second half of the race. But for just now, Alex, I mean, it really has been the story of the Aston Martins. It has been, as I said, the Aston Martin meritocracy, you know, the uh, and the way that the, the the other interesting thing is obviously, um, you know, the Aston Martin is the car that has really flourished here. You know, we, we saw a good performance. I mean, I, I remember seeing Nars Norix's comments on Twitter. You know, he said, look, P6, it wasn't the greatest lap. He was rather upfront and, and honest about it. And that I admire where people say, well, look, we've got enough, we, we've got to go twice around the clock we're going to get to the end of this race we've got to try and see if we can push and, and they're pushing like crazy out there let's not forget as Danilo Santoro uh, closing in on that is the 21 of Scherninger uh, the number 21 WPS racing team uh, Audi and that is for position that's actually for the last position in the top 20 and uh, yeah Danilo Santoro, uh, Santoro trying to push like crazy but uh, Schrodinger getting the better of the Ferrari at the moment. The Audi and the uh, Ferrari, both mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, so uh, handling characteristics through, through uh, mid and high-speed corners are very much a good attribute of these cars, but then it's just the Aston Martin with the torque that it's got coming out of its 4-litre uh, twin-turbo V8 is uh, another completely different um, attribute to sort of throw into the mix, so to speak certainly is and uh, I think we're going to have an awful lot of talking points over the next three hours uh, coming up here we go with a replay then this is uh, let's have a look here this is one of the uh, Porsches it is the number one Porsche of PPR Esports and it looks like it's going to be contact up the inside possibly up the blind spot here from the 995 ambassadors for Renfeld oh my goodness me that is uh, in uh, hockey we would call that a hip check and uh, he just got sent into the boards in the biggest possible fashion there yeah that's that's not the bet i think it looks worse than it actually was there um yeah but race control i think not really going to be too happy for that one and indeed that is probably why Jan Beeren had to make an extra uh, visit to the uh, the pit lane there but back with the race as well then Danilo Santoro in that number 27 Ferrari uh, chasing down the car in front of him just now that's going to be the number 21 I believe of uh, the WPS racing team and that's Dennis Schooninger that is up in front so the 27 versus 21 again I mean 19 and a half hours to go and we're still you know 20th and 21st place absolute dog fights throughout the field Alex that's the ultra competitive nature of this field as Schoeninger goes a little bit wide uh, coming out of the uh, corner which is uh, known as uh, no name before heading down into the uh, the, the two left-handers here at Pouin 
um, but Santoro has been given a couple of windows of opportunity um, and hasn't really been able to take any sort of advantage thereof as now uh, we're halfway through um, hour number five, four, four and a half hours completed, 19 and a half hours to go on the uh, second round, the Thrustmaster, 24 hours of Spa-Francorchamps here on the SimGrid VCO World Cup. Uh, Santoro's, just, I think, you know, the patience uh, doesn't need to wear thin on this because uh, Santoro's got time to make the move. And, and it's, you know, in these difficult conditions, look at the dry line that's forming now, David. That's nearly on half of that part of the circuit, and that's the approach going from Stavlo down to Blanchimont. Um, so yeah, it could be rather interesting how things develop. Yeah, and again, we'll be here for uh, how they do develop, but certainly weather um, is going to be a huge, huge factor in the next hour and a bit here as we still see Danilo trying to hunt down that Audi in front of him of Schöninger. And just going back to that hip check from the uh, the number one, uh, the PPR Esports uh, against the uh, Ambassadors for Renville in number 995. I had no idea that's what the conversation on our YouTube chat was about in terms of the, uh, the, the decision that was made. I, I cannot see how anybody could possibly try and uh, argue uh, against that one. I mean, that, that was a, a blatant, blatant uh, incident that, that happened there. It doesn't matter whether or not the uh, the car involved was uh, a lap down or not. But uh, yeah, that was wild and uh, absolutely indefensible. And look, it's a case of for the uh, for the 995, they've taken the punishment, they've taken their uh, penalty, they get on with it, and uh, you know they're not going to be the last one involved in incidents through the race. Um, so it's it's just a case of trying to minimise these these risk these uh, you know minimise these risky incidents, these risky manoeuvres, and just try to keep your nose as clean as possible. And realistically, that's what's going to determine the top ten. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, probably looking at it from a different aspect, maybe the 995, maybe should should have just maybe backed off a little bit. Just in my honest opinion here, you know, we're all entitled to our honest opinion. People might not necessarily agree with it, but if they'd lifted out of it, then maybe that would have been a bit easier going through as Eric Neath just goes around the outside of Magic Malinowski right there. And that's into the approach going through into the uh, bus stop chicane. A big thanks to James Parker once again for some more information. He told me that the 123 on the previous... Uh, pit stop uh, did not um, change tyres but just took on fuel so they stayed on the original wet tyres um, and so but they're now but they're, but, they're, but they're now on slick so basically the track was a lot drier so they're not graining up like they probably would have done and now they're in the 20, uh, 2 minute 23s and they're flying so they're about 2 seconds a lap faster than what they were pre previously yeah, and uh, again, it's that constant pace, that consistent pace, Alex, that we're seeing is making positions up hand over fist here. But McLaren's starting to come into its own right now as uh, we see Sven Rosenbaum for MRL Sim Racing hunting down that, uh, that looks like the, uh, the number 11 that is uh, in front of him. Grip Hacks Engineering, I mean, they have really had a horrible, horrible hour right now. They were... Uh, in a decent position, they were doing very, very well. I think they were up into the top 20 and they've just gone backwards. Currently down in 31st position with Marcus Peltonen behind the wheel and in the middle of an absolute sandwich right now of cars as they are coming through the uh, the tail end of the uh, circuit, through Lafania and down towards campus and then Stavolo. And this is a, a bit of a queue, a little bit of a procession that we've got going on with cars that are on several different laps from each other. That Bentley is, uh, is doing a decent job of just staying with itself. I mean, I think that's down in 45th place and three wide into Blanchemont. Uh, I'm a little bit scared, Alex. I'm, yeah, thankfully that's all resolved itself, but... Uh, that was a little bit of a heart and mouth moment there. Yeah, Sven Hosenbaum keeping ahead and has uh, just got past number 43, Bentley. Uh, going through into the uh, bus stop chicane. And, uh, now, the uh, the fact that Romagnoli was one of the first to blink and get on two dry uh, slick tyres, they're now running on the 2, two minute 27.8, so those tyres are starting to drop but now Grabowski was on a 2 minute 25.3 so maybe going early was not always the best strategy call but someone's got to dip their toe in the water first 
Still is, and uh, that is potentially going to cost them. This is exactly what I was saying about 20 minutes ago, is that I, for me personally, I don't think the, the reward outweighed the risk in the early pit stop that they did, certainly moving to those drier tyres, because it's not dried significantly that they've had to, uh, to, to you know, overwork those tyres within the first five laps of getting them on just to try and keep them on song. Uh, we've got a uh, yellow flag then, that is going to be Niels Noyox in that BMW uh, and that is the 62 that was involved in that one. Uh, so yeah, hate to see that one happening but thankfully green flag means that he's back on again and uh, it doesn't look like it was too much of an inch issue there but that was through uh, Bruel. Uh, just on the exit of Malmedy, so into Bruel, gets going again, but again has to keep keep things going. But uh, looks like he's just spun it on his own, uh, and I can't see Alex any real damage to that car. So that is possibly a get out of jail free card for that number 62 machine. Yeah, Niox has also been in the car for 56 minutes as well, David. So he's he's toughing it out there, is Niles. So uh, we'll see get how he gets on and how far he wants to push that stint. 19 and a half hours left to go in the second round of the Simgrid VCO World Cup. We are here from Spa Francorchamps bringing you all of the action for the remainder of the race. It's currently David Christie and Alex Goldschmidt here with you. Uh, the story really is that it has been a fantastic judge of strategy from the GTWR racing team, number four team of currently behind the wheel, Michael Romagnoli, along with Andrea Miato dominating the first stints of the race. Uh, they have, of course, teamed up with Simone Fidel and Gianluca Rossi in that Aston Martin. But it is the domination from the Aston Martins right now, the top eight. Uh, well, I did say that because we've currently got Chris Hartfield, who's managed to sneak up into sixth place in that Ferrari. So the, uh, the Aston Martin stronghold of that top eight has been well and truly broken. And uh, you've currently got your leader, and it must be said, Denis Grabowski in that second place now, I think starting to fall away a little bit in terms of pace with those uh, dry tyres. Now it looks like we're going to be uh, watching how they fall off and uh, whether or not they're going to go back onto the, uh, the dry tyres. I think there's no real question about it, they have to do it. Yeah, very much the case. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of drivers coming in for an interview. So from Williams Esports, let's welcome Tarek Gamel and uh, Jack Keithley. Uh, Martin Stefanko behind the wheel of that car at the moment. So uh, let's see if we can uh, get them in. Uh, Jack, Tarek, good to have you with us here in the uh, in the commentary box. Um, good to see that Martin's now behind the wheel. Uh, Tarek, first of all to you, some great battling uh, around this circuit. It's definitely been a tricky one today, hasn't it, so far? Definitely, yeah. The conditions uh, quite challenging, so it's it's not quite variable. So sometimes you get you have some grip, sometimes you don't have a grip, and it's uh, it's an interesting experience every every lap. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but still, good to see you getting your elbows out there. I mean, it's it's dog eat dog, but also uh, good to have teams like Williams Esports with us. Um, Jack, let's come to you. I mean, obviously now Martin Stefanko's behind the wheel. Um, Hopefully uh, he's going to bring some good positional change uh, up uh, increases for you guys. Obviously, we've still got about 19 hours and 20 minutes still to go in the race. There's still plenty to play for, isn't there? Absolutely. It's just a shame that as of right, as of right now, the, the um, luck we've had has been nothing but bad, to be honest. Um, me and Tariq have both had a little ding-dong moments with people, but I feel like the pace of the car is there. We just need a little bit of luck on our side, frankly. Uh, and obviously also, Jack, um, a difficult qualifying session, uh, especially trying to get into uh, the top 10 Super Bowl shootout uh, on Thursday night, starting uh, 30 second. But you guys have got really good pace und uh, under this Aston Martin, as now Martin is uh, closing on Patrick Pignon from uh, Rootronic E-Racing, um, who I think you, Tarek, also had a bit of a battle with earlier on, about 20 or so minutes ago. Uh, things uh, c could hopefully be uh, coming to you guys in, in the latter stages, depending if the weather gets a bit dry, because there is a dry line showing on the circuit. Fingers crossed, I mean, it's Spa, you never know what's going to happen. But, um, yeah, in terms of the qualifying, I mean, just again, this field was really tough. And Martin was pretty close to his personal best. And, yeah, Martin would go for 30 seconds. But, hey, if you're in the race, and the race is long, anyone's got a chance. It's just, again, a little bit of luck here and there. And 
um, and some good driving. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll be in a much better place later on. Well, Tarek Gemmell and uh, Jack Keithley from Williams Esports, guys, all the very best of luck for the remainder of the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa Francorchamps here on the SimGrid VCO World Cup. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you. So good to hear from them both there, David. So they've got Martin uh, Stefanko behind the wheel. Now we're going to go to the replay of when uh, we had the uh, off-track excursion. This is going through Bruxelles. And yeah, the back end just steps out to the left. So I think those tyres are pretty much at the end of their carcass at the moment here, David. So uh, Nars Noyox uh, waiting and then just waiting for a gap to open up so we can get back onto the circuit. Uh, so everyone's having their fair share of dramas uh, so far in the first nigh on five hours uh, of this race yeah for sure for sure great to hear from jack heathley and the uh, the rest of the team there uh, uh, again it's just a case of them having to uh, to knuckle down in that williams esports machine uh, along with uh, moreno sarica and and just really plow on and try and get themselves up in the order it's certainly not uh, out of contention for them to get into the top 10 but again a, a heck of a lot of uh, you know tying up your laces and just getting on with the job over the next 12 hours that's going to be the order of the day here this is a cracking on board um looking the, at the uh, the bumper cam of jan beerman for ambassadors of renville and, and alex what exactly did i say about 15 minutes ago we were all presuming that the weather was going to decrease and it was going to dry up and potentially some dry racing just been updated there half an hour the rain is going to intensify again this is now going to turn everything on its head again. OK, roll the dice and pick a number, Mr Christie, because I've just seen Romagnoli. He's just done a 2 minutes 32, and he lost a bag full of time in Sector 3. He's actually now in pit lane. So, uh, well, we have... Now, the biggest question is, could that be that are they are they deciding to change their strategy because now do they go slicks do they go wets that's the biggest point well that's the the whole thing with that is the fact that he 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 was literally limited by the fact that he didn't take fuel last time so he had to to get fuel in i think in my opinion uh, and I, get, I can hear a couple of the guys in the background agreeing with this is you know just take the fuel stick with the tires you've got keep on uh keep on at it and just keep trucking because play it by ear let's see what happens all we all we know is that the rain is going to intensify over the uh, at some point in the next half hour but we don't know by how much is it enough to uh, to knock off this this dry line we're about to find out yeah, I think one of the other things that you've also got to worry about, not just about fuel and tyres, but also brake pads, uh, because that can be another bone of contention. You know, how quickly will those drop off? And are you going to have to do a pad change in one of the full service stops? As we're now on board with Jan Biermann towards Zidlo in the uh, 720 car, uh, the Carbon Simsport car that actually qualified in 18th position on Thursday night, uh, will now drop outside of the... Uh, top 15 as there's Jan Biermann closing in on Danilo Santoro so it's ambassadors for Renvelt and versus John Alessi Esports Academy going down the hill uh, heading into Eau Rouge and then Radion it looks like Biermann's got a good run on the Ferrari going up the hill now is he going to use the advantage of coming out of Radion and then uh, gets a real good run look at the toe absolute slingshot and a half and he's going to go to the left of Santoro going through towards Le Com. And is the Aston Martin going to have the legs on the Ferrari? Well, they're side by side, and it looks like um, Beerman's going to be the last of the late breakers, and he decides to turn it in a bit later, and also just power past Santoro. So that was an easy place there for Jan Beerman from for Ambassadors for Renvelden. Meanwhile, uh, Statsenko is uh, embroiled in his own sort of uh, battling as well. Uh, but there's also that's the 40, uh, 40th place car just up ahead, the Aston Martin. Um, so Statsenko just waiting to get past safely and that's one of the biggest things you need to do when you have to negotiate back marker traffic is to look and pick your spots uh, not go charging in there like a Brahma bull and making an, a complete hash of it Statsenko is just trying to keep it nice and clean and wait for the chance to get past the back marker 
That's that's absolutely what the order of the day is. It's every single little uh, moment like this, Alex. They have to be thinking of the 24 hours. They have to be thinking that it is a long race. And sometimes, if you're going to lose maybe two, three seconds a lap, fine, take that hit. But it's all about keeping that car safe and sound. As uh, he's also got, uh, that is the number 77 behind him of Florian Fleer uh, in the MRL Sim Racing machine that is just on his tail as well so again while he can just focus on keeping that thing safe yeah it's going to be a, a different matter if Florian starts getting his act together and catches up uh, talking about catch up do you like that little uh, segue there Alex uh, let's mm -hmm. bring in James Parker uh, James uh, you've obviously been uh, keeping a very watchful eye of things over the past uh, five hours or so here it's been an enthralling race, but it feels like we're just about uh, half an hour away from yet another roll of the dice here. I don't think anyone saw that coming, really, did they? I think everyone was preparing for the the dry transition, and all of a sudden, the ACC gods have decided that it wants to rain again. So, this is going to be really critical. So, the, the, the guys that, again, ran long and gave, had flexibility have now got a bit of a chance to, to see what the weather does and, and maybe, you know, go back to wet. I mean, the track temperature is still pretty hot. It's only dropped a degree from the start, so it's still 28. So these slicks will last quite a while now because obviously the track is very much slick biased at the moment. Um, the 164, I mean, <laughs> they were stuck between a rock and a hard place there, weren't they? So in my, in my situation, I would have just taken... Um, dry tire oh I wouldn't have taken tires, I would have just taken fuel and just waited to see uh, if the the track comes back to wet tires and then time your next in to a or next stop to a, a switch to wets. Um, the guys that are gonna really benefit from this are the ones that kind of went slightly off strategy um, to to offset the graining of the slick. So the one, two, three, because they pitted much later um, by going only fuel on their original stop and just take, took the same wet tyres. Um, they've now got much more flexibility um, and they can literally just sit there and wait till the, the, the wet weather comes. So um, right now they, um, they're looking at you know another half an hour, 40 minutes until they need to come in again. So um, it's, it's going to come down to this transition. Obviously a lot of people gained, a lot of people lost. Um, obviously, those that took wets had to they had to do an extra stop um, uh, to get back onto the slick tyres when it dried out. The 62, uh, the G2 car has persevered with the wet tyres. Um, I'd say that is still the right call because you're not going to lose two minutes in race time in a stint unless you're really, really, really slow. Uh, at the moment, I can see they're only losing about seven or eight seven or eight seconds a lap so even at seven or eight seconds a lap you're not going to lose two minutes in total over a stint so it's worth just having this pain dealing with it and then obviously um on your next scheduled stop uh going back onto a set of tires that are a bit more um uh, uh, you know climatized the conditions per se but um in terms of big movers i mean the 194 that's now up to 11th place. That's made 29 places from their starting position in P40. Uh, they've done nothing special. They've just stayed out of trouble, uh, maximised their stints, um, done 74 minutes every stint, as has the Triple One Bentley, um, the Triton car. And uh, and yeah, they've, their pace hasn't been spectacular, but it hasn't been bad. And uh, you know, look at look at the progress they've made. They're just they're just going uh, going along nicely. Um, and I, uh, and again, with their flexibility of running long, they'll be able to uh, hopefully transition back towards the wet tyres um, when the when the weather starts to get worse. And again, they, you might see them pick up a, a couple more positions with that. So overall, it's going to favour the Astons for sure, coming back towards the wet tyres again. Um, their double advantage that they had earlier. Uh, where the, the fuel situation is minimised, where they can run 70 odd minute stints um, and also their wet pace uh, will come back to them. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a, an interesting transition. I'm looking forward to seeing how early some people go onto wets if they decide to just suffer the early laps uh, if they're fuel limited and go onto wet tyres a little early. 
uh, and hope they come to them and the conditions worsen. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's really intriguing. Well, thank you very, very much for that uh, update and that recap there. James Parker along with us. He'll be for the remainder of the race as well. But Alex, I mean, we've already done an hour into our stint here. And, uh, I mean, we, we kind of thought we had it all figured out. It just sort of calmed down in a nice little lull. But we've got some stunning, stunning battles all through the field. We've got here uh, Revolution Sim Racing's Michael Moross uh, defending hand over fist for the Renville and Pro uh, of uh, David McKell. But uh, the uh, 41 jumps into the uh, the pit lane from, uh, from the... the the position that he was in just now again it's it, it just another roll of the dice right now given that we're going to have an increase in rain in the next half an hour at some point i mean this is now uh this is now a proper roll of the dice for niles noyox yeah because he's spent nearly 75 minutes in that stint uh so even with that uh yeah just coming up to one hour nine minutes and 34 seconds um so yeah pretty good stint from Noyox. Uh, when you look you look at it, both he and Camera have swapped. Uh, so Camera started, then it was Noyox, Camera went back behind the wheel and then Noyox back for his uh, second stint of uh, the 24 hours um, here here on the sim grid. So, uh, but we've had a penalty just come through. Oh, um, the DV1 Triton Racing Bentley now gets a 15 second penalty and that is for contact with the number 5 of Williams Esports on lap number 104 considered avoidable contact from race control so you might be the championship you might be the championship leader um, but you can uh, you can definitely know that that's going to be a, a bit of a, a dent in the pride for DV1 Triton certainly is but this is what I was fearing uh, Florian Flair has indeed up the ante for ML MRL Sim Racing and he's all over the back of the 149 Yaz Heat uh, Pirelli machine of Mikhail Statsenko just now uh, the battle really off the McLaren's right now and it looks like Florian Flair really does have the, uh, the better of Statsenko just now and again this is a battle for 21st and 22nd place p1 jumps into pit lane just now and again now we're starting to see some real throws of the dice with those track conditions about to change very very shortly but we stay with this battle right now because at the moment Statsenko has got his claws out he is trying to hold on to what is now 19th place with uh, everything he can Nick Babin though fighting alongside I believe that might be the Audi the 137 indeed it is the MCW racing team Audi of uh, Brioni doing a cracking job to, to try and hold on but eventually succumbs to Nick Babin and uh, yeah there's there's only so much fighting that uh, Tiziano Brioni can do to hold off Nick Babin but Nick is ultimately going to uh, try and force the issue where possible but back with that battle for 19th and 20th place right now that single doing a decent job of holding on to that 19th place but uh, absolutely sends it up the inside goes Florian Flair wow from absolutely nowhere and Statsenko just goes well okay you just take that place then <laughs> like candy off of, of a baby uh, Flair just flung that one up the inside didn't he uh, so a real good uh, run through into La Source uh, just use the run of momentum coming out of the bus stop chicane and just park the car where he needed to yeah Statsenko didn't really want to fight it I think it's just um, it's about that conservation and now the server is at 6.03 p.m. and when we go into the night phase of this race David the, the the big thing that we need to discuss now is that during the night that's what you've got to really survive to get to the end of the race because we have seen it before um, in multiple 24-hour races that as long as you can survive the night and get through into what they call happy hour at the beginning as long as the weather conditions are on your side of course um, this might help uh, motivate those teams but I've just seen <laughs> I, 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 right, Simone Fidele from the 164 Aston Martin has just done a 223.445. That looks to me like a dry weather tyre on that car. <laughs> so, that, so, that, so the GTWR RHG Academy 164 4 car 
number four car, a two, uh, and we've done 117 laps. That is ridiculously rapid. Yeah, and it just shows you that the uh, the the track is drying a little bit because of the uh, the pace that the cars are doing, but not for much longer because that track temperature is actually falling now it was 28 degrees celsius it's now 27 and again it doesn't seem like much or or that big of a deal as we see danilo santoro uh going side by side i believe that is a car that is a lap up that is the uh 38 in fact that was for position that was uh, jan Willem van omen that took that place there at blanchemont that was a wild move up the inside just absolutely threw that car in and uh, santoro didn't really have much to answer for it but this is Marek Shenton again Alex you've pointed out this car time and time again uh, that was for a position but Marek Shenton into pit lane there for Racing Line Motorsport in the 191 and uh, has to change the strategy and uh, move things about but Danilo Santoro now playing catch up with uh, Jan Willem van Omen and I wonder if that Ferrari is now nursing itself to uh, its uh, inevitable pit stop coming up very, very shortly here. Yeah, um, Marek Schins had just done nearly one hour, 10 minutes in that car. So uh, just over five minutes shy of the 75 uh, minutes. Um, right, OK, someone who's now really uh, fired up. Igor Ogorodnikov is back behind the wheel of the number 41. Lada Sport Rosneft. He's just gone purple in sectors two and three. And he's just put in a personal best for two minutes, 23.4, uh, 8.1. And that was literally, David, less than 40 hundredths slower than the 164 of Simone Fideli. And, uh, oh, right, we've got a speeding in the pit lane. That is for the number 25 car. That's the pink performance Audi of Ferrier behind the wheel. Whoops. Yeah, that's that's not what you want to have happen uh, at this stage of the race, given that uh, we're less than six hours into the race. That is, uh, that's going to be a, a, a two minute loss for that team, that 25 team. And that is the, uh, of course, the number 25, as you said, that's Phil Vitt behind the wheel of that one it was Wolf Machuska I believe that brought it into pit lane so uh, I think there's going to be some some pointing fingers on the uh, the voice channels between them all over the course of the next 20 minutes on that one but again it's how quickly you can recover from that issue it's how quickly you can make amends for uh, mistakes like this and uh, nearly all of the cars in this race are going to make little hiccups like that it's just a case of trying to recover and uh, get on with it but i've got to say something that you just pointed out there the number 41 Yegor ogorodnikov back behind the wheel things are going to get spicy things are always guaranteed to be spicy uh, when Yegor is back behind the wheel and uh, again the pace that he has got in that car he's currently coming through uh, blanchemont just now is absolutely stunning he looks on it right now and uh, with up the road he's got Marek Schintz who has I believe they went into pit lane so it's going to be Chris Hartveld just up the road as well so that uh, he can catch up and I think that uh, Hartveld just into pit lane just now so Ogorodnikov oh as we oh. see Tiziano Brioni uh, making a bit of a meal on that tries to power slide the car rounds and that is very very close to a dangerous rejoin there the uh the audi gets into pit lane there but that was late on the brakes alex into the final chicane oh my goodness that was uh, probably some new virtual nomex for tiziano brioni right there and then i mean we we saw a few uh mistakes happen in the super pole uh, with the likes of andres uh in qualifying where the likes of uh, andres mesa uh, had a howler there as well um, but that was in the dry Nicolo uh, Milancini uh, in the 154 car now down in 27th position and also uh, closing again Patrick uh, Pignone uh, still behind the wheel of the number 33 Rutronic E Racing I have seen that Niles Norox has come out for a another stint I believe in the uh, in the BMW, which is confirmed on the timing tower as uh, Bilancini closing on Pignone. So the Aston goes to the left hand side of the Audi, coming onto the main part of the Kemmel straight. And again, the Aston just showing the pure pace 
of that 4 litre twin turbo V8 engine pushing out uh, the best part of well over 700 newton metres of torque from that engine uh, again just showing that the minute the Aston gets on the straightaway coming up through the exit of Radion if you're the car in front you've really really got to sort of hold on and hope that it doesn't pass you going towards the outside because that li looks to be uh, the uh, uh, the the prime line for the Aston Martins coming through Radio and going to the left hand side of the Camel Straight and just literally just passing cars like it they were standing still. Yeah, fantastic to see that. Fantastic to see that. But looking at the timing screens, it's our boy Yegor Ogorodnikov currently lighting them up on those dry tires. 223.373. But we've got four drivers in the 223. Simone Fidel, 223.7. You've then got the 125 of James Bacon, 223.7, uh, as well as uh, Igor Ogorodnikov, and there was another driver, I think it was Bastian Richter, that was into the 223s, but my goodness me, the, the track temperature dropping uh, very, very significantly, but so are the, uh, the times here, and this is starting to get quite epic as we wait with bated breath to see exactly how this uh, is all going to pan out, but at the moment, your race leader currently is some Simone Fidel in that 164 at GTWR Racing Team at number four. And being honest with you, Alex, I mean, they've, they've led from the start, apart from that early pit stop to change to the dry tyres, mm. and they've eked out the gap even more. I think that's now about, what, uh, six, seven seconds that they've taken out on that last stint there. But this number 41 outfit, definitely not one to look past in. Uh, with that gap under a minute, that is absolutely nothing. That is a, that is a drive-through penalty that uh, could be the difference with that. Especially with the long pit lane uh, configuration, because they don't go through the traditional pit lane that you would see for Formula One. They actually, have to go round through the end, uh, through the inner part of the pit lane through La Source, and that is on the right-hand side, going down the hill, that's where they've got to have their pit stops. And the drive-throughs here at Spa are can crucify you on a race absolutely crucify you so i've just seen the 194 has just pierced with sebastian hats uh, pulling it into the pits lane uh harcott has uh, just pulled the uh, triple one dv1 triton car into the race there has there is a yellow flag out and it is the number 125 that's on the approach to puon i've uh, just spotted so uh yeah, that's yellow james flags. bacon in fourth oh. place that's uh that's that's had that moment got recovered but uh yeah lost a little bit of time there and i think they've actually dropped down now so they're behind the 211 of killian ryan meaning i'm just trying to check what other cars that he's fallen behind there uh but certainly he's gone down into a fifth in fact he's away down into sixth place uh, because that's going to allow bassin richter up into fifth as well so james bacon oh my goodness me that is uh I, I, from the looks of it that's been an unassisted moment yeah yeah so uh yeah that's they're just coming through stavlo and i can confirm that bastian richter uh, is now ahead of james bacon the greasy conditions are uh, not helping uh, james bacon at a... and uh yeah it's and it looks like james bacon actually lost it through no name on 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 the slick tyre, so there's probably uh, a little bit, maybe he's picked up a little bit of damage, but uh, mounting the sausage curve there on the uh, right hand side, but manages to uh, take it nice and uh, neatly through. Now, he was the one that was, uh, everyone was cheering on in the chat on Thursday night uh, in the Super Bowl and actually didn't set a lap time because he invalidated it by exceeding track limits. Uh, but to still see that car in the top 10, nearly in the top five, well, was in the top five until that moment there for James Bacon. Um, you know, he might be kicking himself a little bit, but he's just got to pick himself up, dust himself off and get back and, uh, and keep pushing. Absolutely, and that, again, we've said this so many times, uh, is going to be the story of the race through so far. But the story right now is the 164 GTWR Racing Team number four of Simone Fidel uh, alongside Andrea Miato, Michael Loromagnoli and Gianluca Rossi. They are out in front and they're commanding out in front right now with a gap of, what's that, 53.8 seconds right now over Lada Rosneft team's 
uh, Yegor Ogorodnikov in the uh, number 41 machine alongside Grigory Ivanov, uh, Denis Grabovsky and Kirill Antonov. So we watch with bated breath with this. But we're watching right now as Marek Shintz uh, in the 191 motorsport machine uh, on the back of a Ferrari. Is that Thibaut Prost that's actually in front of him? No, that is the number 27 that is in front of him. So that is a car that is uh, several uh, or at least a lap down. That's Luca Lozio that is in that Ferrari. They are just one lap down, but Marek Schentz moves to the uh, left-hand side down into Le Coombe. But here we go then. This is going to be a replay of uh, the 125 of James Bacon. Uh, runs wide out of the corner. Gets a little bit of a wiggle on, a clip and some some damage on that right-hand side. Now nudge onto the front end of that car to, to good measure. And uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be, Alex, I think about, what, 15 seconds? Maybe no more than that of damage onto that car. But certainly... That's not what you want from your uh, first couple of laps on your stint. Yeah, and the good thing was, uh, Niles Noyox actually uh, came through the shot there as well, I believe. So, uh, managed to keep out of harm's way. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a bit of discussion about the weather in the chat, saying, well, it's been pretty much racing, uh, raining all the time, as uh, Florian Fleer now closing in on uh, Beerman. So, Jan Beerman and, uh, has just been passed... Uh, that was pretty easy there, but I'm, I'm sort of like looking at it from this perspective because Beerman's now going to try and fire it around the outside of uh, Bruxelles the, uh, and nearly gets, well, gets as close as he dares, but then uh, Fleer just keeps it in front. And then they've got the pink performance car, the uh, number 25 Audi just up ahead. So uh, this is where things are going to get a little bit tetchy, so to speak, because now Florian Fleer's got to circumnavigate his way through uh, backmarker traffic just up ahead. And uh, Jan Beermann will be looking to strike at a moment's notice if the opportunity presents itself as one of the Aston Martins goes very, very exit stage right coming through Blanchimont and absolutely missing the apex of that corner by a country mile. I guess that's one way to keep yourself out of... Uh out of harm's way with the, uh, the the traffic coming through as well but that 25 would have been praying that they would have been in a, a better position uh, to, to keep themselves in the fight but at the moment the 25 of pink performance down in 38th position we know they had the, the, the pace to do so much better than that but Phil Vick currently behind the wheel just now and uh, trying to keep himself out of mischief just now and that looks like uh, it's a Ferrari that he is hunting down at the moment because we're still seeing Florian Flair looks to the inside two cars going into the chicane this has high high drama potential a little bit of contact there from the pink performance car I think that's the uh, 137 that they're involved with as well and again that car I believe is a uh, is a lap up is that the 157 actually that uh, they're, they're fighting no it is the uh, the 137 i think that's alessio ivan puskedi that uh, is fighting with it just now and this is this is some high risk moments right here for florian flair in the mrl uh, sim racing machine because this could all go wrong very very quickly thankfully it's all hands on deck and everybody thinks better of it but uh, on to the uh, number 25 now Nick Babineau for Carbon Sim Sport on against the uh, the Bentley that is for 16th position and he is fighting Ben Machazzi in the 194 I believe that is alongside him just now this is picture in picture so this is indeed the battle for 16th and 17th place down through Eau Rouge and then up through Radion and again the McLaren just going to have to tuck into the slipstream of the Boatley uh, very app name for these conditions now talking of the conditions Alex we've had an update it is going to get even heavier now for the next half an hour in the next 10 minutes we're going to see the rain start to increase and it's going to keep that way for the next half hour so the greasy condition you've got to say is going to turn back to damp and then potentially too wet so the, the guys that are on the, uh, the wet weather setup now are going to be absolutely rubbing their hands together yeah the, uh, there's going to be a new chapter formed, I think, very soon with the way that these weather conditions are going to rapidly deteriorate. Um, and again, it will be a case of where is the cutoff point? When will uh, when will drivers and teams decide to rethink their strategy over the next 18 hours and 50 minutes? As Florian Fleer uh, keeping it in 11th position, that's the number 77 MRL Sim Racing McLaren. 
Uh, we've now seen that there is a drive-through penalty. Well, there was a drive. Uh, I think I, was, I probably might have seen double there, maybe. But Florian Fleer, um, that car started in 19th, uh, up to 11th position. It looks like there's another penalty coming in. Oh, there is a uh, drive-through penalty coming through and it looks like that there is an unsafe rejoin penalty uh, that has been uh, given and this is uh, courtesy of an incident on lap 118 now uh, it says here that the uh, it's drive through penalty for car 121 or was that the 211 that is my <laughs> that is my biggest uh, that could be probably for Odox Motorsport, which would be if that's an unsafe rejoin on their particular uh, part. So if it is one to one, two, one then uh, yeah, that's the people that finished in second position last time out. So that could be from bad to worse for the Audi crew. Yeah, certainly could, certainly could. You're watching live coverage then of round two of the SimGrid VCO World Cup here from Spa, Frank Jam, David Christie and Alex Goldschmidt bring you all of the coverage. And uh, I think it's uh, just time to, to head over for a very short ad break. As sim racers, we always want full focus. One single mistake might cost us the race. We're always improving our skills, our tactics, our consistency, being better than the competition. However, we sometimes forget to upgrade ourselves. That's why we created Q-Focus, an all-natural focus booster without caffeine. The formula is specifically designed to keep us calm and razor sharp during a race. My name is Alex. I'm a sim racer and the co-founder of the performance nutrition brand Gallo. We want to empower sim racers to reach their full potential. Go to gallo.com slash simgrid to find out more.
So a very warm welcome back ladies and gentlemen, 18 hours and 45 minutes left to go in the SimGrid VCO World Cup race number two. David Christie and Alex Goldschmidt here with you for the next two and a bit hours and what a stint we have had so far. We've had the thought, we've had the tease to us that it might have been getting a little bit brighter, it might have been getting a little bit better but now the, uh, the gods have decided to say, no, we're going to have a little bit more rain. Quite how much, we don't know. We're going to find out along with you guys on the stream over the next half an hour. But it is Simone Fidel for the number 164 GTWR racing team number four out in front, as they have done all throughout this race, Alex. And I've got to say, they're looking very comfortable at the front. Yeah, um, just keep your eyes again on the on the 191 car. Marek Shin's still behind the wheel. Uh, that car has just put in a 2 minute 23.25. Uh, and from what I understand, uh, James Parker told me during the air break, it looks like they're on a dry weather setup. So the minute that the, uh, the track starts drying, that car will get quicker and quicker. So still after 125 or 126 laps now completed, Thanks to uh, GTWR RHG Academy's uh, Simone Fideli, who leads by 51.3 seconds ahead of Igor Ogorodnikov from Lada Sport Rosneft in the 41 Aston Martin. Still pretty impressive pace thus far. Sure is, sure is. And uh, it's a difficult one because at the moment, Ogorodnikov in that number 41 Lada Rosneft team car kind of caught in no man's land. But what I will say is that that gap is coming down gradually lap by lap so i wonder if there's tires to to be at uh, issue here or if it's a little bit of pace management going on for that gtwr number four car out in front because that gap was 54 seconds and over the space of five to eight laps it's now down to 50 seconds as well granted uh, there's some lap traffic but Fidel is in in clear air right now and ogorodnikov now has about four cars in front of him and still managing to lap about three tenths of a lap, uh, three tenths of a second uh, quicker. Yeah, I think um, sometimes with backmarker traffic, it can be one of two things: it'll either be a help or it'll be a hindrance. And especially, it can be a really good help because sometimes if the the two of those three cars are literally lying astern, battling for position ahead of Ogorodnikov, he can possibly get a double toe because those two cars are punching. Uh, sort of like a double bubble through the dirty air ahead and that will give Ogorodnikov probably a little bit of instability on the rear end because um, you know there's less of an aerodynamic property you know you it literally go to nigh on a low downforce setup uh, once the two cars in front are punching that hole through that dirty air so you just got to be like literally on the ragged edge but not so close to it that you're going to overstep the mark and maybe have a moment going into the braking zone for the next corner We'll have to keep our eyes and hope that doesn't happen. Patrick Pignon, meanwhile, I can see is into pit lane just now for his stop, uh, as well as several other cars right now. I believe the uh, the one two one into the uh, the pit lane as well, and uh, that is of course Gerard Martinez, a mayor that is uh, currently there. This is Ben Smachazzi for Racing Line Motorsport, the sister car to the 191. This is the 194, currently down in 15th position. And uh, is that Nick Babin just in front? It is, so that was a great exit from the corner from Machazzi. And uh, that McLaren looking a little bit slower. We did see that uh, the McLaren of Nick Babin was doing very, very well pace-wise. Uh, did a 2.25.0 at that last lap round, but uh, 224 for Machazi, and this looks like it's going to be a very, very short battle indeed. Yeah, I've just noticed a little bit of a trend happening with the 995. Jan Beerman's back in the pit lane after just over 55 and three quarter minutes. The previous hint, 14 minutes 20, and then 38 minutes 50 on the previous one. And to be honest with you, at the moment, um, Henry Gambal did the first two stints. Beerman has been in that car for an incredibly long period of time, probably close to three hours in that car. So Beerman's been a bit of a workhorse for the 995 for XL Racing by Van Velten in that Aston Martin so far. And it's all about that. It's about making the most of your quick drivers and knowing when you can actually uh, put them in. 
but uh, yeah, a great, great thing to see and uh, we're still watching this battle here from Benz Majazzi in that racing line Motorsport 194. The gap that was there to Nick Babin was closed up quite significantly as we uh, have a look at uh, Andrea Capoccia still fighting off uh, Giorgio Simonini for the GTWR R8G Academy car in that Audi, that 157 Audi. This is the run down through uh, Eau Rouge and then up through uh, Radion. Oh, and a little bit of sideways action from Andrea Capoccia in that Yaz Heat McLaren really compromised out the exit of the corner and Giorgio Simonini I don't think he's going to have an easier overtaking opportunity thrown at him through the uh, course of today but Capoccia all the credit there going into Lecombe forced him through the uh, long way there but uh, yeah brilliant brilliant move there and a little wiggle there from Simonini as they go side by side through the corner there yeah uh, third in the championship uh, after you know dramas last time out at Mount Panorama, um, suffering an incident with uh, one of the walls, if memory serves me correctly. But uh, you know they, they've got quite a considerable amount of um, you know uh, they, they they've got to try and get back on, on onto it. And it, and it looks like David, I've just seen the weather. The rain is going to increase in about half an hour's time. So when we're just on the verge of hitting six hours completed in this race, the rain looks to be intensifying. Oh, and I've just heard. Uh, now, there's a bit of a bombshell for you. Um, first DNF of the race, and it is Odox Motorsport that I think have just uh, pulled uh, the plug on their race after just nearly five and a half hours. Yeah, we, we hate seeing any retirement from any team and that's that's particularly uh, disappointing we saw Gerard Martinez and Mayer into the uh, the pit lane but uh, yeah that is uh, a DNF from them and yeah you hate to see it that rain you can see there starting to come down a little bit heavier and look at how dark those clouds are here at uh, Spa Francorchamps uh, with the time hitting 6.31 virtual time here at the track and uh, again the track temperature now down 27 degrees but that air temperature still holding at 26 degrees celsius and you can see the rain start to fall a little bit heavier this is going to be perfect of course for that 164 because of their current strategy simone fidel they're uh, 38 minutes into their stint so they're about maybe 20 minutes 30 minutes away from going for a pit stop and that is going to tie in from when the uh, the conditions start to change quite heavy yeah um, they they could have played that could have been a really good roll of the dice for the 164 uh, the GTWR uh, car the number four car which has got um, Romagnoli, Miato, Fedeli and uh, Rossi uh, in that crew uh, a full complement of four drivers so Simonini closing in once again on Capoccia going through the exit of uh, Kemmel straight down into Le Corme and now down the hill into uh, Rivage so yeah I mean I think um, you know really good to to see the new announcement obviously that Andy Bakuna talked to Giorgio Simonini with on uh, on th on Thursday night before qualifying got underway obviously uh, now being partnered with um, R8G Academy uh, part of the uh, Roman Grosjean Esports uh, stable now and to help bring new talent in uh, especially with the Assetto Corsa Competizione uh, platform and Roman Grosjean quoted in the press uh, earlier uh, you know when the announcement was made very very happy about making this new alignment and um, you know hopefully we could see some really good new uh, talents coming through into GTWR R8G in, in the months and years to come but they've got a very very big mountain to, to climb and, and that's not uh, forgetting the one going through Eau Rouge and into Radion here at Spa. And it's fantastic to see the uh, the real life drivers and real life brands associating themselves with these uh, these academies, these these proving grounds for uh, you know aspiring sim racers and proven sim racers as well. Again, it's just another one of those things. As you can see, conditions looking really really miserable here uh, through the the latter half of the circuit here at Blanchemont. But um, it just adds that air of uh, authenticity and credibility 
to sim racing uh, we we see that from many different angles from the uh, the the brand partners that come on board with the the various competitions and how how much bigger sim racing seems to get year on year and it's just a, another wonderful little brick in this wall that we are we are building here uh, and and doing our part here at the uh, the sim grids to uh, to to be a part of it as well but um back to the race as well though as Giorgio Simonini still trying to throw everything but the kitchen sink at Andrea Capoccia as they come down through Orouge and then up through Radion. I've got to say, I mean, Capoccia doing a cracking job of holding on in that uh, Yaz Heat Pirelli uh, McLaren just now doing a great job there. But again, you just feel it's a matter of time right now as uh, going down into Lake It looks like a little bit of action further up as well. I believe that is uh, a car that's uh, a lap down that's involved in that one. That is uh, one of the Aston Martins for sure. But, uh, I mean, conditions going to be changing. The, the sky turning uh, almost purple with rain. Uh, it, it just looks very, very foreboding for a lot of these drivers. And, Alex, if, if you're a, a team principal right now, what are you thinking? Do you let your car stay on the dries or are you uh, thinking about changing to the wets at this point? I think um, it's a difficult one to say, uh, but it's, it's on that precipice. And what you've got to look at is is how the weather's going to come in over the next 30 minutes. What lap times is the driver currently behind the wheel doing? What is everyone else doing? Can you maybe assumptively guess what they're going to do? I mean, you know, looking at, say, for instance, uh, Fidelli still doing in, in the 226, is the, the slick tyres are starting to drop off. So... I might chance it, and if that weather is going to come in and come in hard in about half an hour's time, I think I might want to do this, the the better option, not go, not not go onto the dry weather tyres, but I think probably go onto wets and then sort of ride out the storm that's about to come. Uh, see, I'm I'm a I'm a different mindset for since there's you know at least twenty minutes of uh, of changeable weather coming up. I'd be tempted to just fire on and just now. If I'm doing 226s, jump in the pits, put on another set of drives for just now. Because when you look at, say, the number 14, uh, the Unicorns of Love, uh, Yura Petrochenko, they're still doing personal best, 223.9. So the pace is still there for just now. And then I give it, say, 20 minutes, half an hour. You know, we've seen that the cars can gingerly keep on pace with the wet weather tyres. Um, and it looks like it's going to be moderate rain that's, that we've got in the next half hour. I think you'd be safe. And again, this is my uneducated commentator's brain thinking here. Um, to, to jump on another set of drives, keep the, the, the pace there. And potentially, if you're further back, if you're in the top 10, maybe make up a couple of positions by trying to roll the dice on strategy. Yeah, very, very true. Well, uh, in about 33 minutes, we're actually going to have... Uh, the first interval points awarded here at the Thrustmaster. Uh, 24 hours of Spa Francorchamps here, live and uninterrupted. Round two of the SimGrid VCO World Cup. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from. I mean, we've got, we got very two very different opinions. And you know what the first thing that we haven't done is? We haven't gotten into a full-blown argument about it. We can agree to disagree, but we can do it in the... It, in a very sincere and very, very adult-like fashion. You know, it's. I think it's my impending old age, Alex, but I, I have to absolutely agree with you on that one. It's, it's maybe because I've seen so many times lately where, you know, uh, heated arguments over different opinions, and that's exactly what it is. And we see it all the time in, in our YouTube chat, for example. You know, that's the whole point of our YouTube chat, is this, is this bubbling pot of excitement and passion and opinions and and viewpoints and things like that and not everybody's going to agree with what you say and you know there's plenty of times alex where you you and me disagree on something but it's about having that uh, that that respect and and also being able to take yourself out of it and this is the most difficult part point of it but it's actually putting yourself in that other person's perspective and thinking, well, why are they thinking that? What what could be that? And, and quite often lately, when I put myself in that other person's perspective, 
I start seeing things that I wasn't thinking of, and I, again, that's what we're uh, we're seeing here. Is we've got yellow flags there, and I think that was the number twenty one that was caught up in the chicane there. That is uh, Lindner in that uh, WPS racing team, Vincent Lindner, that brought out the yellow flags there. Probably just locked it up under braking, going into the uh, the final chicane there. Gets going again and uh, keeps going on. So there we go. Uh, race control incident between cars two eleven and one three seven on. Uh, that was lap 138 there, and uh, that was deemed that it was a drive through penalty for car 137 for an unsafe rejoin. So that is the MCW racing team, and I think that was, uh, wasn't that Tiziano Brioni that went off yeah, and we saw and, them and that, spinning the wheels back on the track? Yeah, and that was actually in front of Cymax Motorworks. That was the 211, our pole sitter. That because the way that um, Brioni just lit up the rear tyres on that MCW racing Audi, he nearly went into the path of Sidemax Motorworks, uh, the JLO team, um, and that could have been a bit of a fright for the uh, for the pole sitters. But um, Giorgio Simonini is uh, now trying to close up on cars. Now he's trying to actually unlap himself, and of all the cars, it's the number four car from GTWRRAG Academy with Fideli behind the wheel, and Simonini will want to get past. And I'm just going to have a look at the lap times. Uh, Fideli currently on the 2 minute 27.1s. Simonini, 7 tenths of a second quicker on that previous tour. And uh, this is uh, sort of compromising Simonini because at the moment Capoccia is uh, getting away and is just under 7.5 ten tenths of a second ahead of the uh, current reigning and defending champions who came into this round third in the overall standings. Uh, so yeah, this this is now an opportunity for Simonini. If he's not going to be let past, he's going to have to get his way past that car. Oh, this is this has got awkward written all over it. Uh, the 157 of Giorgio Simonini currently trying to fight down or hunt down your uh, race leader Simone Fidel and try to unlap this. Is Marco Bischoff side by side along with the Audi of Vincent Lindner takes that position, gets it done before the chicane and that was made to look so so easy but back to this battle between the GTWR cars then and Simonini I, I fear is going to have to just sit and wait behind this uh, 164 car uh, Fidel doing a 227-1 that last lap round let's see what he does as he comes across the line just now and yeah that is 227-2 two, and Simonini is absolutely fizzing right now. You can imagine because 2.26.4 for Simonini. And there's three cars going down. Oh, Rouge. Oh, my goodness me. I've got a horrible feeling in my stomach about that's this Linda. one. That's Linda. That's Linda. That's just, they just got past Linda in the uh, in the 21 car going out of La Source. So Linda um, must have had a bit of a moment there. So that means Simonini is uh, up into what will be 25th position and now has no cars in front of him between him and Andrea Capoccia in the 149 Yaz Heat Pirelli car so there we go he's got the move done he's unlapped himself so Simonini ahead of your race leader and uh, Simone Fidel has to, to just sort of tuck in the slipstream and think better of it and again now we see Simonini unleashed this is where we're going to see the uh, the conditions play uh, a, a little bit of havoc with uh, the fact that Simonini will be getting blue flags left, right and centre with the fact that uh, Fidel right on the tail. And Fidel, did you see that coming out of the corner there? All four wheels lit up with that Aston Martin. And that Aston Martin is now, it's it's I think it's worn through its tyres, bubbled through. Really, really greedy on the throttle out of that corner there. And I'll tell you what, it's moments like that that could be the uh, deciding factor of the race because all it takes is a little bit of loss in concentration and you're into the wall. Yeah, yeah, that was very, very, very close indeed. But uh, uh, Matiasi uh, closing in on Nick Babin. Now, this is the battle for position. The 194 from Racing Line again back up into the lower part of the top 15. Uh, Matiasi now closing, he's trying to go around the outside going through into Rivage, now into the left-hander. Uh, next up, the Bentley's got the real good run on the McLaren, so Nick Babin from Carbon Simsport in the 720, uh, making the rear axle of that McLaren 720S GT3 as wide as humanly possible. Now they're going to go down towards the double left here at Pouon, 
And what's more, Niles Noyox has come to join the party. So a three-way scrap between these drivers. So it's uh, McLaren versus Bentley versus BMW. Cracking, cracking little battle that we've got going on just now. And uh, Machazi doing his very, very best to catch back onto the tail of Nick Babin. But again, Babin doing a great job of just making that, that uh, machine as wide as it needs to be. But look at the background, Niles Noyox. He's waiting very, very patiently as well in that BMW. He could be waiting for a mistake between Nick Babin and between uh, Machazi in that 194 Bentley as well. Certainly in the, the decent position for it. But again, it's all going to come down to, to patience. I think Machazi is going to try and make a move on the entry into uh, to turn one potentially. But we'll uh, we'll keep our eyes on that and uh, have a look. But pace-wise, uh, your your top four have fallen off a cliff. Yigor uh, Ogorodnikov, the only man to to kind of hold on with a 225.3, but it's now 227.8 for your race leader. Hang on a minute. Do you know what I've just realised, Alex? Remember about 20 minutes ago, half an hour ago, I said that gap was about 50 seconds and it went down to about <laughs> 47. That gap is now 39.9 seconds. This isn't pace control. This isn't race control from Simone Fidel. This is him fighting for his life and for the race lead. Yeah, and uh, Igor Ogorodnikov has got the fire in his belly. 2 minute 25.3. He was close to being nearly two and a half seconds quicker and Simone Fideli. So uh, has anyone got the Jaws music round about now? Because that seems rather appropriate for Igor Ogorovnikov because he's absolutely flying uh, at this particular moment. And um, I'm just gonna, just sort of keeping my eyes on, on the timing screens. I mean, Ogorovnikov was at nearly a tenth and a half quicker in the third and final sector as we are fast approaching the completion of 135 laps so far. So at the moment, um, Ogorodnikov's making his way through into Puon as Michael O'Brien, now behind the wheel of the 22 Rocket Simsport car, gets past uh, uh, Smolazic in the uh, 111. And that's going through in Telecom. So Rocket Simsport qualified, courtesy of Jack McIntyre, down in 26 position. And have also made uh, some good inroads. So 10 positions gained. Uh, Michael O'Brien, a real-life uh, racing driver in his own right, races uh, in McLaren machinery, um, and uh, and uh, oh my goodness me, Fidelli's tyres are dropping. Yeah, his pace is absolutely off the edge there, 229.1 there. But I do have to also say, we saw it very briefly on the screen there. What a move from the number 62 BMW Team G2 Esports from Niles Noyox firing it up the inside of that Bentley of Machazi there going into Lecombe. Stunning, stunning move and uh, very, very worthy indeed. Great move there as we see Benz Machazi uh, having to fight off. Is that an Audi uh, that they're trying to get past here just now? But that track is the same. It's, it's looking a bit wonky, isn't it? It's starting to look a little bit wetter there. Uh, the track temperature now down to 26 degrees. That's the 33 uh, of, uh, let's have a look who that is just now. That's that the uh, Rutronic e racing that... Oh my goodness me. That's... Uh, that... You, 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 you know you know what's really funny we keep on talking about this gap as now you can actually see that uh, and some uh, Matiasi uh, getting past uh, that well that was Patrick Pignoni from Rutronic E-Racing and Niles Noyox and Nick Babin have actually galloped away into the distance and Noyox is trying to hunt down Nick Babin at the moment and in terms of the lap times between them uh, Noyox was slightly slower uh, Matiasi actually did a 2 minute 28.9 on the previous tour as now here comes uh, Unicorns of Love's very own Yura Petrichenko who put the car on P3 after the Super Pole session on Thursday night just under two tenths of a second behind uh, the number 28 car and that's the WPS racing team of Luca Weidelich uh, and now it is Aston Martin v Audi Heading into the right-hander at Lefan. Petrichenko had a bit of a look up there. Stuck his nose out of, as if to say to Valdelich, right, okay, I'm here. Get ready for some scrap. Uh, get, get ready for a bit of a scrap. Now they're going to head through into the double right here at Stavlo. Um, and I think now that uh, through Blanchimart is where Petrichenko will size up the move and put it up the inside. 
It's certainly possible because look at the run that Petrochenko gets on the exit of that corner, tucked in behind Feidelich. They're going to be side by sides to come through. But, oh my goodness me, round Blanchemont. And as easy as you like, like uh, Feidelich isn't even on the same track. Petrochenko moves up to P9 for Unicorns of Love. Great move into the chicane. Done, dusted, and not even a sweat broken for the unicorns. I love back with Niles Noyux, though, who gets ahead of Nick Babin as well. Well, my goodness me, Nick Babin has obviously had a bit of a moment there as well, because that now means that Niles Noyox moves up into, is that even a P10, a P11 now that's going to be, because I think that's Florian Fleer that uh, is just ahead. Yeah, so Florian Fleer away up the road there, but Nick Babin now drops down into that 12th position, and this is Marco Bischoff for Ambassadors for Renfeld. Fantastic recovery drive for the 995. They were down at the back of the pack for a little bit there, getting back up into 21st position. Uh, currently hunting down the number 27 of Luca Lotto for Giornalese Esports Academy. And these track conditions now starting to get uh, a little bit dicey there. That last lap round from uh, Simone Fidel, 227.8. So again, uh, the pace is just dropping off and that's now 34 seconds between him and uh, uh, Igor Ogorodnikov as we uh, watch Bischoff getting round the outside of Luka Lazio. Again, very straightforward move. That was that was what it was made to look like. But Alex, we know from experience, it's the ones that look simple that take the hardest work. Well, I'm just going to bring something to your attention here, David. Uh, Killian Ryan Meenan in third place in the 211 Sidemax Motorworks JLO team is losing time and he's got lap times happening at around about the same sort of time as uh, Fidele. Two in it, 27.5, but James Bacon is closing up on him as well. And Bacon last time around was just under half a second quicker. And um, yeah, I think basically what Fidele and uh, Ryan Meenan have to do is pray and hope that the rain does intensify as Andrea Capoccia. So you can see on the weather report uh, up in the top right hand corner that uh, the rain will intensify again in about half an hour's time. Track temperature now uh, 26 degrees Celsius. As that looks to be that, uh, there we go, there is Simonini now up into 23rd position. And he's absolutely uh, not shades out of that gap between himself and Andrea Capoccia and Simonini has got past the 32 that's the uh, that's the, the the number three car for GTWR R8 uh, R8G Esports uh, so that would be uh, Tibor Prop, uh, Probst uh, on that particular occasion so Simonini gunning for Capoccia and we've still got over 18 and a quarter hours still to go it's it, the thing is is that this is what i love about endurance racing especially 24 hour david that things start building and building and building and building and keep going up and up um i think when we hit the crescendo tomorrow <laughs> um yeah that's when the fireworks are really going to be set off and that won't be after the checkered flag that will be beforehand Oh, for sure, for sure. But you do get the impression that something is building up in the terms of, for the next half an hour, something quite spectacular is going to go and uh, potentially change the uh, the course of this race. Can't put my finger on it yet, but this pace that Igor Ogorodnikov has got right now, taking two seconds every single lap, at least, two, it was two and a half seconds last lap round, uh, every single lap of Simone Fidel, I mean, that that is frightening frightening difference in pace that we've got going on right now but it's not just Igor Ogorodnikov I mean look at Killian Ryan Meenan as you pointed out about a lap and a half ago uh, James Bacon down there as well incredible incredible pace that those those uh, have got but again Simone Fidel I wonder if by coming in early if those tyres are starting to blister and starting to, uh, to, to go well past their best yeah, very much the case as I've now seen that Ryan Meenan and Bacon are now heading down in towards Le Com, and it's not that much between them. The gap between them last time was probably about the best part of what, 1.8 seconds as they're going through Le Com, and then they'll go through uh, down to the uh, bottom of the hill, down to uh, the bottom of the uh, descent through into Rivage, and there is James Bacon. Uh, 
Chris Hartfelt actually uh, then says in the chat, I wonder if we were even going to get any dry conditions at all. Well, Chris, your guess is as good as ours today, my friend. Uh, and it looks like the streaky bacon emojis have hit the chat again, courtesy of Amanda Rice as well. Cheering on James Bacon as, uh, oh, now I've just seen it dr drive through for the number 32. That's the GTWR uh, R8G Academy uh, car with uh, Tibor Prost behind the wheel. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, not a good sign. And they were in, they're, they're in P8 at the moment. And uh, they started P13. So they didn't even make it into the top 10 Super Pole. And the only car that actually made it into, uh, that has made it into two successive... Oh! Dramas for Simonini! Trying to go up the inside of Capoccia through the exit of Lecom. Oh my goodness, the defending champions again having dramas. And that was not what Simonini needed. Uh, nor would it have been what he wanted. Says he's really trying to force it up the inside because that is a, a car that is... Uh, is that a lap down car that is uh, just coming on the back of him? It is. It's Alexandre Vromant that is uh, forcing the issue, trying to get himself on lap there. So Simonini, after all that great work, is now absolutely in no man's land here. And this is going from bad to worse for the number 157 because he's got the 123 up the inside as well. And, uh, of course, that is the the uh sorry excuse me that is the uh the one two three that is uh, just behind him and uh of philippe simard wow that is uh, not exactly what you want to happen uh, or have happened with 18 hours and 15 minutes left to go uh, nick babin under all sorts of pressure right now from machazzi in that carbon simsport mclaren at the scene of the uh, accident that we just saw about uh 20 to 30 seconds ago but that was a heck of a catch I've got to say uh, around the outside of Lecum for those two drivers and uh, I think he's going to be breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief is uh, Andrea Capoccia uh, to get her out of that one and Simonini wow I mean this is just absolute craziness given that there's so long left to go Alex I mean some some drivers starting to take moves that are uh, yeah, a little bit eyebrow raising to say the least yeah uh, <laughs> and that's what we can politically correctly say on this broadcast because uh, now Simonini uh, will be fired up and will want to get back uh, up towards uh, Capoccia but then the, the biggest thing is is that he's got the 92 of uh, Vroman just up ahead and uh, oh now Right, the number 38 car, the Dalkin Community car, which has got uh, Sean Arnold behind the wheel, has got a 15-second for, for time penalty coming their way. We've also had another penalty issued, actually, for car number 32, which is the one that we were just mentioning. This was for avoidable contact with car 21, and that was WPS. So that would have been with Lindner a bit earlier on in the race. Uh, so they get a uh, drive-through penalty for avoidable contact and um, one of the other things that I've noticed is that the track has now uh, gone to damp from Greasy and what's more David there's an eight kilometer an hour wind and uh, just by with the onboard here on Nick Babin it's actually uh, it's a headwind down the main start finish straight coming out of the bus stop chicane yeah, it's uh, going to be interesting to see, actually, because that, that wind has picked up massively. It was only about one to two kilometres an hour uh, when we picked up onto the uh, the, the, the stream. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that does tend to lend itself to changeable conditions. So don't be surprised if we see that getting even worse. Uh, Nick Babin's day is going from bad to worse because look at that big bad Bentley round the outside trying to uh, get that move done but he thinks better of it, tucks into the slipstream and look at the lights now starting to reflect onto the track, shows you how dark things are really getting here and Machazi thinks about it into Lecum, ducks back in to take another drink of that slipstream from the 720 McLaren but my goodness me this is uh, some real nerves on display just now and uh, with the darkness impending I mean it looks like it is going to start heaving it down over the next half an hour again we've been saying that for the past 
15-20 minutes but again we just go on the weather reports that the uh, the simulation gives us we don't get any advance notice uh, that the, that you guys at home don't see as well so we're in this journey with you as well but 18 hours and 11 minutes left to go we enter uh, what's that five past six in UK time just now so 18 hours left to go Alex and uh, this is uh, this is this is craziness. 15 second penalty for Philippe Simard. Um, I wonder if oh. that's anything to do with uh, uh, fighting his way past back. Uh, so that was uh, yeah. with uh, car 21. Yeah, car 21, which was uh, WPS. Um, you've also got another one uh, that is for the 38. And that was actually on uh, the Sim Racing Masterclass car. That was for uh, aggressive driving on lap number 130. Um, as Florian Fleer, I've just noticed, in the 77 car, has just pulled the McLaren from MRL Sim Racing into the uh, into the pits. Another familiar name uh, that you people should know out there. Nick Baltzer is behind. Uh, well, is one of the four drivers in this uh, this uh, in this field here today at the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. Um, and again, the track temperature now has dropped to 25 degrees Celsius, matching the ambient air temperature. So tyre pressures will also come into play very, very soon, David, because when we get to sort of about 8, 9 o'clock on the server, the temperatures will start to plummet. And the guessing game, uh, the Russian roulette of uh, finding out what tyre pressures you're going to need is going to be rather crucial because you've got to nail it on the first try. Oh my, this is starting to get very, very exciting indeed. The weather has updated itself. It's now solid rain for the next 30 minutes. It's going to increase gradually as well. So this track is going to get very, very wet indeed. So you can see the track changing from greasy to damp. And look at the colour of those clouds above. So we are in for uh, a little bit of a, uh, a difficult evening or start to the evening here at Spa. And that gap between Simone Fidel and Yigor Okanodikov coming down even more. Morris under 30 seconds, 26.8 seconds it is that last time round. Ogorodnikov still doing 227.2s and Fidel doing 229 flat. So that gap is coming down in chunks at a time. And that means that that is now going to be 12 uh, 12 and a half second, 12 and a half laps there. But the battle for third place and fourth place also uh, between Killian Ryan Meenan and uh, James Bacon. That is kicking off quite massively as well. We see it here as uh, James Bacon into the, uh, the ahead of uh, Killian Ryan Meenan. And uh, yeah, Killian Ryan Meenan was uh, in that third spot for considerable, uh, considerable gap. Now, Alex, the 194 Bentley, that is, of course, the Racing Line Motorsport uh, 194 of uh, Ben Machazzi that was behind the wheel. They've mm -hmm. they've jumped ship. They're on the wet tyres already. So uh, a 46 minute stint from uh, what the what has now officially become the boat because it's gone on wet weather tyres. That's a brave call. That is a very oh, very brave call. Alex, what has happened to Simone? Oh, he's into the pit. So I was panicking there because that gap. I just saw the gap down to 19, uh, 17 seconds, and Simone Fidel, now your race leader, into the pit lane. You know what this means? Having started ninth nearly, what was it, six hours ago, Lada Sport Rosneft will be in the lead of this race. Who would have thought this? I mean, it's been a great effort. I mean, the thing is, if I was Fidelli right now, they've got to go wet. They've got, they've got to put that strategy out there and go on wet weather tyres. But it's about how much longer Ogorodnikov is going to stay out in that vehicle. And the moment Yigor has been out in that car for just over 61 minutes, so maybe stay out there for maybe another five to six minutes, depending on how bad the weather conditions deteriorate over the next 10 minutes before the deluge really happens. So it's about how Lada Sport Rosneft respond to the 164. So Fideli is on wet. Uh, so uh, we'll see we'll then have to see what the pace is from the 164 Aston Martin and how Lada Sport Rosneft respond it is now down to what happens for uh, 
when Igor Ogorodnikov decides to pit, the number 41, and now James Bacon and uh, Key and Ryan Meenan find themselves rounding out the top three, and with 18 hours and 6 minutes and 50 seconds to go, top eight lockout for Aston Martin. Yeah, it's back to as it was uh, just a couple of hours ago for the Aston Martins. The wet weather conditions turning the balance of favour into their uh, their preference right now. But it's all eyes right now on Igor Ogorodnikov in the 41 Lada Rosneft machine coming through Blanchemont. Because if he can keep his pace at 227s, uh, no doubt that, that that will take massive chunks out of that gap in the lead. So he's just coming up to the chicane just now. Um, we'll uh, we'll see what he can do into the uh, the next lap here. If he can, like say, if he can keep it 227, 228, uh, I don't think so. Uh, 227, 7 for Igor Ogorodnikov. So he goes across the line there, down in towards the uh, the first run. In fact, it's Ogorodnikov into uh, pit lane because the 911 has caught up on him quite quickly there. No, he's not. He's still out on track just now. So 227.7 for Igor Ogorodnikov. Uh, we'll wait with bated breath to see what Simone Fidel can do on a fast lap here. But at the moment, no signs of slowing down from Igor. Yeah, and uh, good to see our good friend Mr. McGlade in the chat again. He said, getting wet? Damn. I went, yep. <laughs> it's not going to be an easy Thrustmaster 24 hours as far well for those out on track and also for us in the commentary uh, box as well um, because we will be heading to uh, part two of the broadcast. Um, on the official SimGrid channel. Uh, don't forget, we have got some affiliate links that you can uh, get some uh, goodies from, uh, such as your three months free at ExpressVPN. So head to expressvpn.com forward slash the SimGrid. Uh, that's as long as you sign up to a 12 month agreement. It's the world's largest premium VPN service uh, provider, uh, founded back in 2009. 3,000 plus servers in over 160 VPN server locations. That's in nearly 100 countries across the globe. It's available to use on multiple different platforms as well. And also our good friends at Calo, uh, who provide uh, uh, premium uh, food supplements. You can get 15% off of your order with them. So you can head to that link and use the uh, discount code WORLDCUP15. Um, and of course, uh, Calo, based out of Antwerp in Belgium, they have their own esports performance centre at their HQ. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you want to get uh, a, a bit of a, a bit of an additional affiliate uh, bonus, head over to those links and uh, get yourself sorted as well. You can also head to our partners at Coach Dave Academy and Thrustmaster for either whether it's ACC setups and professional coaching. Uh, on Ace, uh, on Coach Dave Academy and also like David if you want to get a new T300RS which he keeps on banging on about uh, since he got it um, you can head to thrustmaster.com and as always a big thank you to uh, VCO and AK Informatica for helping support the SimGrid VCO World Cup yeah, and uh, I might shortly be banging on about Callow as well, because as soon as I realised that we've got a partnership with them, I went and placed an order uh, on, I think it was Thursday night, actually. And <laughs> they, they look really, really interesting. Of course, no caffeine in them as well. So for the moment, until I get my order, um, I'm having to resort to some, some can-based alternatives. And I, I just don't like the jitter, so really looking forward to seeing if uh, Callow can answer that for me because my goodness me I definitely need them both here in sim racing commentary and uh, in my uh, real life racing exploits at the weekends as well so uh, they also do sleep products as well so I'll be uh, quite keen to uh, although it does say you can't take both at the same time that's uh, I would have thought that's a no-brainer but anyway back to the battle here with uh, Giorgio Simonini uh, and GTWR R8 G Academy again on to the back of Andrea Capoccia incredible incredible pace the uh, the 157 has got right now and again I think there's going to be some scores to settle after about 20 minutes ago at Lecum we'll see if that comes to fisty cuffs again but at the moment it is Yigor Ogur on the call for Lada Team Rosneft in the lead in the 41 card just now um, I've got to say though uh, Andrea Miatu has now taken over for that GTWR racing team number four uh, has kind of blown that hope out of the water because they've just done 226 <laughs> on that first lap on the wet tyre so wet tyres now are the fast tyre yeah and uh, just keeping an eye on what is happening with uh, our current leaders Ogorodnikov is on he's just done over one hour and coming up to uh 
seven minutes, so yeah, very shortly, uh, because we're two minutes away from having the first interval points of the race. Uh, and you know what's going to be? Uh, I mean, I've just had James Barker just say in our ears that maybe that might be where all the pit stops will happen. So that will be a real sort of uh, uh, hodgepodge of uh, drivers getting into the pits, getting on the wet weather tyres, and then obviously the. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the interval points will be sort of like going, well, hang on, we were we were at that point just before you announced it. Yeah, well, you were in the pits, getting your wet weather tyres on. Go figure. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, it's... Uh, I mean, at the moment, Ogorodnikov still running the 228 ones. Um, so I would think probably in the next lap or two is probably the prime opportunity for Yigod Ogorodnikov to actually pit from the lead. And he's got a 46.1 second back uh, lead back to James Bacon in the 125 entry. Yeah, and let's face it, James Bacon and Kelly and Ryan Meenan are probably going to be pitting at around about the same point as uh, Ogorodnikov. So really it's the uh, the car uh, 66 seconds behind, which is of course Andrea Miato in that uh, 164 GTWR car that's been so good and uh, just watching this uh, it's going to be the end of this lead lap um, that uh, the uh, interval points are going to be given so as long as Ogronnikov doesn't come in this lap um, then it is going to be uh, th they take the interval points for that one as he comes through Lacombe just now last lap round 228.7 so I mean <sighs> Yes, the wet tyres are faster, but not by that much. Not by as much as you'd think. Um, I mean, Ogoronikov has burnt through his uh, his drier tyres, so, I mean, it is going to compromise him now, uh, but we'll see what uh, the 164 can do across the line. I, I mean, 227.1, so, I, I, I mean, it's about a second faster, so the, the gap is important to get in for those uh, wet weather tyres, but Ogoronikov... I mean, given that they were taking two, two and a half seconds per lap for the past 15 laps, I think that is a huge, huge boost to Igor Ogorodnikov and that number 41 team. Yeah, I mean, I've just noticed that uh, the tyres have dropped off for the 125 and the 211. So Bacon and Ryan mean in both in the two minute 30s. So I think they're just going to hold out until they get the interval points. And then the first thing that they'll do... Um, it's getting rather close though for Killian Ryan Meenan and Igor Ogorodnikov for those stint times and at the moment Ogorodnikov's making his way out of Stavlo now heading towards Blanchimart whereas um, but uh, I, I've got a feeling that possibly that it might be not just Killian Ryan Meenan maybe James Bacon could both pat at the same time because the interval points will be rather crucial so could they stick it out maybe for another lap because um okay so interval points about to come through but uh Ogorodnikov had a 47.6 second lead over james bacon as he came into the uh the pit lane david so um a good strategy call there i think for Ogorodnikov. and now i think they'll they'll go on to uh, wet weather tyres and now Yura Petrichenko is currently running in 7th position they qualified P3 so Yura Petrichenko did the job in qualifying they've had their dramas let's be completely honest oh and I just heard that uh, Tibor Props has just spun the 32 Ferrari at the bus stop chicane and that seems to catch people out especially in these wet weather conditions and that will drop them it so uh yeah see what props that's lost in probably the best part of about nine to ten seconds there um but at least uh michael o'brien from rocket simsport down in 11th position is about uh 16.8 seconds behind and as ogorodnikov pitted so did bacon and ryan meaning so the top three in the pits yep so they are into the pits i think they were fuel limited to to, to kind of force that hand on them and that is going to mean that uh, miato is going to uh, if not certainly take the uh, the lead of this 228 but i think uh if we can get ogorodnikov back out the pits i think it's going to be very very close but i think miato is going to jump back into the lead of this race but uh, let's see how this one pans out because at the moment uh, Igor Ogorodnikov still in pit lane and this is handing a very very nice lead to uh, back to Andrea Miato 
But again, anything under 26, 27 seconds for uh, the gap. And I think they're going to be very, very happy with that for the number 41. But again, just leaving pit lane now. And uh, that gap looks to be what's at about maybe 25 seconds between Ogorodnikov and Miato. So, I mean, that is a, that is a turn up for the books for those two. Yeah, I'm just sort of looking at uh, another permutation here as well because uh, Marek Shins, according to the timing, well, I'm just having a look at the uh, the live timing and also the timing tower. Is that me? Marek Shins? Are they in second position, the 191? They're only six seconds off of Miato, so Marek Yeah, Shins. I think that, that could be, but Marek again, Shins. pit stops will, uh, will throw that about a bit, I think. Yeah, but Marek... Yeah, they're off. Yeah, they're both off schedule. Simonini's currently uh, in twenty-first position as a result of uh, Sean Arnold pitting in the number thirty-eight uh, Dow King Community Car, which has served a fifteen-second uh, penalty. Um, so I think um, you know there's been a few uh, strategy changes, like uh, like say when Scalari had a, had a bit of an incident earlier on. As oh, bit of a moment there for Linda. Round the outside goes Jimaluski. And the PPR Esports Porsche. Um, yeah, Linda had a bit of a wobble there going through, uh, going through, uh, coming out of Puon and going down towards Le Fagne. Uh, so, yeah, not exactly uh, a moment where you want to have that kind of a wobble because that could have been rather nasty. Certainly could. And just watching uh, the number 41 card at the moment who's stuck behind Zahir Asa and I think Marco Bischoff that is in that as well. Well, so he's really got uh, a whole gaggle of cars. Nicholas Bosley might be involved in that. It is Igor Okonodikov still trying to get past that Bentley right now and having to be very, very patient right now and uh, getting himself through. So I think that gap is now up to 34 seconds between Miato and Okonodikov. Okonodikov just coming out that final corner now. Miato doing a 2.27. Uh, of course, we'll not get a, a representative time from Ogorodnikov because he did just exit the pits on that one. But again, yeah, I think it's... Uh, yeah, so... I, I think he has closed a little bit. Um, 28 seconds. So I, that is a massive win for Igor Ogorodnikov on that stint. No doubt on it. Fresher wits by about two laps, three laps. And uh, that gap now, what was uh, what was it? It was about 43 seconds, wasn't it? And he's taken about 17, 18 seconds on that stint alone. So huge plays there from Ogden on the call. And we don't know what the pace is like from Miato. And Noyok's in the pits, Prop's in the pits, Balancini in the pits as well. Uh, I did see that Marek Shins has also pitted in the 191 from second position on the road. Uh, so that will probably put them maybe towards the bottom of the top five or just outside of it uh, on the uh, on the pit stop phase. But still, Giorgio Simonini trying to close down on Andrea Capoccia. And they've got uh, Luca Lozio from Jean Alessi Sports Academy in the 27 Ferrari. So this is a battle for position. This is for 16th on the road. Obviously, the strategies for these three uh, teams, three different manufacturers, so Ferrari, uh, McLaren and Audi going into battle for uh, just outside of the top 15 at the minute. But still, um, despite that massive save that Giorgio Simonini had to do after the uh, slightest amount of contact on the inside of the second part of Licon on Capoccia earlier on in the race, um, you know, Simonini just, uh, just kept plugging away. He's just kept his head down. He's, he's, he's not... Um, He's not giving up, and that's one of the biggest things that you have to do in a 24-hour race. As Petrochenko for Unicorns of Love uh, pits from sixth position on the road in the number 14, and that will probably drop them more than likely outside of the top 10. But, you know, it, it's about getting to the end. It's about not giving up, and I think Angus Fender just basically said that earlier on in the first uh, first four hours, four and a bit hours of the broadcast. He just said, yeah, just keep going. Don't give up. Just keep pushing. Because at the end of the day here, David, um, you know, you get into the top 30, you score points. Exactly. That is exactly the point. And uh, it's all about that consistency and keeping your nose clean, keeping yourself out of trouble. That's what 
the uh, race is going to be won and lost by. Uh, Yigaro Gorotnikov has done a fantastic job of getting by some lap traffic just now. It was holding him up. He's got by around about three, four cars just now. And he's got a little bit of clear air. I think he's got the 995 up in front of him just now. That is, of course, going to be the uh, the Marco Bischoff car uh, out of turn one. So that gap now down to uh, 29.2 seconds despite all that traffic uh, Ogorodnikov only lost three tenths of a second that lap I've got a feeling if we can see Ogorodnikov gently start to ramp up the pressure we could see a real fight on our hands in the next hour yeah very much the case um, I mean yeah 29.2 seconds obviously uh, we saw what happened earlier on when um, Badeli was behind the wheel of the car and, uh, and now you know Ogorodnikov I'm just going to have a look at how many stints he's done on the on, on the fly. This will be, yeah, this will be his second in a row because uh, Igor actually did the first two stints and he spent a total of just uh, the best part of two hours and 22 and a half minutes. Then uh, Grabowski got behind the wheel of that car for a further couple of hours, make that yeah, for just over um, two hours and ten minutes. So Igor has done the best part of nearly, th well, well over three and a half hours in that car and uh, has, has just kept plugging away. And, you know, they're, uh, that, that's all they can do. They, they just have to keep on moving forward, just keep pushing, just keep the pace up. And it's been consistent, you know, from Grabowski and Ogorodnikov. I've been rather impressed. They, they haven't really put a foot wrong because they've just kept out of trouble. And you and I have always... Uh, been really excited about Ogorodnikov's pure pace but now we see a much more mature driver in the fact that he's learning from errors that have happened previously and, th and that's one of the benefits here on the sim grid and we do talk about this quite a bit on some broadcasts and here's not an exception is the fact that if you make a mistake you learn from it you dust yourself off you get back on you keep going you don't stop you, you learn every single time you go through a particular race and, and it's not any different here on a 24-hour race itself absolutely and uh, uh, one man proving that is vincent lindner that we just saw there making a crack and crack and move over uh, nicholas bosley and uh, vanak there uh, we did speak to Igor Ogorodnikov yeah. and, and, and did actually bring that point up and he, he said that himself, he said that he's constantly trying to improve and that he, you know, he, he sometimes gets stressed out of feeling like he's so unlucky, he, gets, he finds himself at the centre of everything else going on and nine times out of ten he gets into trouble for it as we see the uh, 416 coming into trouble there out of Blanchemont there coming up to the uh, the chicane there gets himself going again that's uh, Boyvin in the uh, the Honda that uh, was into some trouble there but I mean yeah it's just been brilliant from Ogorodnikov uh, let's uh, have a look here we've got uh, penalty being cleared for the uh, one two three uh, so we'll keep you updated with what exactly has happened on uh, on that one uh, possibly that they've uh, appealing it so yeah that'll be an interesting one with that one but Alex I mean 17 hours three quarters to go the uh, the conditions look like they're here with us at least for the next 45 minutes or so I mean it, what do we think is going to happen now because these these conditions very very treacherous indeed it's a bit like treading on eggshells David you, you've really got to watch your steps so to speak and you can't you've got to have you can't leave any stone unturned you've got to make sure that if you have a uh, a an incident or something goes wrong where it compromises your strategy you've got to react on the fly and the sign of a good team will be that they'll know that if this factor happens this factor happens so let's say someone's on dry tires right now they go right okay you need to pit now we need to be on fresh wets and if it's for a battle for position maybe later on in the race so it's like i said earlier the short-term pain where we saw people like niles noyox going through for an hour and 10 minutes on tires that were literally falling off a cliff and those were wet weather tires and still managed to stick it out even had a moment through brooks house but you can you can just see that he'll be talking with the rest of the team so the likes of gregor shill the likes of arto kamaha they will be discussing strategy all the time they'll be in each other's ears they'll be motivating them on cheering them on and saying look you got this they don't want to say anything to the person that's behind the wheel that's going to give that fear of doubt and that's one thing you don't need 
in an endurance race of this magnitude around this particular circuit as well and it's the longest circuit on the uh, SimGrid VCO Season 2 World Calendar uh, World Cup Calendar this is where you have to be on your A game these drivers will be eking out strategies they may have to even respond um, to maybe even deciding well if the weather weather changes like we saw with the 164 earlier they gambled they went on slick tires it's kept them in the lead but Ogorodnikov is going the best part of six tenths of a second quicker at the moment on fresher rubber so once one makes a uh, one makes a, a roll of the dice and decides to go for it. Someone else is then going to counter attack, and, and that's what we're seeing between the 164 of GTWR uh, R8G Academy, the number four, uh, the fourth out of five cars from this team in split one, and then Lada Sport Rosner from, with Igor Ogorodnikov. And we know how quick Ogorodnikov is in both the wet and the dry. Obviously, coming back to him. Remember, we, we were due to... He was leading the best of British Championship going into the fifth and final round on that Super Saturday. But he had decided to take some time away. And sometimes, sim racers, just like real-life racers, their schedules are so heavily packed that they could get a fear of burnout. And one of the things that you want to do is to come back fully refreshed. And that's what Igor has done. He's looked back at things. He's decided to take some, you know, some me time, so to speak, and it's made it so much better for him. And we we now see a different Igor Ogorodikov. And to be honest with you, I think things are very bright for that individual. Yeah, they certainly are. And I, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with everything that you've just said there. And, and just to emphasize the point you brought on that uh, he's six tenths of a second faster than uh, Andrea Miato in that uh, 164 GTWR number four car in the lead. And Andrea has been held up by the number 27 of Luca Lozio. That was a 228.8 that last lap round. So if Ogrodnikov can keep on that pace as well and you know, sure enough, he's going to get his own share of lap traffic that he has to get back as well. But, uh, I mean, this is huge. This is now potentially two seconds a lap that uh, Ogoronikov is going to gain hand over fist over Andrea Miata. So the GTWR team must be absolutely fizzing right now. And indeed, Ogoronikov goes across line 226.691. That's 2.2 seconds off of that uh, off of that last lap there. So we're now seeing the final cars making their way onto wet weather tyres just now. And uh, I've got to be honest, I'm really, really excited now as uh, Luca Lozio lets the uh, Andrea Miata, uh, Miato sorry, uh, through and then it's the 157 that he's got to get past him, Giorgio Simonini. But Ogar Ornikov taking lumps out of this time and this is amazing because this is now within uh, half an hour I think we're going to have a battle potentially for the lead. Yeah, very much the case. And uh, yeah, just saw Rocket Sim Sports uh, Michael O'Brien uh, come in the pit lane, one of the last uh, drivers to go onto wet weather tyres, um, having uh, come in from P8. And they've had a really good race so far uh, in terms of where they qualify. 26, though, uh, 18 places gained in uh, nine watt. The first seven hours of the race is uh, Loic van Ack in the esports uh, perform racing team. Uh, coming under fire from the number 21 uh, and that is of um, uh, Vincent Lindner again so it's uh, Audi versus Audi and uh, about uh, 38 seconds up the road from this duo is the number 149 and now behind the wheel of the Yaz Heat Pirelli car is none other than uh, Yaroslav Honzik who is running at the top 25 and is currently just under six seconds behind Luca Lozio from the number 27 Jean Alessi eSports Academy car. Now, I'm watching the, uh, the, the battle for the lead just now and I've got to be honest, uh, I mean... Andrea Miato is uh, really struggling to, to break away from Luca Lozio right now. Uh, the 157 was ahead uh, a little bit um, in terms of like being a lapped car. It's uh, Tobias Pfeffer that's taken over that car just now. But um, he was on the back of him and then just dropped back again. And Luca Lozio all over the, uh, the tail end of your leader right now. And we know that Lozio is uh, a lap down already. 
but this means that again that was a 228-0 from Andrea Miato and Ogronnikov 227-2 and Ogronnikov still fighting his way through traffic as well so yeah this is this is starting to get really really sketchy now for your race leader that gap is now 24.4 seconds and uh, Ogronnikov now even in traffic catching him up by just under a second a lap wow this is getting really really exciting yeah, and at the moment, the 164 is actually the slowest car in the top eight. The car actually in front of Igor Ogorodnikov is, uh, that is of WPS Racing Team's Luka Weidelich um, going through down the exit of the Camel Strait and through into Lecom. So, yeah, it's, uh, things are rather interesting now as to what is going to transpire, how quickly can Odgorodnikov get past uh, Vidalich on this particular occasion? And then the next car up will be the Triple Eight, and uh, that will be the uh, Team ACR car. And that's Patrick Sodakat uh, behind the wheel of that one. So uh, there's Chris Hartvelt in the number 32. Um, and they're currently in 15th position. So Hartvelt looking to uh, make some inroads and is just seven and a half tenths of a second behind. Uh, Benson uh, Mayazzi in the 194 from Racing Line Motorsport. This is the battle for 14th place and still Racing Line Motorsport. They've made up 27 positions uh, from 41st on the grid, but they are running a little bit slow. And uh, the thing is, uh, Mayazzi, I'm just having a look at the tyres. Well, not the tyres, but also the, the times. A 2 minute 29.4. Uh, Chris Hartvelt, a 2 minute 28.6. Now, uh, just remember, David, that uh, Mayazzi was the first driver to go on to wet weather tyres. So, effectively, the Bentley became the Boatley. Now, the Boatley seems to be running out of uh, some propeller power, so to speak. Is is the Boatley starting to sink? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. I couldn't resist it. I'm so sorry. But I had to, to bring that one out. Uh, the Bentley, I mean, it is just such a stable car. So from my brief time when I was uh, into a set of course of competition, and I used this in the, the biggest quotations possible, I am nowhere near uh, on the same sort of pace as these guys and girls out there on track. But I find the Bentley to be a much more stable, much more enjoyable car to drive. It's got the pace in a straight line, but it also has the cornering ability, but it does tend to tip and roll over over quite an quite a lot but it is a nice big brute of a car uh, if you can get a setup working well on it, it is definitely got potential but just now i am wondering if it is going to be uh, getting devoured left right and center because hartveld is all over the back of that thing just now uh, it looks like Andrea Miato has cleared himself into the uh, the pace on those wet weather tyres again, back to the 227.8. But again, Ogorodnikov still a little bit faster on that last lap. And still, uh, Miato is the slowest out of the top five right now. And that rain is starting to get really, really heavy here, Alex. Yeah, expect the uh, track uh, conditions to change from damp to wet. I mean... Um yeah, I mean, you, you can just see now Hartfeld absolutely hustling that car going through Radignon and closing in on uh, my, uh, 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 Matiasi as there is uh, one of the... That's the 211 actually behind them. And the 211, that is uh, Magic Malinowski behind them, running in P3 and is seconds behind Igor Ogorodnikov, who's got that gap down to... 24.2 seconds behind Andrea Miato. Um, Ogorodnikov was the best part of maybe uh, two and a half tenths of a second quicker. We've just seen that uh, Bischoff has actually ended up in the uh, pit lane as well, and that's the ambassadors for Renvelt and Carl. Uh, was running P10, but now uh, drops out of the top 15. There's Hartvelt looking uh, towards the outside, going into Pouin, and on this particular occasion, Matiazzi. Uh, keeps the Bentley on the uh, racing line and keeps that car as wide as humanly possible. Hartvelt's going to try and do his level best to try and maybe get through. Looks up the inside of Lefagne. And again, Matiasi cuts across the front of the Ferrari to defend very, very sternly indeed. 
Well, that's uh, a little bit of excitement for you, isn't it? I mean, that uh, that car has literally thrown everything it possibly can as the Ferrari to try and get past the Bentley, but it's just absolutely not having uh, any of it whatsoever. But the Bentley, again, being hustled to within an inch of its life, and Machazzi has to go defensive around Blanchemont. He's going to try and force Hartfield a long way around. And I've got to be honest, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be wanting to be playing these games with Hartfield because he's a very, very fast driver for some out wide and surely that's got the move done Ryan Blanchard wow Hartfield absolute testicular fortitude there and that was a beautiful beautiful move around the outside of Blanchard exceeding track limits but he didn't have any choice my chassis he didn't give him any room whatsoever and that was huge what a move from Chris Hartfield for GTWR R8G Academy that was amazing amazing stuff yeah, but uh, Piggy in the middle, when Hartfelt made that move around the outside of Matiasi, was Malinowski, who was uh, flashing the lights as if to say, look, you guys are... I, I, I'm coming through. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the leading cars. You're a lap down. Come on, get out of the way. And now again, uh, you can see that the front fog lights on that Aston Martin are well and truly lit up, lighting up the rear bumper of Chris Hartfelt, who's still ahead... <laughs> <laughs> and Malinowski flashes lights, goes towards the outside into Lecon, blue flags wave, round the outside he goes. So Malinowski now can power away from the Ferrari and uh, get a move on. But Matiazzi looks, to, well there was a car that just had a bit of a wobble behind. Matiazzi didn't quite catch out what it was uh, in terms of uh, who it was there. But uh, also we spoke with uh, Tarek uh, uh, Gamil and also... Uh, uh, Jack Keithley from Williams Esports. Martin Stefanko, in the meantime, has stealthily been creeping his way up the order and is currently 3.3 seconds behind the 194 Bentley. I've just seen him come into the shop, coming out of no name. Wow, wow, wow. This is uh, unbelievable. I tell you what, Miato is having a howler right now. 229.3, Alex. And that gap looks to be much smaller than 20 seconds. Ogorodnikov is really taking chunks out that time. 229.3 for Andrea Miato. And he is in all sorts of trouble right now because he just can't get past uh, the number 787 in front of him. And I've got to be honest, where is this time going? 227-1 for Ogorodnikov. And I'm going to apologise to the, to the ladies and gentlemen watching at home because we do keep mentioning this all the time. And I know that there's about 40 other cars on track here, but this single-handedly has the biggest implications on the race altogether because we've got 17 and a half hours left to go and we could possibly be seeing a potential battle for the lead unfolding in front of our very, very eyes. And uh, this is Marco Bischoff for the 995 Ambassadors for Renfeld and caught up in that earlier incident and uh, making their way down into Lafania. Uh, currently hunting down, I think that's Jan Willem van Omen in the 38 in front. Indeed it is. And Jan Willem van Omen doing a cracking job in that Aston Martin. But again, the pace of that car, you'd expect it to be a little bit further up, but getting hustled from Marco Bischoff here for ambassadors for Renville in here. And I think a move is going to be absolutely imminent right now. Yeah, but keep your, keep your eyes behind them because Ami Hosseini is closing in on them. Whilst they're battling away, Hosseini is uh, just over 1.6 seconds ahead. And uh, Hosseini is also running pretty quickly. He's in the 227.3s at the moment. And he's running with Alaric Enslin in uh, Season 3 of Sprint Cup, which has its season finale next Thursday at Suzuka. Um, but yeah, this is now getting rather, rather dicey because Hosseini's got an Audi just up ahead, which he might be able to use to get a little bit of a slipstream heading down uh, through, La so through into La Source and probably down the Camel Straits as Bischoff right up close to the back bumper of Jan Willem van Oorn, uh in the number 38 Dow King community car. Bischoff goes to the right-hand side. Van Oorn closes the door off nice and, f nice and neatly there. Now going through into uh, Orhuge and up towards the crest of the hill through into Radion. We ride on board the front splitter of Marco Bischoff in the 995 Ambassadors for Renveld and Carr. And uh, you can see now that Van Ommen actually just strategically went to the left hand side in order to not give Bischoff a toe. And that toe can be anything up to maybe four to five tenths of a second.
heading to Le Com. And we've seen moves where cars were looking like they were standing still. But on that particular occasion, Van Ommen really did, uh, really was a good call there, I think, from the 38. Certainly was. And uh, I mean, again, it just shows with uh, what's that, about seven hours gone in this race, or just coming up for six and a half hours gone. I mean, everybody is, is fighting this like it is a 24-hour sprint race. There isn't a case of, right, let's just settle down, let's do it, uh, you know, a, a decent job for 18 hours, then we'll bring out the big guns. This is like every single hour is its own dedicated sprint race. It's fantastic to see. And hopefully um, everyone at home is enjoying it as well because we have been absolutely spoiled by the action that we have had going on here just now. And uh, yeah, it, it doesn't show any signs of abating anytime soon. No, not at all. I've just seen that the gap between um, first and second has now extended to 22.2 seconds. So it might have been a slight, uh, but it was mainly because of the fact that Ogorodnikov had a lot of traffic. He's ma now managed to get past uh, the 28 car and the one just ahead of that so he's got the uh, triple eight uh, just in front of him uh well not that far in front of him actually because the triple eight car is making its way through into le fan that's the team acr car we'll probably still have uh patrick Sodica behind the wheel and then they'll head through into uh, stavlo but hopefully now that uh, igor's got a bit of clear air it's going to help him push the pace on those tires and sometimes with uh, back marker traffic actually it does sometimes strategically help your tires in the longer run because you're not pushing them because you're having to wait to get past the back marker that may be in front and that might give you that extra bit of um extra bit of purchase a little bit later on once you've got that second win in the latter half of the stint it certainly it certainly is and uh, i'm just watching this battle as well one one thing with the the leader i've got to be honest that's really confusing me right now with uh, andrea miato right he's he's just ahead of luca Lotto, the 27 but he is struggling and he is being gapped by the 38th place car the bmw of william hendrickson william hendrickson is the car in front of him on the track and is doing uh what's that 228 that there and he's still got a gap of about two three seconds so I, i'm just I'm, I'm really really confused as to how andrea miato is uh, is is managing this race because ogorodnikov is um he's catching and he's catching quite quickly and the problem is is ogorodnikov is now in clear air he's got one car in front of him and uh, i believe that is the is that the triple eight that he's got in yeah. front of him of uh, patrick sodikat yeah, but uh, Marco Bischoff, uh, now ahead of Jan Willem van Ommen, so uh, in uh, many respects, has uh, now got a bit of clear air for himself uh, to try and pull away. And Smolarczyk uh, is in the triple one, DV1 Triton Racing. Bentley is the next car up ahead. And in terms of the gap between them, it's around about 13 and a half seconds so make that 11.9 as oh that's a bit wide coming out of Stavlo there for Marco Bischoff um, again you know mistakes can be punished rather easily especially uh, say for instance uh, a drive through for exceeding track limits too many times so three times and then the fourth one you get a penalty also the uh, stop go 30 for speeding in the pit lane and that can happen whether the car enters the pits or exits the pits so it could be one driver or uh, the one driver coming into the pit lane or if they're switching drivers it could be the driver forgetting to set the pit uh, pit lane speed limiter and we've seen that decide races here on the sim grid many a time so 17 and a half hours left to go and uh, we've we've seen so much already happen in the past two and a half hours it is amazing amazing action thank you very much to everyone that is watching here on youtube it's david christie and alex goldschmidt bringing you through 
the uh, the next couple of hours. We've got about another hour and ten minutes left to go of our stint, and then is back to Lewis McGlade taking on the reins for the, uh, the final couple of hours this evening and then we come back at I think it's about 6 o'clock in the morning so I'm going to have to go and set my alarm clock nice and early for that where I'll be on with uh, Daniel Handover but it's going to be Ewan O'Leary that uh, jumps on with Lewis McLean and if I'm not mistaken Alex I think that's uh, it's going to be Ewan's debut for uh, the Sim Grid as well. Yeah uh, works with Ewan many a time he also works with uh with uh, with Lewis as well, so um, looks like we've got a penalty uh, coming through, and that is for the uh, one. So the so the uh, the penalty that was orig originally appealed, I think, for the 123 has just been reinstated. Uh, so the incident between 123 and 21 on lap 133, a 15 second time penalty for the 123 for aggressive driving. Yeah, you hate to say it, but again, it's uh, consistency from race control. These things get stamped out very, very early, and uh, it, look, it, they're within the rights to appeal. Um, but again, it's it's whether or not you can uh, you can prove that it wasn't there. Is up the inside goes Chris Hartville uh, on that is uh, that was Nick Babin, isn't it? Still in that 720 carbon uh, Sim Sport machine, looking glorious as they make the run down through Eau Rouge and then up into Radion but amazing amazing stuff there wow 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 right um Yigor Ogoronikov takes another second out of Andrea Miato there on that last lap round and uh, yeah I'm going to be waiting with bated breath because I think next time round uh, it's going to be into the uh, the 22nd mark for uh, Ogoronikov and again I make this point it's not lap traffic Ogoronikov is is clawing his way through traffic left, right and centre but Miato is struggling to gap Luca Lozio behind him who's lapped down in that 27 machine and still trying to catch up to the 787 that's in front of him that is the 38th place car of William Hendrickson so the pace really not looking too great for that car in the lead and I wonder if the tyres have been scrubbed a little bit too early. Yeah I've also noticed an interesting strategy because we're seeing that some some drivers are well some teams are actually doing double stints uh, say for instance with regards to uh, Miato did the first double stint of the uh, the race for the 164 GTWR then it was Michael Romagnoli um, they then gone to Fideli and then back Miato's going back behind the wheel but then I've looked at Carbon Simsport so they've had uh, Christopher Maskowski uh, behind the wheel, then Murray's towards Siedlow and then Nick Babin. Each of them have both done two um, stints in the car. So Nick Babin could be replaced by one of the other drivers in the 720, probably at the end of this, as the 123 now picks to serve its penalty. Now I'm wondering if that is a if that is a uh, normal pit stop. Just going to have a look. Well, that is actually after 17 and three quarter minutes, so not a uh, not a planned pit stop. I mean, uh, the thing was is that we Simard um, did a previous stint of 48 minutes and 43 seconds. So probably that would have been when the weather's weather changed and facilitated them to switch onto the wet weather tyres. Um, as Chris Hartvelt still uh, keeping Nick Babin very very honest as they go into the braking zone into uh, the into La Source. And it looks like Matiasi is coming under fire from Rocket Sim Sports, Luca Burke, and that's the battle for 15th position, a 14th and 15th, and Luca Burke in the McLaren 720S GT3 will try and get the run going down the hill into a rouge, and then line up Matiasi for a run going down the Kemmel Strait and into uh, Lycom here, David. Wild, wild stuff the weather deteriorating in front of our very eyes so I think that one's going to bubble away and simmer away quite nicely as Chris Hartfeld makes the move on Nick Babin we've got side by side down the Kemmel Street this is down into Lecum then Luca Burke tries to go around the outside beautiful move absolutely no doubt about what that McLaren was trying to do there stunning stunning move gets it done and makes it look so easy in the process for Rocket Simsport. Fantastic stuff. And much as he in that Bentley is going to have to just sort of uh, stick in no man's land there and hope that Stefanko in the number five 
isn't going to get any ideas from that. <laughs> well, the gap now between the two leaders has finally dipped under 20 seconds. Igor Ogorodnikov was 1.275 seconds quicker than Andrea Miato. The gap now down 19 and a half seconds. So uh, watch out. The Og Og Ogorodnikov freight train is definitely on full power right about now. Yep, and 1.4 seconds on that last lap there. Uh, the 1, 2, 3 of Philippe Simard is uh, dropping down the order because his uh, his sim has cracked his app has uh, quit oh. to desktop he's all f4'd and he's all the way down into p23 just now oh my goodness me that is uh yeah that's that's one of those moments where you uh, windows asks you if you want to update isn't it and you're like uh no no thank you two laps down and i can imagine the air inside that that room has turned a little bit blue right now uh, yes, definitely very much the case as we now go back to uh, our very uh, our, our very lovely Iranian in the form of Amin Hosseini and he's pressurising Jan Villan van Omen uh, for 19th position. This is coming through into Stavlo. So through the first part, through the second part, we're on board with the Bentley, the 777, which is also being driven by the likes of Zahir Essa amongst other. And that was a bit of a wiggle coming out of Stavlo there, I must admit. Um, and also Amir partnered with uh, Raymond Mooney so Zahir Essa and Raymond Mooney actually partnered up in Sprint Cup Season 3 oh that's wide to the right hand side coming through the exit of uh, Blanchimov for Amir Hosseini but he's uh, still trying to keep in touch with Jan uh, Willem van Omen but again the Bentley uh, you said about it's, it's, it can be stable I think Amir Hosseini has just proved otherwise on that particular occasion well, the key word there, Alex, being can, can be stable. <laughs> <laughs> Amir Hosseini proven uh, that if you push things a little bit too far, then, uh, yeah, it's not likely to go. Now, listen, I'm not one for going along with the tide of uh, being washed up in the tide of popular opinion, but I've got to admit, right, YouTube chat at the moment going crazy for Marco Bischoff in the 995 right now. Absolutely spot on with that one, chat. Well done, because uh, the 995, the pace is currently 227.648 that is faster than every single car in front of him marco bischoff is absolutely flying right now and at a rate of absolute knots in that 995 i mean that is absurd to be faster than every single car in front of you every other car is doing at least 228.5s and he's doing a 227 that is incredible impressive pace right now yeah it is and it's also consistent pace um so just pushing to the limits but not going over them and you know if you're you know people are saying like uh, but also, uh, Luca Burke is closing on Nick Babin, and they're going through Blanchimont. McLaren versus McLaren. So Luca Burke is, uh, is a very accomplished uh, young racer, and they both go wide coming out of Blanchimont. Uh, Burke looking to send it around the outside of Babin, going through into the bus stop chicane. Oh, that's a slick manoeuvre and a half from Luca Burke. Rocket Simsport now up into P12 courtesy of Luca Burke that was a brilliant move he just timed that switch back oh that was an amazing move from Luca Burke there absolutely love that beautiful beautiful stuff and Rocket Simsport then up into P12 great great stuff but I mean oh my goodness me right the battle for the lead now is 16.6 seconds your Ogre on the call is absolutely hunting this down this is Marco Bischoff I hope you're happy chat because a well deserved bit of exposure for the 995 fires it up the inside of the triple one that is Victor Smolarczyk and absolutely nothing that the Bentley can do to do that Bischoff is still flying about there and does a 228.8 even though he's just overtaken a car there gets it going again and this 995 could very well be and I'm going to say it right here right now within the next 20 minutes could be up into the top 10 huge pace on that car right now and it is faster than everything else around it by some margin right now 
Yeah, that actually got him 16th position because Martin Stefanko for Williams Esports uh, actually jumped into the pits uh, from 15th position. So that's going to promote uh, a few drivers up the order as a result of that. But that was a great move from Bischoff. And uh, there is Burke just uh, getting the the 26th placed car out of, out of the way. That is the number 21. Uh, that's got Lindner behind the wheel uh, at this particular moment as Ami and Hosseini closing in again. This is coming through the exit of Lecom and all the way down the hill down to Rivage. Uh, so Hosseini looking up the inside, possibly on Van Ormen. Not on this particular occasion. Then through into the next left-hander. The Bentley looking rather stable at this particular moment in time, but it's got to be steady and careful steering inputs. You don't want to make a mistake. And one of the biggest things that I have started to notice now, that rain coming down hard, David, the kerbs are absolutely soaking wet. And if you put a real big foot wrong, you're going to come a cropper out on this circuit. For sure, for sure. And that is a, a very astute observation there, Alex. As uh, around the outside goes Hussein, I cannot believe he just made that stick. That has to have been, surely, a mistake from Jan Willem van Omen because there's no way Hussein can have that much speed going into the uh, the corners there. Stunning, stunning stuff there and makes it look so, so easy. But, I mean, there you go, on the exit of the, uh, the, the corner there at Stavolo goes onto the kerbs and you can just see how much he's lighting up those tyres, traction control kicking in, but gets the move done. Chris Hook for Renville and uh, the number nine car down in 34th place. This is just ahead of uh, Mitya Bonka for the 25 pink performance. Oh, that was so close and so dangerous on the camel straight here, boys. You're gonna have to calm it down because you've got another 17 hours left to go. Fires it up the inside, pink performance having none of it. Tries to get the cut back, but Chris Hook gets the job done for Renvelt and, and that was a very, very worrying moment there, Alex. Yeah, that was uh, nearly uh, two not going into one right there and then. Mike Noble being pressure. Uh, you've got Mike Noble here in the uh, FFS racing car. Uh, currently, he's just overtaken Luca Lazio from the uh, John Alesi Esports Academy in the number 27 uh, Ferrari. So uh, I, I, I think now uh, a bit of aggression. The red mist has definitely uh, flown into the FFS camp round about now as they're down in 22nd position. And that was a real shame, obviously, with the game crash that we saw uh, for Simar. But uh, Mike Noble uh, is definitely getting his aggressive tendencies out for everyone to see. And it's out on track here at Spa. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's, uh, uh, just to, to confirm, uh, uh, we had a uh, message popped up in the YouTube chat. Why did the 1 2 3 get another penalty? I don't believe they've got another penalty. It was It's the same penalty from earlier. They appealed yeah. it, so it was temporarily revoked while they investigate it. And then uh, they, they hadn't served it, so it's still outstanding because of that game crash. So it's the same penalty from earlier, not a new one. Yeah. That basically gets uh, re-inputted as a result of uh, a, a game crash. So, uh, yeah, it just means that it still has to uh, has to be served as uh, William Hendrickson in the Jean Alesi Esports Academy Cup BMW uh, closing down on the triple six uh, entry, and uh, that is. Uh, uh, and as I, I, I look at who that is, that is uh, the racing ON3 car. And it's got uh, Michele uh, Cesini behind the wheel. Um, Okorodnikov's still on that mission. And that mission has not yet been fulfilled because that gap is absolutely being demolished right now. Okorodnikov was over 1.3 seconds quicker than Miato on the previous lap. The gap is around about 15, 16 seconds between first and second. Okorodnikov is not done yet. That's going to be even less than that this time round because Mike Noble, believe it or not, down in 15th place has just unlapped himself over Andrea Miato uh, and that was on the run out of uh, Double Gauche onto uh, Lafania. Uh, so he's got that done, 
but I mean the pace from Andre Miato is uh, it's not like massively bad I mean it's like all comparable with Niels van de Kekel in fifth place there two 29s in there it's just the fact that both Magic Malinowski and Igor Ogorodnikov still into the 228s as well and what you've got to remember is Ogorodnikov is you know he's, he's wearing those tyres out but he's also having to fight through much more traffic than uh, Andrea Miato uh, is at the moment so that gap still coming down makes it even more impressive for Igor Ogorodnikov as we still watch uh, William Hendrickson yeah, I, I think it's um, the, the the best way of describing sort of tyre management with backmarker traffic. I think I've uh, I've talked about this earlier, um, about probably half an hour or so ago. But when you're going through backmarker traffic, it gives you a little bit of a, a a slight respite, not much, but a slight respite, in order to make a a good decision. Because sometimes if a split second decision is made incorrectly at the wrong place at the wrong time on the track. It can cause a problem as Hendrickson uh, that was I think that was the PPR esports car I think they just passed uh, around the that was around the outside going into lick on that's a bit of a brazen move there if I must admit and that was on Bosselit um, but yeah it, it, it's it's about micromanagement you can't go in there full guns blazing well you can sometimes but it doesn't always work out and I've just seen that Ogorodnikov has got that kept to just under 14.8 seconds because he's just taken over another 1.2 seconds. So Ogorodnikov is using the, the back marker traffic from what I see here through this pace. If he was running in the 227s, I could understand, or 228s, I could understand if he was in clear air. But a 229.1 in back marker traffic, whilst using that to his advantage to close on Miato, is actually a pretty shrewd tactic, uh, for, from my honest opinion, because um, that means that the car's using less tyres and less fuel, especially in the slipstream certainly is and a uh, beautiful beautiful static shot we see here going up through Radion as the, the car's making a way round with uh, what's that uh, probably about what 17 hours left to go in the uh, the race here we've already uh, coming on to our final hour of our commentary stint here David Christie and Alex Goldschmidt bringing you live coverage of the second round of the Simgrid VCO World Cup here from Spa Jan Willem van Omen down in 19th place trying to catch back up with Amir Hosseini but that is going to be a losing battle because Hosseini is absolutely gone like the wind just now cracking cracking job up there in 18th place next target is going to be uh, Smolarczyk who is uh, what's that, about nine seconds up the road from uh, Amir Hosseini just now your race leader at the moment still Andrea Miato in the 164 GTWR racing number four outfit but the story so far over the past hour two hours that's been developing here ladies and gentlemen is that the number 41 of Lada Rosneft Racing's Igor Ogorodnikov is hunting them down hand over fist taking uh, what's that about a second every single lap the gap now just 13.5 five seconds between the two of them but the bad news for that 41 team is from what i'm being led to believe is that this might be Yeager's uh, last stint in the car that's a bit of a shame well the thing is david he's still got just under half an hour of that stint left to go if he really wants to push the boat out but uh yeah i mean impressive as always pace from ogorodnikov and what's more it has been consistent he hasn't really put a foot wrong He's got the uh, the triple eight just up ahead as well as uh, there's another three cars in f uh, between uh, Miato and Ogorodnikov, uh, one of which is the 601 I've just spotted, and that will be the eSport Performance Racing Team car. Uh, you've also got the number 27, uh, that will be the uh, jean Lacy eSports Sports Academy car with uh, Luca Lozio behind the wheel, and uh, just trying to make out the... Uh, uh, the fourth number at the moment. I think that might be the 149 of Yaz Heat. Uh, so that will have uh, Yaroslav Honzik behind the wheel. So uh, Okorovnikov is, is uh, making hay, but it's not quite whilst the sun shines because the, uh, the rain is still pretty much out there. And look, it's intensifying again over the next half an hour. So this wet weather here uh, in the uh, Liège region of Belgium as this track located just 150 kilometers uh, east of the capital city of, Be of Belgium, which is Brussels, uh, looks to be in for the long haul. 
certainly does and the uh, the weather looks like it's uh, going to be deteriorating we've seen that though for the past sort of 40 minutes to an hour that it's just getting worse and worse and worse and we don't know how much worse that it's going to get by uh, this is Luca Burke and I believe that he has done it he's just done uh, 10th place and got past Chris Hartvelt there so it makes it look so so easy he's on to those new tyres as well uh, so that's obviously you know giving him that little bit of a boost there um, but I'm watching this gap between the uh, the leaders with bated breath because I can't take my eyes away from it there 229.7 that last lap round there for Andrea Miato and uh, you've got Igor Ogorodikov who's got the triple eight in front of him uh, to, he's trying to get past just now that's uh, Patrick Sonica that is in front of him just now 229.721 so again the gap comes down marginally but not as much but again Ogorodikov is going to have the run going down Au Rouge and up through uh, Blanchemont as well so uh, let's have a look at the 995 as well the uh, the Marco Bischoff machine uh, that is currently making its way around as well gets past the 154 of Blanchini uh, for the, uh, the the 154, Machazzi is going to be next up on his hit list as well. Um, so uh, again, amazing, amazing performance from Marco Bischoff right now. In fact, that's actually going to be Florian Fleer that's uh, about six seconds up the road of him that's going to be next up on his hit list just now. Yeah, I've just noticed that uh, Miata has actually responded to Ogorodikov and was uh, pretty much comparable on time. Uh, both drivers did a 2 minute 29.7 but what I've also noticed um, look who's ahead of Luca Burke Gregor Schill and last time around even though Luca Burke uh, overtook Chris Hartbelt um, Luca Burke actually took a second out of uh, and here's the move up the inside this is going through into Le Com and took a really good amount of curb there but really kept it planted there did Luca Burke uh, going through Le Com on Chris Hartbelt uh, so I think um, you know uh, that's Gregor Schill's actually first stint behind the wheel of the uh, BMW Sim Racing G2 Esports car. Uh, so Niles Norox, I think, has uh, decided to uh, give Gregor a bit of motivation, as will uh, Arthur as well. And uh, at the moment, uh, Luca Burke is probably the best part of uh, just under seven seconds behind at the minute. Uh, make that 6.8 seconds. So Gregor Schill will probably be... Uh, having both Niles Norox and Arthur Cameron in his ear just saying, look, keep your eyes out because Luca Burke is closing. And I think that is going to be absolutely key. Again, we're coming up to uh, just a couple of hours away from the halfway point of the race here. Uh, still another five hours left to go in this first half of the race. And really, I mean, this is... This has been one of the... Uh, I, I don't want to say it because I'm touching the desk as much as I can right now. Uh, but this has been one of the quieter um, World Cup races that we've had in terms of incidents, in terms of, uh, you know, accidents and, and all that sort of thing. But it's certainly not been short of drama. We've had the intensity. We've had the, uh, the, the, the chaos kicking off. And we've got a yellow flag actually at the top of... Uh, uh, Old Rouge and Blanchemont, that's the uh, number one that has gone off of Nicolas Bosley uh, and gets going again, but I've got a feeling that, that uh, that's the uh, Porsche he's in. It's going to look a little bit worse for wear, although it's not looking too bad, Alex. No, probably not too shabby, but there has been uh, a penalty come through from race control. Incident between cars 157 and 149 that was uh the uh defending uh, yeah this is basically between uh, 157 gtwr r8 g academy and yaz heat pirelli on lap 137 15 second time penalty for yaz heat pirelli unfortunately for avoidable uh, an avoidable collision so the next time that car goes into the pits um that will be a case that uh, before that car gets even worked on, even if it is a full service, that will have to have a 15 second uh, stop in the pit lane before that happens. And as I say that, Ogorodnikov has now got that gap down to Miato to just 12 and a half seconds after 166 laps of racing. So at the moment, um, a lot of Sport Rosneft keeping, keeping themselves in the hunt with the uh, 164 GTWR R8G Academy number four car, 
but still the pole sitters, um, Sidemax, Motorworks, JLO still completing the top three. Yeah, and it's a brilliant, brilliant effort because uh, Bosley's got away with that without any damage, but he's in oh. front of Patrick Sudikat and he's also ahead of Igor Ogorodnikov as well, so he's going to have some real pressure uh, heading his way very, very shortly. But the thing is, is that uh, Ogorodnikov is, um, I, I mean, he all he has to do is just push this group in front of him and take the toe because that last lap round, uh, you know, Andrea Miato is on his own doing a 230.5 and Ogorodnikov still doing a 229.5 in fact Miato there that time round 230.9 I mean that is almost two seconds slower than Ogorodnikov we'll see as Ogorodnikov comes out the, uh, the the final chicane gets already past the number one car of Bosley goes across line 230.5 so only gains four tenths of a second but that's overtaking a car as well unbelievable pace right now from Ogorodnikov yeah, there's the uh, live standing updates for the SimGrid VCO World Cup after the first set of interval points uh, were put through. So DV1 Triton Racing lead with 94, Odox Motorsport 79. They've obviously, uh, they, uh, as far as I'm aware, they've, uh, uh, we've also got GTWR still running at the top three. Lada Sport Rosneft running at the top four with 60 points in Sim Racing Masterclass in the triple seven rounding out the top five on 58 points and uh looks like uh we might have a driver to interview david yeah certainly is we've got bassin richter from unicorns love the number 14 outfit currently down in sixth place doing a cracking cracking job uh, bastian uh, good afternoon uh, a brilliant effort so far from unicorns of love currently p6 at the moment and uh yura petrachenko doing a, a great job for the team yeah, hello everyone. Um, to be honest, it's a little bit underwhelming at the moment because obviously we started at P3 and we hoped that we could hold the position, but we had some little mistakes in the beginning and maybe also a wrong call in the pit stop strategy, which is the reason why we have one stop more than the others right now, I think. So, yeah, P6 at the moment and we're just trying to keep it on the track now and maybe gaining a little bit to the cars ahead. You are making inroads to Niels van de Kekel in the Racing Line Motorsport 191 ahead, but what is the uh, the plan for that, that disaster recovery from yourselves? Well, basically just to keep the car out of trouble. Um, I think the pace at the moment is, a li is good. The Maybe we are struggling a bit with the older tires right now, but um, a driver change and the tire change will come soon, so then we can hopefully attack again. And as long as we are keeping uh, closing the gap, I think uh, it's fine. And with the conditions being so changeable, uh, what do you personally prefer, Bastian? Because we've had it starting to try and dry up, and then it's just been this, this uh, constant rain for the past hour. To be honest, I'm not really sure. I think I'm fine with both conditions, but um, at the moment it looks like our car is a little bit slower in the rain, so maybe the dry conditions uh, would suit us better. But also we have a little bit of extra weight from the Bethesda race, so maybe that is also the reason why we are struggling a little bit more. And uh, finally, with this, just 17 hours left to go in the uh, in the race, what is uh, what's your thoughts going ahead to the final 17 hours? Just kind of keeping it clean and, and keeping yourselves out of uh, trouble. Yeah, exactly. So we just want to look that we minimise our pit stops and also nail the, the points where you have to switch tyres when the weather change comes. And yeah, then let's see where we end up. But obviously we are hoping to get a little bit further up front. Maybe a top five or top three would be good. Well, Bassin, we look forward to speaking to you later on during the race. But for just now, go and enjoy a, a well-deserved rest, my friend. Thank you. Bassin Richter there from Unicorns of Love. Uh, let's have a look there because it uh, looks like uh, Mike Noble has... Uh, a I, th I think just got past it. Excuse me, no, it's Tobias Pfeffer that's just got past uh, Smolarczyk in that triple one car for uh, 19th place. Now hunting down the uh, the number 92 in 
uh, 18th place there of Romant and uh, I mean Alexandre Romant is soon going to have his mirrors full of that uh, number 157 Audi but looking back to that battle for the lead again and it's another half second taken out from Igor Ogorodnikov 11.6 is the gap just now and that rain Alex now really hammering it down here at Spa yeah and just keep your eyes on this Gregor Schill has got this must be feeling the heat under the collar because Luca Berk is right behind that gap was about six and a half seconds a few laps ago and now Luca Berk has absolutely been flying and uh, absolutely scything his way through that gap between himself and uh, Gregor Schill and uh, between the pair of them as they go through Paul we ride on back on, on board with Gregor Schill at the moment as Luca Berk looks towards the inside Schill runs wide on the approach into the right hander at the fan oh Berk sends it from another postcode and up the inside goes Luca Berk up into P9 and that was a great move up the inside of uh, Gregor Schill. So Michael O'Brien, before he handed over the car, brought it in the, into the pits in P8. And now uh, Luca Burke has got to try and close on Weiderlich, who is about 29.6 seconds up the road. But that was an absolutely fully committed, uh, brilliant, hard overtake by Luca Burke. And he made it clean speechless at that that is amazing from Luca Burke I mean that and the thing is is that that's not the first time today we've seen him absolutely lick the stamp and send it to get that done uh, but we'll come back to that in a second because look at Marco Bischoff and the ambassadors for Renfeld and 995 machine he's already caught back up to Machazzi in that uh, 194 machine and I've got to be honest the pace that Bischoff has got is just unrelenting. He was three seconds faster that last lap round than Machazzi. Looks one way, then the other on the exit of Blanchemont. It's going to be up around the outside of the chicane. Beautiful, beautiful move there for Marco Bischoff and Machazzi tries to uh, get some sort of dignity back and heads off with his tail between his legs into pit lane there and possibly looking to do a driver change or some... Uh, Wow, that was Tobias Pfeffer making me lose my words there on the exit of Blanchemont. That was get the teriyaki boys on because that was a bit of Tokyo Drift <laughs> going round the corner there. That was awesome stuff from Tobias Pfeffer and wild car control. Oh my goodness me. But uh, I've just had a look at uh, Matiazzi's uh, stint. He was 2 minutes and 40 away from... Uh, possibly exceeding that um, stint time um, but also looks like we could have a change for the lead because at the moment uh, the 164 that has got uh, Andrea Miato leaders in the pit lane David this means that Ogorodikov will now inherit the lead as he comes out of the bus stop chicane so now from 9th to 1st with 16 hours and 55 minutes remaining on the clock Lada Sport Rosneft now lead the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa Francorchamps. Wow, huge, huge uh, to see that again. Of course, not the first time that they've been in the leads, but you get the feeling with uh, you know 16 hours and, and 55 minutes left to go. You, there's something that tells me that this is the hour. This is the hour that it all changes for that 41 car. They've really knuckled in deep as Igor, oh, Igor Ogorodnikov, and it's looking so, so good. That gap is surely going to be well under 10 seconds as we see Mike Noble hustling Smolarczyk in that treble one Bentley right now. The GTR, uh, sorry, excuse me, the, uh, the, the Aston of Mike Noble. You can tell how often I'm used to seeing Mike Noble in a GTR, can you? That's the first thing that rolls off of my tongue as soon as I say uh, Mike Noble there. But look at how hard he's hustling that Bentley in front. Fires it to the inside for FFS Racing. Smolarczyk's going to try and get the cut back, but it's never going to work. And Mike Noble takes that position and up into 18th place there, Alex. Yep, track temperature now has uh, dropped to 24 degrees uh, on track and, and, and also the fact is David we're now at just past quarter past eight 
the evening on the server and very soon we'll be hitting uh, night time and uh, that's where it's going to bring another new dimension as Mike Noble fires uh, the Aston Martin uh, nigh on exit stage right coming through the exit of Blanchimar and now into the bus stop chicane neatly done but um, yeah it's uh, it's been rather interesting so far that the strategies haven't really played themselves out to to complete fullness yet but when we get to like say maybe the the final two maybe three hours that's when you're really going to see who are going to be the ones that are going to be contesting for the victory and how can they outwit each other in terms of strategy application in the latter stages is is what's going to be really interesting for us all to watch well, we're going to find out very, very shortly. Now, huge news for your former leader, uh, the 194, uh, sorry, the uh, the 164 has come back out and is just behind the racing line motor point, uh, motorsport uh, car of 191. And that is, uh, let's have a look who is behind Vandeke the wheel Kikel. of that. That's uh, Niels van der Kekel. So, 230.369. And Niels van der Kekelt looks like bringing out a substantial gap already on that car behind. So that doesn't bode well for the pace just now. Ogorodnikov again lights up the touch paper, 230.354. That's relatively slow compared to the earlier laps that we were seeing, the 228s and the 229s. But that's still enough to take a huge chunk out of your uh, your former race leader here and I, i'll be honest with you i think like say in the next 20 minutes you're going to see a change for the lead and it could be that the ladder ross and f team jump into that pole position can you imagine how crazy youtube chat's going to go with that yeah i mean the if that happens the igor ogorodnikov fan club will be beside themselves with glee and literally spamming the chat um, as Andrea Miato gets past Niels de Van der Kikelt, I think I've just seen, and that was going through into Blanchimont. So Miato on uh, fresh. Yeah, I mean, uh, Niels van der Kikelt knew that Miato was on fresh rubber and just decided, well, I'm not, I'm not going to chance it. I don't want to go into a battle at this point in the race. I'm just, I've got to concentrate on my job. I've got to concentrate on what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, van der Kikelt was very wise to do that as. Uh, uh, Sirica closing on Honzik for what is 20th position. Let's not forget that uh, the 149 Yasheep Pirelli car has got a 15 second time penalty to serve in the pit lane on their uh, next stop. So, yeah, I mean, there's still so many, there's so many twists and turns in this race that are still going to come our way in terms of the commentary team, but also as now Sirica trying to go up the inside of Jardier going through the first part of Stavlo, thinks better of it, backs out. And that track is getting increasingly, increasingly uh, more daunting for the drivers as now Sidika trying to go around towards the outside, coming out of Stavlo to get the purchase for the inside line, going through into Blanchimont. And what's more, the Williams Esport driver has got the job done. Nicely put by Moreno Sidika. Yeah, that seems to be going backwards for that Yaz Heat Pirelli car just now because that's already uh, a bit of a gap that has been brought up um, so the Williams Esports team have done fantastic but the Yas Heat team just seem to have gone backwards in the past three hours there so yeah, difficult to see that one uh, but uh, looking at the battle for the lead as well Yigor Ogorodnikov another 230 lap there 230.5 last time round and uh, uh, Andrea Miato still behind the wheel has to catch up onto the, uh, the number 62 that's in front of him that's Gregor Schell and again, it's going to be interesting to see whether Gregor just moves out of the way for your uh, your former race leader or actually uh, has something to, to say about that instead. But yeah, this, this battle is absolutely huge right now. Yeah, just keeping an eye on Magic Malinowski uh, in the 211 Sidemax Motorworks uh, JLO team just puts in a 2 minute 29.8. So that is uh, about seven, nearly seven tenths quicker than Ogorodnikov, but the gap between them is about 43 seconds. We've complete, we're on lap number 173 of this race. So um, there's still plenty of, of, of opportunities, but one of the more interesting things here, David, is that the top seven are still on the same lead lap at this particular moment in time. And that's, that's absolutely huge. That is absolutely huge to have that happen where they're all on that uh, that same lap just now. But I'm just hearing on the ear that um, 
uh, from strategy wise uh, Ogronikov looks like he should be in on that uh, last lap and just looking at the lap time there now that changes things because Andrea Miato 2.27.3 so again this is now the time to come in for Ogronikov so we're hearing that he will be in next lap but I mean I, I would be coming in this lap if I'm honest and getting that done yeah, I mean, Ogorodnikov coming close to the actual end of his stint as well. He's been in the car for just over 68 and a half minutes. Uh, and he's just got past the 129 car. Um, and that's going through the exit of Stavlor before the run down to Blanchimont. As there goes. So that was uh, Gregor Schill um, just letting the car, get, the Aston Martin, get in front. And uh, Gregor Schill has not fought that whatsoever. Ogorodnikov makes his way through Blanchimont, now into the bus stop chicane. And, he's, and if he's going to go into the pit lane, he's got to just make sure he closes off the door for the two cars behind. And uh, no, Ogorodikov staying out. Oh, he's staying out for another lap. So I think he's going to... I mean, if he goes in... Yeah, probably... Be, yeah, I mean, I mean, this lap, I would say that he should now come in. And uh, yeah, it's just... Um, yeah, it, it, it... I mean, the thing is, is that he'll be fuel limited, but also he's time limited as well. And, um, you know, Okorodnikov is has still got a 43 second gap over, 43 second gap over Malinovsky, um, who's just put in a, two, well, who very soon be crossing the stripe. Uh, so we'll find out what the, uh, the pole sisters have done. Uh, Tobias Pfeffer still in the, uh, in the car for the reigning and defending champions, the 157, uh, still out there in the Audi, running in 17th position as Ogorodnikov makes his way through uh, Lecom. And uh, yeah, we'll then start heading down the hill. And this is where the real momentum carry happens, but you want to keep that momentum carry to a minimum sometimes in these wet weather conditions, because if you go a bit too gung-ho, you can actually catch yourself out, especially as I mentioned earlier, the curbs also uh, throttling on early. So you've got to modulate the brake and the throttle to the right point. As I've just seen, that's probably the Rutronic e racing car that I've just seen go wider, coming out of no name there. And uh, you can now see that there is, uh, I think there is an Aston Martin that's just flashing its headlights at the minute. So uh, Ogorodnikov making his way through Puon. I think yeah, Ogorodnikov should really pit now because I think he's uh, oh Ogorodnikov having dramas, and that's because of the 129 who has absolutely no, well, doesn't really have a right to sort of send it up the inside of Ogorodnikov because Ogorodnikov needed to get past him, did get past, and now has been compromised, and this could cause a spanner in the works reference the next pit stop. Uh, I have to disagree there on that one, just purely because uh, at the moment Ogorodnikov is a mobile chicane right now. Uh, last lap round there was a 2.31 and that 1.29 car that got past him there uh, was actually doing 2.30.6s there. So again, look up the inside there, he's losing time hand over fist here and he needs to get that car into the pit lane just now. Oh and a huge moment at the exit of Blanchimont, this is dangerous, dangerous territory for Igor Ogorodnikov, needs to get that car slowed down and put into the pits as well. Oh, look at that out of the chicane. Just, just, just holds on to it. Yegor Okorodnikov is a lucky, lucky boy as he goes into pit lane and that hands the provisional lead to Magic Malinowski for Sidemax Motorworks. But look at how much Magic is struggling with that car as well. But uh, I, I wonder if that's because of the, uh, the, the, the conditions are getting heavier here. And look at that, Alex. Within half an hour, it's going to be very, very intense rain indeed. Malinowski might be pitting on this lap as well because he's just gone wide. I think those tyres have been overcooked a little bit. So I think that um, Ogorodnikov might be in the right frame of mind. Let's see. Malinowski gets into pit lane. He was on one minute, one hour and 11 minutes, and this is now going to... I'm just going to keep an eye now on synth time, so Bacon could be pitting this lap. And, yeah, Bacon will be in this lap, so this will rehand the lead back to uh, number four car from GTWR R8G Academy in the 164. So Andrea Miato, um, you know, pitted just over nine minutes ago, and now there is Ogorodnikov in the pits, so... Uh, who will he be handing over to? Because that was a, a good a good couple of uh, since there from Ogorodnikov in that number 41 Lada Sport Rosnov Aston Martin. And yeah, Malinowski and Bacon now in the pit. So Miato 
will now retake the lead on lap number 175. And that is almost certainly undone the uh, the hard work that was uh, that was done there by Ogorodnikov to to get that on the go because that car is stationary in the pit lane and that's going to I think take that gap over now to about uh, 20 seconds by the time that he gets going out of the pits just now. But what you've got to remember is that uh, Andrea Miato in the middle of some traffic just now trying to get past the uh, 199 at the moment. That is on the uh, Kemmel Street. Gets it done onto Lecombe. So no worries there. And I think it's back to square one for the 41 Vlada Rosnev team. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's just going to be... It's just going to be a case of just uh, getting back out on track and uh, Grabowski now has replaced Ogorodnikov in the number 41 Lada Sport Rosneft Aston Martin. So, uh, yeah, uh, and we're back with um, Marco Bischoff, who now is closing on Gregor Schill. So ambassadors for Renvalden uh, in the 995. Henrik Gambal qualified that car in P5. They've uh, had a slow and steady comeback, but Marco Bischoff has... Uh, set the youtube chat alight quite a few times in uh the uh in the first uh, few hours of this race was 16 hours and 42 and a half minutes uh, still remaining as these two make their way through uh uh Pua. and now miato has a uh, an excess of a 23 second lead over the number 41 of grabowski is going through lefany and into campus uh, marco bischoff closing on gregor schill so it's aston martin versus BMW now through into Stavlo the door looks to be opening a little bit here for the Aston Martin and then Gregor Schill gets it tight on the apex through the second part of Stavlo a little bit of a snap oversteer to the left hand side and Bischoff is trying to get through he's going nigh on side by side and he's got past Gregor Schill and uh, that means XL uh, ambassadors for Renvelton now up into P10 Fantastic, fantastic move there from Marco Bischoff and chat have rightfully been saying uh, and, and repeatedly drawing our attention to that 995 ambassadors for Renfelt and Car and they will be absolutely delighted. I think Gregor Schill actually dives off into pit lane there as well. So we'll keep our eye on that. So into the top 10 he goes, but also at uh, Niels van der Kekel dropping down to seventh place as we are still in the middle of our pit stop changes just now. Uh, Miato back into the, uh, the the lead of the race and Chris Hartfelt in the 32 Yaz Heat, uh, sorry, the, uh, the number 32 uh, GTWR team uh, gets a uh, five second penalty uh, so that's, that's obviously going to drop them back towards Bischoff. So Bischoff is going to end up into uh, ninth place. And that is going to be for gaining an advantage by uh, cutting Radion. And do you know what? They've been warned about it time and time again. And it, it's been surprising to see that there's not been much more of this uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the advantage gained by them. Yeah. Um, it's just always going to be one of those cases where you, you just have to look at the bigger picture and just try and push on regardless. But Tobias Pfeffer is pushing on like a freight train. He's uh, closing on from Martin in the number 92. Yes. And um, to be honest with you, if they if they didn't have those two drive-through penalties earlier on, they probably would have been in the top five or six at this particular moment and battling battling for what could be uh, you know a pretty good solid result. And, you know, Giorgio Simonini was very honest in the interview uh, with Andy on Thursday night, just saying, look, you know, we're looking to, you know, if we can be in the top 20, you know, we'll be happy with the result. But, yeah, it was a difficult, you know, it was um, a race. That we're, you know, disappointed with the Mount Panorama, but to, to sort of like be where they are now, um, OK, it could have been a lot better, but that's the coulda, woulda, shoulda situation. There's still 16 hours and just under 40 minutes to go, David. There's still plenty of time for them to, to make that up. As I've just seen Sudikat and Petruchenko, who just pitted from 6th and 5th position, respectively. For sure. And uh, with... Uh us going into our eight of this 24-hour race actually this is a great point to bring in a uh, resident stato james parker who's been watching this race uh, from the sidelines and, and keeping all sorts of notes from us uh, uh, james i mean it, it really has had everything this race and 
it, it came so close with Igor Ogorodnikov getting on to that uh, on that leader there, but now hands over the reins to Denis Grabowski. He's not slow by any means of the imagination at all, is he? No, I mean they're going for the tire offset advantage. So um, the 164 is always obviously much quicker at the start of the stint on fresh tires. So. They, they get their advantage or some advantage back in those early laps when Igor's driving was driving around on old tyres. Um, but they're looking for the tyre offset from kind of half stint onwards. Because the 164 does seem to be burning through its tyres quite quickly. I mean, Fidelity really dropped in pace from half an hour onwards in his stint. And he was literally hanging on there towards the end. So back into the 2 minute 31s towards the end of his, his, his last stint. So this is where it's going to be an ebb and flow game. It's where... You know, the, the car's going to be faster at different points of the stint. Um, they're both doing identical stint times, so it'll always be a lap or two advantage in the 41's favour, unless something dramatically changes in terms of tyre life. But they are broadly on the same strategy, as are most of the Astons in the top eight, to be honest. Um, they're all... Uh, the only the only car that is, is really off strategy is the 191. Um, and obviously uh, the Triple Eight, uh, both they both stopped later um, earlier on in the race. So, um, or they stopped earlier in previous stints, so they're off strategy. So, um, it'd be interesting. I'm going to keep an eye on the one, two, three. Uh, Mike Noble, because obviously they're really fast now. Uh, now they're back in the uh, in the server, and as as we mentioned earlier, Mike will be driving very angrily um, after that unfortunate uh, game crash for uh, Phil Samard earlier. Um, the 32 has fall, kind of fallen off the um, off the radar now. They were travelling towards the top seven or eight, um, but that that drive through really has set them back. That they got earlier on with the contact um, with the 28, and um, yeah, they're now mired uh, outside the top ten, and their pace hasn't been brilliant. So the ones to watch, I mean, Amir Hosseini and uh, Luca Burke have both pitted much later than the rest of the pack they were on a really offset strategy and they went they ran dry tires really far into them and the um the the wet weather started to, to, to come on strong so that's why you saw extremely good pace from both luca and amir uh mid stint there because they had a 15 20 minute tire offset compared to uh, a lot of the other cars they're battling so that's gonna be really interesting to see now as the weather gets heavier um and tire pressures will then need to be adjusted again um, for the track conditions you might find that the the two cars um, the triple seven and the 22 they've got more flexibility now they can run into that that heavier weather that's coming in half an hour's time and hopefully prep their pressures so that they again when it gets um, uh, wetter they can they can attack again and and gain those one and a half two seconds a lap that they were they were chomping out of people in that that's just uh, just now and james just before we let you go i just want to get your thoughts on the uh, the number 995 car of marco bischoff just now ambassadors for renville and incredible recovery drive that they've put on for the uh, the first couple of hours getting themselves not only into the top 10 but you know potentially up into that that eighth place and they, they really do seem to have the pace to keep themselves moving forward what's your thoughts on them yeah, I mean they were quite. They were in. They were sat comfortably in the top ten in the first uh, couple of hours, and then obviously they got that unfortunate drive through um, that set them back with Beerman. Um, that that kind of put them two minutes down. So that that kind of put them really off strategy uh, because obviously they did the drive through, reset their stint timer, and then they've come back out again. So um, yeah, they they pitted really early in the first stint, so they were off strategy anyway. Uh, they only did 58 minutes in their first stint. Um, so they're on a different strategy to most other Astons that ran well into the, the high 60s. Um, but that, that, that's given them a, this really good tyre offset, just like the 777 and the 22. But it's allowed them to attack and come back through the field. So um, they did drop down towards 23rd, I think 23rd or 24th place after their drive through. And as you can see, they're back in 8th place. So um, it's going to be really interesting to monitor their progress. Uh, be, um, I think he's due a pit stop in about five, six minutes time. So that's uh, how much later he's running uh, in comparison to the others in the top ten. Um, so let's see how this filters out. Uh, you might find teams 
uh, start to adjust their strategy based on the scoring. So as we get towards 12 hours and then 18 hours into the race, you might find that people purposely go off strategy to be uh, to, to build track position. So we'll see what happens. Thank you very much from James Parker, our resident analyst here at the uh, the SimGrid VCO World Cup. And uh, uh, Alex, just, just touching on a, a, a couple of the points here, given that the conditions are due or certainly forecast to change very, very soon. I mean, obviously, we've got uh, about 15 minutes left in, in our stint, but with Lewis McGlade, I mean, uh, he's really going to have some uh, some big hijinks to, uh, to be talking about shortly. Yeah, not just him, but also uh, you and O'Leary as well, um, because obviously after this, uh, we'll be going to the uh, the next part of the stream on the uh, official SimGrid uh, YouTube channel um, in, in probably just over about 15 minutes time. But, you know, to be honest with you, um, it was a shame I wasn't able to be a part of the, the first round of the, the SimGrid VTO World Cup but back at Mount Panorama. But, you know, just uh, having seen what has transpired before us for, what was it, since we were on since about uh, four o'clock this afternoon, it's been really, really epic. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the conclusion of the race. You and me both. Uh, to bring you up to date then, ladies and gentlemen, it is still the 164 of Andrea Miato for GD GTWR Racing number 4 that is out in the lead by 26.8 seconds from the Lada Rosneft Racing Team of the 41 uh, out in that second place. Again, starting to stretch that gap by about 6 tenths of a second. Uh, it's then the 211 of Sidemax Motorworks in third place, the JLO team, and then in fourth place is the number 125 of Ubic Events Racing. James Macon, Eric Neath, Theus Conrad and Jordan Burrows in that team. Uh, it's the 191 Racing Line Motorsports uh, car in fifth place. It's then the 123 FFS Racing outfit in sixth. It's the 22 uh, Rocket Simsport in uh, seventh place. Eighth place at the moment is the number 14 of Unicorns of Love. Uh, ninth place at the moment, 4995 Ambassadors for Renvelton. And then rounding at top 10 is the Triple Eight Team ACR. Uh, I believe that's the uh, actual, actual Vision uh, Community Racing Team that are up into 10th place. So great to see that. But, I mean, what an amazing, amazing race. And there's so much, Alex, to, at stake, not just today, but in terms of the uh, the championship. This just round two of the incredible SimGrid VCO World Cup. Yeah, and um, it's also going to you know give us the opportunity to see who will be going into um, you know the, the, the halfway point of the season leading the standings. Because at the moment, OK, we know about the fact that DV1 Trice and Racing are still, uh, you know, still leading in terms of the live team standings, but that could all change come the end of being twice around the clock here at Spa. We just heard that Amir Hosseini is just uh, pitted in the triple seven car, um, and to be honest, um, they've had a pretty good run. They started down in 35th, and. Yeah, I mean, it's really good to see. I mean, I mean, Hosseini, we normally see him in a McLaren in the Sprint Cup with Alaric Enslin. But, you know. Yeah, so uh, looks like uh, they went really long in the 777. So uh, Hosseini literally nigh on maxed out that stint time. And, uh, yeah, to get up into the top 10 at this particular point in the race with 16 and a half hours to go. Not a bad shout, actually. Yeah, not bad indeed. Uh, just to uh, let you know, 36 has been given a final warning. That's Lego Montero in the uh, 36 outfit. They've been given their final warning for Zenith uh, about uh, track limits. So Zenith Esports getting their final warning about breaching track limits. And not only that, but he's got a Porsche right on his tail. And I've got a feeling that is uh, a Porsche that is a lap up. Um, that is just behind them as well. Uh, Going to bring you up to speed on what's at stake for today and tomorrow as well. Remember, not only is there prize money of, I believe it's a $10,000 prize pool over the championship, but each race has a prize pool for the top 15 as well. The winner takes home $350, second place $250, uh, and then third place takes $200, and it goes all the way down to $15 for 15th place. So, a lot to play for, and if anything, 
uh, it, it's a nice little a little bonus at the end where if you finish in top 15 uh, you can get a, a couple of beers on the uh, on the sim grid and uh, on VCO as well so you know points make prizes but it all adds up at the end of the season doesn't it Alex? Yeah, I mean, also, um, you know, for another four hundred eighty dollars will be distributed amongst each manufacturer's highest finishing car, um, and this is for Split One, obviously. Uh, split Two, um, you know, they've got their AK Informatica prizes uh, coming through um, as well. So there's 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 quite a lot of uh, you know the prize fund is worth pretty much over to twenty five thousand US dollars, courtesy of uh, and, and a big thank you go must go to uh, VCO and uh, AK Informatica obviously uh, Chance Draycott had a chat with uh, VCO CEO uh, Florian Hasper um, earlier on uh, in the broadcast but also VCR really uh, showing that they want to make sure that sim racing has a bright and prosperous future and um, I know Florian personally uh, from his time in DTM uh, when I used to be a DTM reporter back in from I think it was like the uh, the early 2010s got to know Florian really well and and um, BCO being his baby um, he has got big plans and he's explained quite you know some of the things that we can uh, see like the ERWC that is uh, looking to happen I think early uh, next year as Lewis was saying earlier on in the broadcast so with that partners like VCO aka Informatica Carlo and and also uh, um, Express VPN and of course uh, Coach Dave Academy and Thrustmaster you know things that we're doing here on the sim grid would not be possible and without them um, you know where would we be probably not what we're doing right now Exactly. Just a reminder that you can get three months free at Express VPN as part of a 12-month package. Uh, we'll bring that link up again in just a second. Uh, but also with our brand new partner, Calo, get 15% off your order with some caffeine-free uh, goodies to keep you awake. Check the links in the description below. Get 15% off your order there and get three months free at uh, ExpressVPN as part of a 12-month package here on us at the SimGrid. So check out the links in the description below and uh, go and grab your goodies as well. Let's have a look. The 995 is allegedly uh, a way to, uh, to pit this time round. I think that's maybe a little bit early on that one. It's maybe wishful thinking on that part, but 16 and a half minutes left to go. But uh, wow, what a race, Alex, we've had. And we're, we're coming up to the end of our stint here. And we've really, uh, I, I feel kind of lucky because we have had so much to enjoy here. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, along with not just the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa Francorchamps, but what's coming up uh, later on in May, you know, Endurance Cup, more female races by Thrustmaster Rockets, uh, the Sprint Cup season finale next Thursday night at Suzuka that you and I will be calling as well. Uh, just so much going on, but yeah. Um, also, uh, yeah, just how this race has developed. This, it's like a long novel. You, you go through every single chapter and you, you get more information and you sort of like, you, it piques your interest. And around a track as iconic as Spa Francorchamps, um, you know, I just can't wait. I mean, it's a shame that our stint, well, our stint together is coming to an end uh, because uh, at eight o'clock we will be moving on to part two of the broadcast where uh, we'll be then uh, putting things in the very capable hands of Lewis McGlade and Ewan O'Leary. Uh, uh, just after 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, William Hendrickson in the 787 Jean Lacy Esports uh, Cup BMW who's just pulled it into the pits from 31st. But yeah, it, it's. I've, I've always been intrigued by Spa in terms of an endurance perspective, and now having commentated on this event, uh, I've really got a, a real. a real love of uh, endurance racing from uh, a sim racing perspective. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's uh, another thing pointed out by Valerie Suman in the uh, the YouTube chat there, uh, a point that I very gingerly touched upon earlier. I mean, the, the quality of racing has been absolutely second to none in this. I mean, we always get great racing at the World Cup, but this is probably one of the best rounds that I have seen in terms of respect, in terms of action, in terms of the, uh, the, the way things are playing out. And I'm holding things in case they all go wrong here but again incident wise we've not seen anything too too crazy as David McKell is obviously listening and wanting to prove me wrong here on this one um, but that 
rain is really starting to, to come down quite heavy now and you can see the uh, half hour forecast is even more intense rain as well but yeah that track still stays at damp I think it's now uh, proper full on wet on that track it's uh, I think damp is a little bit of an understatement there Alex um, I think the term mildly moist in the words of Jeremy Clarkson would also be rather an understatement why, um, why would you have to say that <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, look, we got to, it's all about the banter here in the commentary box. I mean, we, you know, we do love all the racing, but sometimes it's always good to uh, bring a, be a few different perspectives. But like I was saying, going back to my experience of commentating in Belgium in real life, this is exactly something that I would expect that you'd see the rain. I think, what was it? I was um, just briefly going into it. Um, I was in, uh, I think it was uh, second weekend of April. The Sunday we had rain literally all day long it it changed in intensity and i can see this is pretty much a, a repeat of what i saw that very day so i'm not at all surprised and considering genk is about 100 kilometers north of this circuit anyway um the microclimate in belgium is, is act, actually spreads far and wide across the country um and people just say well it mainly hovers above a circuit well you could say that about the eiffel regions the nurburgring uh, for instance another one that has uh unstable weather conditions especially when a 24-hour uh, race is going on and today has been no exception so far i was going to say uh, unstable weather conditions hello not kill up here in scotland that is uh, <laughs> incredibly bad for it we get all four seasons uh, in one day we get about two hours of sunshine we call that summer up here in scotland but back here i i can i can hear the uh, the, the voices in my ear uh given given it loudly about uh, uh, scotland yes it is normal for scotland unfortunately but that's by the by uh i'm back to the race at hand though andrea benedetti for the gtwr rhg academy number three car mat 32 uh onto the back of nick baltzar in the 77 mclaren this is such a a wonderful shot here and in fact actually you can see that it is less dark than it was earlier on in terms of the uh, the rain clouds that are there but nick baltzar is uh, all through the back of the uh, the car there with andrea benedetti and alex uh, 16 hours 20 seconds left to go i mean we are in for a real real treat uh, coming on here with uh, you know the fact is that uh, andrea miata is still in the lead and uh, 27.5 seconds in the lead yeah it's just um it's just been really really impressive of, of what's been going on um how hard these drivers have been pushing for uh, the best part of uh, close to uh, eight minute uh, eight hours uh in, in about 21 minute in 21 minutes time you now they've been pushing like crazy no one has given up no one has stopped pushing like crazy okay they're having to watch it a little bit but uh, in this particular occasion um this you, you try telling drivers this is a 24 hour race keep it calm keep it consistent well you try telling that to a racing driver they'll instantly forget what you've told them and this will be a 24 hour sprint race we see it at lamar we see it in the notch lifer we also see it here at spa Oh, I mean, I've I've personally got real life experience of that of that whole idea of you know just just keep it calm, keep it cool, keep it consistent um, from doing a, an endurance race a couple of years ago, and the the idea is is like going in as a rookie driver, and instantly as soon as it's not a joke when you say about getting behind the wheel instantly everything changes because you know you see a car alongside you like this like nick baltzar and benedetti going around the outside we've seen that several times today but that was so so smooth from andrea benedetti i'll tell you what you can be as calm and as cool and as collected as you like and you can say that you're not going to race the car too hard but i promise you if you get a car alongside you your foot is just going to go that little bit further into the accelerator absolutely guaranteed and quite honestly if it doesn't you, you have to ask if you belong behind the wheel of a, of a race car because it is that that natural instinct that is so difficult to uh, to, to keep under check there but Benedetti going a little bit wide through uh, Blanchemont there gets away with it 
but I mean, Alex, it is just second nature to uh, a racing driver, put them behind the wheel, and they're going to want to beat every single other car on that track by several laps. Yeah, Gregor Schill's actually factoring into this uh, conversation here between Benedetti and Baltzar. So again, we see a repeat of three different brands battling it between themselves. So the prancing horse of Maranello, Woking's finest, and the propeller of Munich. Uh, battling over 14th position down into Bruxelles before the uh, left-hander here at No Name. And, um, yeah, this th this uh, seesaw, this pendulum, so to speak, of positions being changed, it's just going to carry on all the way through the night, but it's about who, who survives the night, who is in the hot seat, who's going to be there ready to strike whilst the iron's hot. They may be tired, they may be, um, you know... Ex that the, there might be muscle cramps, lactic acid build-ups, <clears throat> but the drivers will be pushing like crazy. They'll be motivating, spurring each other on right up until the chequered flag. And even if they get to the end of this race and it's not in the position they want, they will still have accomplished something. And that, okay, yeah, we know that a racing driver worth their salt, David, wants to win, but also the taking part is just as crucial. Yeah, in an endurance race more so. Uh, just the, the the team spirit and the camaraderie is is absolutely amazing across the uh, the entire field. And yeah, you're you're spot on when you say about finishing the the endurance race is an achievement in itself. And it, you do feel proud. And you're on voice chat. You're you're giving each other the the verbal high fives. Doesn't matter if you finish in the top thirty or if you finish on the podium. You're going to be equally as delighted what they're not going to be delighted Alex though is however is look at that weather we are in for an absolute monsoon from the looks of it heavy heavy rain from now until at least the next half hour and there we go on cue the rain just comes thumping down and there's no end in sight because that wind is not changing in any form whatsoever so we are uh, getting ready with 16 and a quarter hours to go uh, to, to basically uh, hand things over to our uh, our commentary team again. Alex, it's, it's been a fantastic privilege uh, taking part in this tonight. And uh, what's your what's your final thoughts on the race so far? Let's see who wins the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. I think it's going to be open right up until the last couple of hours, David. Awesome, awesome stuff. Well, I've been David Christie. He has been Alex Goldschmidt. We're away to go and head over to part two of the race. So join us again, ladies and gentlemen. Hit, click the link that's in chat. Join us for the new stream. And we're away to hand things over to Lewis McLeod and Ewan O'Leary.